You are now tuned into Then Radio. If you enjoy our videos, we ask that you consider joining our Patreon to support our channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you never miss a new video. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, thank you for watching. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners, Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of fine Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure... Death Behind the Scenes, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Persecuted Actor. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter solved the mystery of the persecuted actor and prevented death behind the scenes from becoming a grim reality. But now, a word to the women. Millions of homemakers can't be wrong. For example, the millions who have learned what wonders Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, can do. And those same homemakers are now discovering the modern way to new beauty for their floors, woodwork, and furniture. The three great Linux home brighteners. Linux self-polishing wax, which beautifies your floors with a satiny, yet tough, no-skid finish that resists wear, water, and dirt. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. And Linux clear gloss varnish, the durable super varnish that dries to an elastic, transparent surface, which protects all wood and linoleum in your home. You'll find the three great Linux home brighteners at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As today's story begins, we are backstage at the Republic Theater, where Charles Forrest is directing a rehearsal of his new play, Lord Byron. But it will not be possible for us to live our lives as we want to. We must live for those nearest and dearest to us. You're right, my darling. I see it all now. Nothing that may happen to us can ever change the fact that I love you. Love you with every fiber of my being. Love you with a depth I'd never thought possible. Nothing will ever change that. And I feel the same way, Robert. And I always... Well, well, go on, Miss Davis. She can't go on, Mr. Forrest. That's why Ma's cue to enter. And as usual, he isn't here. Oh! Paul, that's your cue. I don't see why we always have to wait until Paul Weimar condescends to honor us with his presence. We spend more time waiting for him to pick up his cues than we do rehearsing. Take it easy, Dick. You don't have to go griping about Weimar all the time. Paul, on stage, please. We're waiting for you. Coming, Mr. Forrest. Just a moment. Coming, Mr. Forrest. Why can't he stay here the way the rest of us do? You forget, Dick. Mr. Paul Weimar is a great foreign star. Who is? You coming, Paul? Oh, sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Forrest. Oh, oh. Paul, what's happened? It's, it's happened again. It's happened again. I can't go on. What is it, Paul? Another accident. Again, someone tried to kill me. This time, it's a sandbag that drops almost on my head. Bradley, what's going on up there? Sorry, Mr. Forrest. Blind hole in the sandbag must have come untied. I'll take care of it. I am through. I give up. Things break when I sit in them. Things fall over on me, and now, now this bag drops on my head. I'm sure it was an accident, Paul. Come on, let's get on with this scene. We open in three days, Oh, no, I do not open in three days or ever. I'm through. Look, Paul, you can't quit on me now. It's too late. We're almost ready to open. I will not stay here and get killed. Paul, suppose I get Nick Carter to come down here and find out what's going on. He can stop all these accidents you've been having. Will that satisfy you? You will get the great Nick Carter to make an investigation? I will if you'll stay with me. He'll see that nothing more happens to you. Yes, Mr. Weimar. Mr. Carter will protect you. Oh, shut up, Dick. This is serious. Will you get to work if I get Carter down here, Paul? Oh, very well. I will try it once more. But if there are any more of these accidents that nearly kill me, I shall go home and stay there, Carter or no Carter. All right. Betty, take over the rehearsal. I'm going to get Nick Carter right now. You say you're having trouble with your new play, Forrest? I certainly am, Carter. 
It's supposed to be the life of Lord Byron, the poet. So that to play the lead, I brought an actor over from Paris, a man named Paul Weimer. He looks almost exactly like Byron, and he's a good actor. Doesn't sound like trouble so far. Wait. Ever since we started rehearsals, one accident after another has happened to Weimer. So that by this time, he's getting so jittery that I'm afraid he won't be able to go on with the play. Well, what kind of accidents, Forrest? Well, one time a heavy door almost fell on him. Just missed him. Another time, a chair he was sitting in collapsed under him and sent him to the hospital for three days with a wrenched back and so on. Today, the final straw, a heavy sandbag counterweight, fell and almost on top of him as he crossed the stage. I don't blame him for being jittery. Any idea what's behind all these things? Either one of two things. Either somebody's trying to kill Paul or they're trying to scare him out of the show. And there's only one person, as far as I know, who'd profit by getting rid of Paul. And who's that? Richard Rowland, my American star. He was so upset at not being given the part of Byron that he swore he'd never act for me again. And suddenly he agreed to play the second lead, which surprised me, even though it is a pretty fat role. Hmm. Then if Paul Weimar had to give up the role for any reason, I suppose Roland would automatically step into the part? Yes, of course. Well, that certainly gives Roland a motive, doesn't it? Will you take the case, Nick? If you don't, I'm afraid Weimar will walk out on me, contract or no contract. Mm-hmm. When do you have your next rehearsal? Tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, if the rest of the scenery is hung and ready. All right. I'll be there at 10.30 to look over the ground. Will you see to it that every... I'll take it, Nick. Nicholas Carter's office. Yes, he's here, just a minute. It's for you, Mr. Forrest. Uh, for me? Oh, uh-huh. thanks. Hello? What? No, don't let anybody get away. Keep everything just as it is till we get there. Yes, I'm bringing him with me. Y- yes, yes, right away. Goodbye. That was Barry, my assistant stage manager. Roland is supposed to fire a shot at Paul in the second act. But when he fired just now, it wasn't a blank. It was real. Oh. That's why am I hurt? No, fortunately, the bullet missed him. Another accident, huh? Yes, another one. Heaven only knows what Weimar will do now. Let's get down there immediately. I want to start working on this before it's too late. Who else did say you're doing, Mr. Forrest? One of the best-known writers, Bert Levin. Oh. Mm-hmm. A very rich man. A successful playwright. Writes for his own amusement. Didn't I read somewhere that he doesn't smoke or drink and that he never married? That's right. He's a peculiar duck. What? No weaknesses? <laughs> no. There's a reason for that, Carter. He had a younger brother who went to Paris for training in art. He met a wild crew there, got to drinking and carrying on, and ended up in an insane asylum where he died a year or two later. Levan has never touched liquor or tobacco from that day to this. Well, I've enjoyed life for many years without smoking or drinking. Now, oh, this is Ada? Yes, and there's Fred, my doorman, waiting for us. Fred, this is Mr. Carter. He's in charge now. Hello. Hello, Fred. Has anybody left here since the shooting? You know, Mr. Carter, nobody been out or in. And through this way, Mr. Carter. <laughs> quiet, quiet, please, everybody. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Nick Carter. He's in charge here now, and whatever he says goes. Now, that's Paul Weimer over there, Mr. Carter, and Richard Rowland next to him. How do you do? Now, first, let me get the facts. Oh, Rowland, suppose you tell me what happened. Well, in the second scene in the second act, Lord Byron is threatened by the husband of a lady to whom Byron's making love. I play the husband, and I'm supposed to shoot him. Instead of the old-fashioned pistol we'll actually use in the play, we've been using a small automatic with blanks. When I fired it just now, it wasn't a blank, but a real bullet. Fortunately, it missed Weimar, but I'm sorry to say it struck a stagehand who just happened to be in the line of fire. Was he badly hurt? No, it just scratched his cheek. Where's the gun you used? Oh, right here on the table. Hmm, 32 cold. Only one shell in it, and that's been fired. Roland, who has charge of this gun before it's given to you? Rogers, the property man. Get him, please. Rogers! Rogers! On stage! Well, everybody, please take the same positions now that you were in when the shot was fired. This is about the way we were, Mr. Carter. Good. Is everybody here now? Where's Batty? Batty! Batty! Right here! I was off stage making a phone call when Roland fired, so I'm staying out of sight now. Okay, stay there for now. Where's the property man? Rogers, where are you? Here I am. Rogers, where were you when the gun was fired? In my property room. What can you tell us about this? Nothing. I loaded the gun, same as usual, with the blank. Anybody see you do it? Sure, Bradley, the stagehand was with me. 
Then I left the gun on the table and went out to talk to Fred, the doorman. And while you were gone, someone took out the blank and put in a real bullet. Could be. I wouldn't know. Anybody see anyone near the property room while Rogers was not there? Oh, come on, speak up. Did you see anyone near the gun after it was loaded? Now listen, if you know something, speak up. This isn't acting. It's murder. Mr. Carter, Did you see I... anyone near the property room after the gun was loaded? Well, yes, I did. My girlfriend and I were having a smoke behind one of the wings, and we saw... We saw... Well, go on. Who went in there? Well, it, it was... It was I, Carter. I went in there to find a match, but I didn't touch the gun. Oh, you did it on purpose, you jealous... Careful, guy. Weimar. Don't start calling names. You shot at me on purpose. You want to play the leading role, which I... Well, of course. Do you think Roland could have done it, me? No, it's too obvious, Patsy. <laughs> Right now, I'd like to have a look at the bullet that was fired from the gun. How could you find it? It could be anywhere in here. Oh, no, it couldn't. Look here. Uh-huh. It started from where Roland is standing. Mm. Went across the stage to where the stagehand is standing. Must have gone through those two flats behind him and into the wall. Come on. Okay. Now, if we line up Roland with the holes in these flats, we should find... That... Sure, Nick, there it is. In that big wooden post. Ah, oh, yes. Let me get my tweezers. I'll have that bullet out of there before you can see. Mm, that was easy, wasn't it? Patsy, hmm? look here. This bullet is a thirty-eight. The stage gun is a thirty-two. You mean that bullet didn't come from Roland's gun? No, Patsy. Whoever fired this bullet stood off stage and used the sound of Roland's gun to cover his own shot. But that... that would be murder. Yes, Patsy. Cold-blooded, deliberate murder. How much longer do you want these people, Mr. Carter? Oh, they can go. I'm through with them for now. That's all for today, everyone. Tomorrow morning at 11 sharp. (laughs) Mr. Carter, do you think I'll be safe now? Yes, you're safe enough for now, Ivor. And I suggest you go to your hotel. I'll see you there later. Uh, I shall do it. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Carter. Uh, Before you go, Carter, I'd like to have you meet our author. All right, Forrest. Oh, is he the one in the stage box on the other side? Yes, come on over. You'll like him. Mr. Levan, I'd like you to meet Mr. Nick Carter. Mr. Carter... Levant. How do you do? Glad to know you. Have you learned anything, Mr. Carter? Yes. The gun Roland used was not the gun that fired the bullet. That I know definitely. What? That means the shooting wasn't an accident? It means that if the one who did the shooting had been a better marksman, Weimer would be dead right now. What's your next step, Mr. Carter? I think I'll go back to the office for a while and do a little thinking. Then I'll drop in on Paul Weimar and see what his side of the story is. Uh, shall we have dinner first? An excellent idea, Carter. I'll pick up my coat and hat and be right with you. I left my things in the box I was sitting in. I'll get them and join you in just a minute. I'll see you outside, Nick. I want a part of my nose. All right, Patsy. I'll just have a look around while I wait. Carter! Carter, what is it? What, what's the trouble, Carter? Fall over something? No. Something fell over me. I started to cross stage and something knocked me over. Almost knocked me out. What's going on in here? Mr. Carter's had an accident. Wait, another of them accidents? That flower pot was on top of that pedestal. For some reason, the whole thing fell over on him. You, you all right, Carter? Yes, I guess so. But let's get out of here before the roof falls in on us. You see, Patsy, it has to be that way. You say every member of the cast was on stage when the shot was fired. Yes, and they were all in plain sight of each other. That leaves only four persons, as far as we know, who were backstage and who could have fired the offstage gun. Rogers, the property man, Fred, the doorman, Barry, the stage manager, and the stagehand, Bradley. And Fred says Rogers was talking to him near the entrance, which gives both of them an alibi. Apparently. And Barry says he was telephoning, and we found that a call was made from that phone at that time seems to let him out. And Bradley was shot by the bullet, so he couldn't have fired it. No. Which accounts for all four of them. Which means there's something somewhere we don't know yet. That's one reason I want to talk to Weimar. He may be able to throw some light on the subject. Oh, here you are, driver. Come on, Betsy. All right. A clerk. Paul Weimar is in 279, isn't he? Yes, sir. Who shall I say is calling? Oh, never mind announcing us. We're expected. Well, what's the name, please? You must be announced. The name is Nick Carter, and don't announce it. But it's a rule to announce all guests. We can walk, Patsy. It's only the second floor. Why didn't you want to be announced, Nick? Just second nature. They don't know I'm coming to see them. They can't get ready to receive me. I like the element of surprise when I go calling officially. Hmm. Room 279. That must be right here in the... Oh, do! No, no, you get it! Well, 
Paul Weimar seems to attract trouble as honey attracts a bee. What has happened now? Are his unfortunate accidents not confined to the theater after all? How is Nick going to unravel this tangled thread and reach a solution? We'll see in just a moment. Whatever your family's preference may be, in home decoration, your home is bound to be more beautiful when its floors are well kept and shining. And with Linux self-polishing wax, floors always look their very best without tiresome rubbing or polishing. Yes, with Linux self-polishing wax, which is simply wiped on, your floors are handsome for a long time because Linux self-polishing wax dries to a rich satiny finish that really lasts thanks to its high content of genuine Carnauba wax. And the finish may be renewed wherever and whenever you like without re-waxing the whole floor. What's more, Linux self-polishing wax is easy to keep lovely for you whisk surface dirt away in a twinkling with a damp cloth. And Linux self-polishing wax is the anti-skid floor finish. For the underwriters' laboratories have proved by test that wood, linoleum, and rubber tile floors are actually less slippery after Linux self-polishing wax has been applied. Be sure to ask for Linux, L-I-N-X, Linux self-polishing wax. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to our story. We left Nick and Patsy racing toward Paul Weimar's hotel room, from which are coming cries for help. Oh, Nick, we've got to get in there. He's in trouble. I know. Let's see if I can open this door. Oh, hurry, Nick, hurry. You, you, you told me I wouldn't be safe here. What's happened? A man broke in through the window, tried to strangle well, me. Where is he now? He, he heard you at the door. He ran into the bedroom, went out by the fire escape. In here? Well, there's no one in here now. Oh, fine thing. Even in my hotel, I'm not safe. You ever seen him before? Can you describe him? No, no. He, it was all too sudden. Uh, how long is this going on? I can stand it no more. Every day there's something. You say you never saw the man who... Oh, what's that? Yes, only the telephone, Mr. Weimar. I won't answer it. I won't. I won't. It might be trouble. You better answer it, Patsy. Take the message. Certainly, Nick. Hello, Mr. Weimar's room. Is Mr. Weimar there? Yes, but he can't answer the phone just now. May I take a message? Yes. Tell him Mr. Forrest called and wants Mr. Weimer to meet him in Mr. Weimer's dressing room at the theater at 8.30 tonight. Tonight? Are you sure of that? Yes, he was very specific. Said something about some revisions in the play that had to be made tonight to be ready for rehearsal tomorrow. All right, I'll tell him. Thank you. Well, was it bad news, quick? Oh, not at all, Mr. Weimer. That was the clerk downstairs. Oh. He said Mr. Forrest wants to see you in your dressing room tonight at 8.30. Something to do with revisions in the play. And it must be tonight. Oh, oh, that is a relief. I must prepare myself to leave. You will excuse me. That's quite all right, Mr. Weimar. Patsy and I must be running along anyway. See you tomorrow at rehearsal. Good night. Good night. And thank you. Good night. Oh, splendid, splendid. I couldn't have arranged it better myself. Nick, are you feeling all right? Oh, never better, Patsy. Never better. But why all the unconcealed joy? I'd expected this case would come to a head faster now that I was in it. But I hadn't hoped it would come quite so fast. The end is now in sight, Patsy. You go back to the office and wait for me. Where are you going? To the theater. And I must get there before Weimar does, if his life is to be safeguarded. Here you are, driver. Keep the chain. Good evening, Mr. Carter. Why, Fred, what are you doing here at this time of night? Do you have to guard the door 24 hours a day? Well, no, sir. Mr. Forrest said he was expecting some crops about supper time, but they ain't come yet. Told me to wait for him, and I'm waiting. I see. Good. Oh, has anybody been here recently? Why, no. Uh, Brad was here about a half hour ago, but he only stayed a couple of minutes, long enough to get something he forgot, that's all. Mr. Forrest hasn't come down yet? No, he hasn't. Uh, was he coming back tonight? I understood so, but I may be wrong. Oh, is it okay to go in? I want to have a look at something. Oh, sure thing. I want some lights? Uh, no, thanks. I have my flash. Okay, watch yourself, though. This ought to be Weimar's dressing room. Ah, oh, yes. It's the cane he was carrying in rehearsal this afternoon. Uh-huh. Seems to be no concealed bombs. No booby traps. Okay, for now. 
Nothing to do now but wait until he arrives. Oh, Mr. Cox, what are you doing here? I'm here protecting your life, Mr. Weimar, whether you know it or not. But uh, Mr. Forrest was... Mr. Forrest knows nothing about this. The call you got came from the would-be murderer. He wanted to get you down here so he could finish his job tonight. Finish his job? How? What do you mean? That's what I want you to tell me. Well, before you touch anything or sit down, look around this dressing room. What do you see that doesn't look natural in here? Not look natural? What do you mean? Oh, anything out of place. Something here that shouldn't be here. Something missing. Oh, oh I see. Now, uh... uh oh, yes, yes. Someone has been smoking my cigarettes. I left nearly a fresh pack here, I remember. Now, look, there are only two cigarettes left. Ah, uh, yes. I might have expected that. Will you have one? No, neither will you. Unless you want to die fast. Uh, I don't understand. Wait. Yes. These cigarettes have been treated with a deadly drug. One so rare that he could only get enough for two cigarettes. That's why the rest of the pack is missing. So you'd be sure to be killed almost at once. That, Mr. Weimer, was why you received the message to beat Mr. Forrest in your dressing room. You'd smoke at least one cigarette while you waited. And that one would be your finish. But, but who wants to do this to me and why? I know the answer now, but I'd rather not say until I can produce the killer himself. As soon as I can, I... You interfering meddler, you'll never live. Sorry, I had to shoot out the lights, but I didn't want him to hit you. Mr. Carter, are you there? What is it that has happened? Stay here, Weimer. You're safe for the moment. I want to stop that man who just ran off. Your life's in danger as long as he's loose. Where are you going, Mr. Carter? Sit tight. I'll be right back. Fred! Fred! Yes, Mr. Carter? Did I hear some shooting? You did. Who was it just ran out here? Well, nobody. But he went out some way. I heard him slam the door. Well, he must have gone out that little back door out behind the dressing room. You mean this isn't the only way out of this theater backstage? Oh, no. There's that other little door, but that's supposed to be kept locked all the time. Now, that leads out to the other street. Oh, I see. Oh, well, where's your telephone? Oh, right there in the office, Mr. Carter. Good. Let me make one phone call and I'll show you a would-be killer. But I tell you, you can't do this to me. Maybe we can't, but we are, so just pipe down. Why won't you tell me what I'm accused of? Because I don't know. I'm acting under orders from... That is, I'm doing what Nick Carter suggests. Huh. And Nick's a pretty clever guy, if I do say so. Well, so you just... for those kind words, Riley. Well, where the deuce have you been? We've been waiting here in my office since... Yes, I know, I know, I know. I came as soon as I could. I got in a little traffic jam. Well, there he is. We picked him up just as he came in his hotel lobby, just like you said. Now, what do we do with him? He's the man who's been trying to kill Paul Weimer. Huh? And who almost succeeded tonight. That's a lie. Is it? What did he have in his pockets, Riley? Oh, well, well, here, here it is, Nick. Here's the usual stuff. Ah, yes. The usual stuff. But not with the usual implications. Now, never mind those $2 words here. What do you see there that's so interesting? These loose cigarettes, for instance. There must be about 10 or 12 there, about half a pack. Mm -hmm. And they're Paul Weimer's brand. Well, so what? And this little box, Riley. Mm -hmm. If you'll have your chemist examine these two cigarettes that were left in Weimar's dressing room, I believe you'll find them full of the same drug that was in this box. Well, you'll undoubtedly find traces of it there now. Sure. Well, now you begin to make sense. This is all a pack of lies, a frame-up. It isn't either, and you know it. I am willing to bet that your fingerprints are on the doorknob of the little back door where you made your hasty exit from the theater tonight. What's that? Together with a few prints belonging to your assistant Bradley, the stagehand. And I imagine that Bradley will be very willing to talk. When he finds he's up on an attempted murder charge. All right, Carter. You win. I did it. I hate that man, Weimar. But why should you hate him so, Mr. Levant? Because he was the leader of the gang in Paris who helped my brother drink himself into the insane asylum in the grave. He was more to blame than my poor brother, who knew no better. I wrote this play, Lord Byron, just to get him over here where I could work on him. I suggested him to Forrest as the man for the part, and Forrest fell for it. Why didn't you kill him and be done with it? I wanted him to suffer as my brother suffered. But when you got into the case, Carter, I knew I had to finish it up quicker because... Bradley let you into the theater tonight through the little back door, didn't he? Yes. And it was Bradley who phoned the message to Weimer to get him to come down to the theater tonight, wasn't it? Yes. And it was Bradley who worked the backstage accidents after you had planned them, wasn't it? Yes, yes, yes. He thought it was all part of a practical joke. 
He didn't know I intended to kill that... All right, all right. Watch your language now. There's a lady present here. I thought everybody had forgotten about me being over here in the corner. I was just sitting here listening. You fired that shot during the rehearsal, didn't you, Levan? Yes, and I wished I had aimed straighter. How come you hit the stagehand? Pure accident. I didn't even see him until after I'd fired. In a way, it saved us from suspecting he had a hand in these things because it didn't make sense that he should get shot if he was in it. But after a while, when I began to see things the way they were going, I saw it could be nobody but you working with his help. Oh, Nick. Yes, Patsy? May I ask a question? Oh, yes, Patsy. One little one. Did you see who shot at Weimar in the theater tonight? No, it was all too fast. Then how did you know it was Mr. Levan? Well, even before I got to Weimar's dressing room tonight, I felt quite sure that Levan was guilty. And then when I entered the room and found that it smelled very strongly of that highly scented eau de cologne that Levan uses, I was positive. Ah. <laughs> By golly, you're right there, Nick. <laughs> sure, he smells like a perfume counter at the five and dime. Decidedly. That was the first thing I noticed about him when I met him earlier today. That was his only weakness, wasn't it? His excessive use of that scented eau de cologne. Well, maybe so, Patsy. But as far as I'm concerned, attempted murder is also a weakness. One that has to be punished. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. You want to take it a little easier? Then listen. Everybody's days are busy. We've all filled our daily schedules full to overflowing, doing our own home front jobs and helping with the all-out effort toward victory in every way we know how. So we appreciate more than ever before what it means to relax and how much easier it is to relax when a home is pleasant and inviting. American homemakers are learning how much easier it is to keep a home that way with the three great Linux home brighteners. For example, they're learning that Linex Cream Polish restores the original handsomeness of fine furniture in one quick, easy application. Banishes messy finger marks, helps conceal scratches, does away with cloudy old polish and dust. You see, Linex Cream Polish for fine furniture actually cleans as it polishes, saving one whole step in the cleaning day routine of busy homemakers, cutting their work in half. Let your fine furniture regain its loveliness with Linex Cream Polish. Remember always to ask your dealer for Linex Cream Polish, which cleans as it polishes. It's the streamlined way to furniture care. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, what's your story about next week? Next time, Ken, I'm going to tell you about an experience that Patsy and I had in one of the great movie studios. It started out very simply when the studio lost a reference book containing information about all kinds of poisons. You could look in that book and find out just what poisons to use for anything you wanted. It was much too dangerous a book to be at large. The unfortunate part of it was that I was called in too late to save the man whose body we found a few minutes later. Oh, but we did save the old man, Nick. If it hadn't been for you, he'd certainly have been killed. That's true enough, Patsy. What do you call a story, Nick? I call it Death at the Studio. Or the Mystery of the Murder Book. That's all for now. So long. So long, everybody. And so long to both of you until next week. We'll look forward to seeing you then, same as usual. Next week at this same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled Death at the Studio, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Murder Book. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss Varnish, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme Fine Quality Paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual.
The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paint. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's baffling case, The Witch of Dunderberg Mountain. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll find how a curious old moldy coin lured Nick Carter into a strange community, brooded over by Dunderberg Mountain and a collection of macabre superstitions. But now, millions of American families are happier these days because women who run their homes wisely have learned about Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, which makes every home more bright and inviting. Now those same wise homemakers are learning the modern way to new beauty for woodwork, furniture, and floors. The three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss to give lustrous, longer-lasting protection to every wood and linoleum surface. Linux cream polish to renew the sleek, gleaming beauty of fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new wax finish to lend rich, satiny loveliness to any floor, wood, linoleum, or tile. Take the modern shortcut to new home beauty with the three great Linux home brighteners. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. Today's thrilling adventure starts in the usual place the gloomy old brownstone mansion at the corner of 4th and 5th. Yes, looking at that comfortable old Victorian mansion with its gay flowered window boxes, its shiny brass door knocker and the bright and glistening windows, no one would ever guess that those panes are bulletproof. The doors, windows, and chimneys burglar-proof, and that on the top floor is probably the world's best-equipped laboratory for the scientific study of crime. As a matter of fact, our master detective is at this moment closeted in his laboratory while Patsy Bowen, his efficient and long-suffering secretary, holds the world at bay in his second-story office and consulting room. Finally, the hidden door that leads to a secret passageway creaks open. And enter Nick Carter. Patsy, will you get that blame thing fixed? Not me. The way you gumshoe around without making a sound gives me the jump. Every time I think I'm in a perfectly empty room and suddenly look up and see you at that old roll-top desk which you won't let me throw out, as if you just materialized out of thin air, it makes my heart do nip-ups. I just Yes, hit. Patsy, your grammar's a bit thumb diddle, but I think I get your drift. You want me to stamp her on a bumper to furniture like the average man? I do not. I... Tell me, did you finish whatever it was you were puttering around with up in the laboratory? I did. I examined the shirt the man accused of the Pemberton murder was wearing the night Daly Pemberton was killed. But that shirt had been washed and ironed here. Quite so. The murderer made the common mistake of believing that a thorough washing and boiling would eliminate traces of his crime. But not with the modern benzidine test, sweetheart. No? Oh? Took me less than three drops to reveal the presence of bloodstains. Mr. Pemberton's blood. You needn't look so pleased. I'm always pleased when I've managed to end a criminal career. Murder so often becomes a habit. Well, anything happened when I was upstairs? Anything, everything. The mayor called, the head of freedom from Moravia called, Lieutenant Riley called, the butcher called. Trivia, all trivia. Anything worth bothering about down in the waiting room? Mrs. DeLacy Trump's pearls. What about them? Stolen. Tell her to report to her insurance company. She can. Seems some gigolo swiped them. She doesn't want her husband to find out. Not interested. Old Mr. DeWitt Hemingway, second wife, has run away. She should have done it years ago. Not interested. Mr. Roger Winthrop, author and lecturer, has taken a house in some forsaken spot up the river. He's writing a history of the folklore and superstitions of the Catskills. He wants you... I to... never collaborate. Besides, what I know about the River Valley superstitions, and they're plenty gory, he can dig out of the records for himself. 
Not interested. Will you not jump to conclusions, Nick? He does not want you to collaborate. His servant has been hexed. The local witch has put a curse on him. And, and he's he... had a succession of headaches or corns or something. Tell him to wear a nice affetita bag. I believe that's a usual It's remedy. too late. The servant, whose name was Jacob, died about dawn this morning. A violent and horrible death. His last words were something about a descent into hell. Well, why didn't you say so? You wouldn't let me. Send Mr. Winthrop up. Well, send him up. What are we waiting for? Keep your shirt on, Nick. I can't have him shot out of a cannon. Wait till I click my inter-office gadget, can't you? Butch. Hi, Angel Face. Butch, Mr. Carter will see Mr. Roger Winthrop. You mean the guy with the ribbons on his glasses? Right the very first time. Okay, Mr. Winthrop. Hey, he's halfway up the stairs already. Hmm. Athletic for an author, I'm huh, Patsy. Come in. Mr. Carter, Mr. Nick Carter, where is he? Right behind you. Oh, Mr. Carter, I am... I know. Roger Winthrop. Author. I am now engaged in collecting data for my latest novel. In fact, I have already... Has this novel anything to do with your servant's death? Why, uh, no. Then skip it. Uh, of course. But if it weren't for the novel, I never would have rented the old Brocken house. And we'd never have met the old witch. You said witch? He did. You keep out of this, Betsy. What old witch do you mean, Mr. Winter? Who is this, uh... I'm Nick Carter's secretary, amanuensis, general factotum, and the lady who sews the buttons on his shirt. Now, let's get back to the witch. She sounds more interesting. Thanks. Of course, I don't actually think she is one. Still, the natives who live around the Brocken farm are quite convinced of the fact. It seems she's placed a curse on people before this, mostly young boys who taunted her or stole her fruit. Young William Tappan was thrown from his father's farm horse and dragged twice round the barn. Hendrik Vandervoort fell out of an apple tree and broke his arm. And Johnny Upsendike had scarlet fever and jaundice both at the same time. Seems to me I've heard of accidents like that happening to kids even without their being hexed. Yes, Patsy, but that's not the significant part of the narrative. What is? The boys' last names. Tappan, Vandervoort, Upsendike. I take it, Mr. Winthrop, the old Brocken farm you've rented is in a Dutch community. It is. Up the river at the foot of the Donderberg. Wild, hag-ridden country. Mm -hmm. Those families settled there before the revolution and have married and intermarried ever since. All but the Brockens. They seem to have been disliked right from the beginning. Some say they aren't Dutch at all, but Hessians. Yes. Let me see. Brocken. Isn't that the name of that mountain in Germany where all the witches are supposed to gather on Walpurgis Nacht? Yes, that's why the Brockens are said to have settled where they did. Because old Donderberg, the local mountain, bears a strange resemblance to the Brocken. I see. Local gossip has it that on the eve of May Day, which, as you know, is Walpurgis Nacht, all the family and their cats, they've always had black cats, would swoop up the chimney on broomsticks and fly away to Donderberg Mountain for some sort of witch's Sabbath. Then this witch who's supposed to have hexed your servant Jacob is, I gather, one of the famous Brockens. She's the last of them. Miss Hermina Brocken is an old maid, and when she dies, the family will be extinct. And high time, too, if you ask me. Now, you don't really think she's a witch. No, but she's a vindictive, highly neurotic, I might even say dangerous female. And you think she killed Jacob? I do. She laid a hex on him last week, made a rag doll out of an old scarf of his she managed to steal. She named the doll Jacob, of course, and then began sticking pins into it. And last night, or rather early this morning, he died. Tell me exactly what happened. Well, I rented the Brocken house for the summer. It seemed to have the sort of weird, not to say sinister, background I needed for my novel. Did Miss Hermina go with the house, Mr. Winter? Oh, no, no. She and her cat moved out to a sort of farmer's cottage. Oh. I insisted on that. I can't abide cats. Well, as I was saying, last night I was in my study scribbling away the better part of the night. It was a peculiarly black night, you may remember. This is what is called the dark of the moon. Yes, yes, I know. I know. <laughs> well, uh, finally I became aware that everything was unusually quiet. And then I realized I'd worked through the entire night, and this was that queer, unearthly silence that comes just before the dawn. Suddenly, I was conscious of a dull, muffled thud, a thud that was almost a clang. <coughs> what was that? <laughs> Curious how strange sounds become at night. Sounded like the clang of a coffin lid. <laughs> Better lay off work for tonight, Winthrop, old boy. First thing you know, you'll be imagining ghostly footsteps. Good Lord, what's that? Something's coming round the corner of the house. That's the tool house door. Someone's trying to get in. Oh, this is ridiculous. Better go see what it is before my imagination makes a fool of me. I'll take the lamp. It's probably nothing at all. Just the wind rattling the lock. But there isn't any wind tonight. <laughs> Pull yourself together, Winthrop. Down the steps to the woodshed. Yes, something is moving the lock. 
Someone's out there. Some. Wait till I unlock the door. Uh, I'm done for. Jacob, uh, what are you doing out here this time of night? Jacob, what's wrong with you? Don't go near it. Don't go. She's right. It goes straight down to hell. But I... I, I... Good Lord, he's having convulsions. <laughs> Jacob. Jacob. And what happened then, Mr. Winslow? Jacob died right there in my arms. It was horrible. As the death rattle left his throat, his right hand relaxed and something rolled to the floor with a metallic clink. I picked it up and brought it here, thinking it might serve as a clue to this whole horrible business. Let me see. Here. Hmm. Black with age. Looks like a metal slug of some kind. Betsy. Hmm? How about giving this a going over with that metal polish you keep around for polishing them up the doorknobs? With pleasure. It's right here in this drawer. I keep it handy, Mr. Winter, because all the hardware in this old house is brass. And I always say, what's the good of having real brass furnishings unless Not you keep them well... Not interested, Betsy. Postpone the housekeeping. Well, Mr. Winthrop, from your description of Jacob's death, the panting, the dragging footsteps, and the final convulsions, I'd say he was probably poisoned. No possibility of suicide, I suppose. Of course not. It was the witch, Miss Hermina Brocken. I told you she'd put a curse on him. Curses don't cause convulsions, Mr. Winthrop. I never said they did. The point was she hated Jacob enough to want him dead. Why? Well, I, I suppose it was my fault in a way... I told Jacob to make up to the gold girl in order to get her to tell him all the local ghost stories. He unearthed plenty. Some of them, like the headless horseman and the crew of Hendrick Hudson who go bowling in the mountains whenever there's a storm, have already been recorded by Washington Irving. Yes, yes. Then there's the two spectral riders who are supposed to be the ghosts of Major Andre and General Benedict Arnold. They met and rode through that territory, you know, the night Arnold sold out to the enemy. Yes, yes. Then there's the story of a lost treasure that's supposed to be cursed, not to mention a bat woman and a black vulture who appears whenever there's to be a death in the valley. Interesting, but irrelevant. Why did Miss Brocken hate Jacob? Certainly not because he worried those stories out of her. Well, no. As a matter of fact, I rather imagine Jacob overdid his attentions to the old girl. When she discovered he had a wife and five children in the Bronx... Well, she turned on him like a vixen. It was all Peter and I could do to tear him away from her. She was trying to scratch out his eyes. Hell hath no fury and so forth. Quiet, Betty. Just who is Peter, Mr. Winthrop? A local character who does the gardening for me. He's, well, not exactly bright, but he can make anything grow. How does he get on with Miss Brocken? Scared to death of her. Carries a piece of cold iron in his pocket all the time he's around the place. If you touch cold iron, you know, a witch can't harm you. Speaking of cold metal, how's this for a handsome hunk of stuff? It shines better than our doorknobs now that I've got the tarnish off. Well, oh, very interesting. That coin, Patsy, is gold. What? A British guinea, to be exact, minted in the reign of George III. In those days, coins like this were called traitor's gold. For Pete's sake, why? Every British soldier who brought in a member of Washington's army received one of these. And every member of Washington's forces who gave himself up got one, too. Where in the world do you suppose Jacob got hold of this? To answer that, we'll have to make a visit to the Dunderberg. Yes, Mr. Winter. I think you brought us a problem that's even more interesting than you suspect. Well, just what is the significance of the piece of traitor's gold found clutched in the dead man's hand? Is it connected in any way with the strange events which are happening in the shadow of old Dunderberg Mountain? We'll see in just a moment. Linux self-polishing wax is practical proof that there is something new under the sun. New beauty, new protection, new skid resistance for all your floors and linoleum. If you haven't used new Linux self-polishing wax, you haven't learned how different, how perfect the quick-drying wax can be. For Linex self-polishing wax, developed by leading research chemists to give you the best, lends a satiny appearance, a lasting protection, real anti-skid finish to every floor surface in your home. The formula of Linex self-polishing wax is completely new. It contains the greatest possible amount of genuine carnauba wax. And the underwriters' laboratories have proved that linoleum, hardwood, and rubber tile are actually less slippery after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied. When you walk on a Linex surface, you can actually feel the difference. Besides, it takes only a jiffy to wipe on, 
drying quickly to a handsome luster without tiresome rubbing. So it's just good sense to choose genuine Linac self-polishing wax. And of course, if you want the modern type finish, which is brushed on, or even longer lasting protection, use Linex Clear Gloss Varnish, which dries overnight to a beautiful gloss finish that protects your floors and linoleum amazingly for months. Whichever you choose, Linex Self-Polishing Wax or Linex Clear Gloss Varnish, ask for it by name, Linex, and get the best. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to today's exciting case. As we pick up Nick Carter and Patsy, they are following Roger Winthrop along a desolate country road to the Brocken Farm, where Winthrop's servant, Jacob, has recently died a violent death. It is twilight, and the sinister hulk of the Donderberg Mountain broods over the landscape. I'm not surprised that people who live around here believe in witches and curses and hidden treasure, Mr. Winthrop. If you'd spent a couple of months around here the way I have, Miss Bowen, you'd believe in superstitions, too. Things like that don't seem possible back in the midst of the city's traffic. But up here, time seems to stand still. Here, people are still living in the dark ages. I noticed as we came along, most of the barns had hex signs painted on them. Nick, have you noticed the clouds gathering behind that mountain? Yes. I imagine the old Dutchman will start their game of nine pins any time now. I hope we reach your house, Mr. Winthrop, before the storm breaks. It's just over the next rise, Mr. Carter. Here's the gate behind the lilac bush. Well, not what you'd call in very good repair. After you, Patsy. Thank you. That's the house down there in the hollow. And that's Peter sitting outside the tool house door. I gave him strict instructions not to let anyone move the body until you arrive. I know you detectives prefer to find your clues undisturbed. It's sometimes helpful. Why doesn't Peter sit inside the tool house? Because he's afraid of the dead. Oh. There's a superstition around here that the soul of anyone who's died a violent death is afraid of being alone and always tries to take along a companion. <gasps> oh, what's that? Something up there in that tree. It's there, silhouetted against the sky. A black cat. It's Miss Brocken's Hecuba. They're inseparable. If that cat's around... Then the Brocken female isn't far behind. I wondered who's been following us the last quarter mile. Nick, I didn't see or hear a thing. You... You don't mean she's invisible or something? Calm yourself, Patsy. I'll admit she's kept out of sight, but no disembodied spirit breaks twigs and rustles dead leaves. She's been perfectly audible to anyone that took the trouble to listen. Hear that? She just stepped on a loose pebble. My teeth are chattering, though. I couldn't hear an avalanche. Oh, Nick, I don't like this place. Easy, Patsy. Oh, here comes Peter. Poor guy, he looks relieved to see us. Uh, I thought you was never coming. I told you I wouldn't stay if you didn't get back before nightfall. But we did, Peter. This is Mr. Nick Carter, the famous detective. Uh, He'll find out what killed Jacob. The light's fading fast. Better make our examination before it's completely dark. Oh, Patsy, may not be nice. You want to stay out here? With that woman and her cat crawling through the bushes? And a storm coming up beside? Oh, thank you. I'm coming inside, no matter what's in there. Hold the flashlight steady, Betsy. It's horrible, isn't it, Nick? Mm. Extreme rigor mortis and marked tannic constriction of the muscles. Jaws too firmly clamped together to permit any investigation of the oral cavity. We can take a look at the inside of the lips. Hmm. Oh, the poison, whatever it was, was violent, but I don't think it was administered by mouth. No. Well, let's see. Now, rest on the instep of the shoes between the sole and heel. Heavy boots and corduroy trousers, and all of the lower limbs. Ah, hands bare. Yes, yes, look here. The two small punctures of his right thumb. Yes. Winthrop, help me roll back his sleeve. Right, Mr. Carter. Ah, here we are. Two more. And here again. And again. And all the punctures have already started the gangrene. That's how the poison entered the body. Oh, uh -huh. It's the evil eye. Those two dents. It's the mark of the evil eye. They burn straight through you until you're dead. Interesting idea, Peter. But what killed Jacob was quite a bit more deadly than any evil eye. You mean you know who killed him? Definitely. The question now is to find where the killer's hiding. But, Nick, I... Let's see if we can get a line on how Jacob spent his last 12 hours. Get the small microscope out of my zipper case, will you, Patsy? Oh, and you might prepare a few slides. Right, you are, Nick. 
just exactly what are you doing that for, Mr. Carter? Uh, cleaning the dead man's nails, I mean. A good scientific detective, Mr. Withrop, can pretty well deduce from what he finds under any person's nails where that person has been and what he's done for some time previous. Oh, a slide, please, Patsy. Here you are. This is my most powerful lens, of course. This flashlight isn't as strong as one could wish. You... You had anything there? Yes. Quite a few things. He ate a piece of chocolate cake for dinner with a finger to pull it. Sawed quite a bit of wood. Minute bits of sawdust. That was yesterday afternoon. He also plucked a chicken recently and polished the furniture. Tiny globules of very fine oil. But the most interesting ingredient in the whole collection is a certain tiny spored mold or fungus. A great deal of it, as a matter of fact. Maybe he went out picking wildflowers in the woods. No. This particular fungus only grows in places where there's a great deal of moisture and where sunlight never reaches. Any place like that around here, Mr. Winthrop? Basement? Spring house? No, no. The basement's bone dry and there is no spring house. How about a well? There are few enough improvements on the place. No electricity, no telephone. But we do have a hand pump in the kitchen sink. Which means if there's a well under it, Jacob couldn't very easily get down into it. I'd say it would be absolutely impossible. Hmm. Wait a minute. There's some sort of boarded up stonework with a padlock out back of the barn. I remember someone told me it's a condemned cistern or well of some sort. Ah, that's the witch's well. You'll be wise to stay away from it. It's the way straight down to hell. The way to hell? Yeah. Weren't those Jacob's last words before he died? Why, yes, Mr. Carter. Come on, show me the place. Unless I'm very much mistaken, that's where we'll find the answer to this problem. Uh. At the bottom of the well. Sounds as if Henry Hudson's crew had started a game of nineteen. Oh, that means there's evil abroad tonight. Nick, Nick, I just remembered something. Now what? Isn't tomorrow the first of May? That means this is Walpurgis night. When witches ride and graves give up their dead. Yeah. Yeah. That one sounded like a strike. This is the system, Mr. Carter, or whatever it is. I thought you said it was padlocks, Mr. Winthrop. It always has been. Not now. A lot lying on the ground. Staples all bent and twisted. Looks as if someone had broken it. And the cover's been moved recently, too. But here, Nick, these scratches on stone. That thing, I do believe you're finally beginning to notice things. You know where you can go, don't you? Yeah, that's just where you will go if you get too interested in that well. Now, look here, Peter. Uh, you're a big boy now. You don't really think Miss Brocken's a witch? I know she is. Ever see her ride a broomstick? No, but I've seen her go down this well. When was this? Winter nights, me and my brother Timmy would hide in the hay of that old barn and wait for her to come along. First, we'd hear the scrape as she pulled off the lid, and then we'd see her climb down inside with the lantern in her teeth and that old black cat sitting on her shoulder. Why do you think she did it? Climb down inside, I mean. To get warm, of course. It's nice and cozy in hell on a winter's night. She never went down in summer? No, why should she? It's hot enough right here in the valley in summertime. Very interesting observation, Peter. And it verifies my hunt just how Jacob was killed and why. What do you mean, Mr. Carter? Help me pull the lid off this well and I'll show you. Here, take that side now. Right, I have it. There. That does it. Now, Patsy, give me that flashlight. Here you are. Thanks. Now, let's see what we've got. Ah, yes. Notice those rusty spikes driven into the stonework to form a sort of ladder? And notice where the rust has been scraped recently. That's how Jacob got it on his boots. He followed Miss Brocken's example and climbed down into the well. You'll also notice that the stones are covered with that curious fungus we found under his... Nick. Nick. Nick, she's watching us. Over there under that apple tree. And the cat's standing on her shoulder. We've been waiting for you, Miss Brocken. I think you can tell us how Jacob died. It was his own greed killed him. I warned him no man could go down there and live. You knew he died if he went down into the well, and yet you let him go. I did not. I refused him the key, I did. But he broke up in the lock like a thief when no one was looking. He wouldn't listen, and so he had to die. And I'm not sorry. You killed him, you old... Easy, Winthrop. Miss Brocken isn't responsible for Jacob's death. Then who is? You said yourself he was poisoned. Quite right. 
And I think if I drop this rock down into the well, we may rouse the killers. <laughs> Aye, if you do, they'll play you their devil's tattoo. Oh, Nick, be careful. I'm afraid. Here goes the stone. Now, listen. Oh, Nick. Nick, I heard him. Good Lord, what is it? Oh. Rattlesnake. Forget, this is rattlesnake country. And I rather imagine there's a rattlesnake nest down there. Aye, that there is. Old ones and the young ones, the darlings. I told Jacob not to go down in that well. I told him he'd go to hell, but all he cared for was gold. And so he's dead. Dead! Dead! And I'm glad! <laughs> There's one thing I still don't understand about that Dunderberg mystery. Why did Jacob go down into the well? And why wasn't Miss Brocken bitten when she did the same thing? I'll answer the last question first. Miss Brocken was careful to make all her descents into the well in winter. But so what? You see, when snakes hibernate, they become cold and almost lifeless. As can a snake charmer. It's an old trick of the trade to put snakes on ice just before a show makes them quite harmless. Oh. And as for the reason that drew both Miss Brocken and Jacob into the well... I deduce from the sample Jacob had in his hand that the Brocken Well is the hiding place of Benedict Arnold's famous lost treasure. What's that? Well, Major Andre is supposed to have given Arnold a golden guinea for every man then garrisoned at West Point. Arnold undoubtedly hid the money and didn't have time to dig it up when he had to flee for his life after his treachery was uncovered. But if the Brocken family knew where it was, why didn't they use it themselves? Probably because they thought it was tainted money with a curse on it. I see. Well, thanks, Nick. Now, in just a moment, I want you and Patsy to give us a preview of next week's exciting case. Everybody's heard the old saying that home is where the heart is. And because home does matter most, it deserves the most careful attention you can give it. Keep your home at its loveliest with the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux cream polish, for example, renews the original gleaming beauty of your fine furniture. The handsome appearance of the wood grain itself in one quick, easy application. That's because Linex Cream Polish cleans as it polishes, saving one whole step in your cleaning day routine. The cloudy look of old polish and dust, the blurry appearance of finger marks, are erased as if by magic. And Linex Cream Polish leaves no surface film of oil for dust to cling to. It helps conceal disfiguring scratches, too. So take the streamlined way to furniture care. Linex Cream Polish for fine furniture. Tell your dealer you want the product that cleans as it polishes. Ask for all three great Linux home brighteners. Linux cream polish, Linux self-polishing wax, and Linux clear gloss varnish at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, what about next week's story? Next week, Ken, I think I'll tell you the story of how an heir mysteriously disappeared before it was born. And a curious and frantic case it was. When a woman who's going to have a baby any minute disappears into thin air right on the threshold of a famous maternity hospital, then she... Now, Patsy, don't give the whole plot away. Wait until next week. What do you call a story, Nick? I call it... The Vanishing Lady. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White. The programs are written by Edith Miser, and any resemblance therein to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paint. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective.
presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Vanishing Lady. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter traced a woman who vanished on the steps of the Mercy Maternity Hospital and found out what really happened to her unborn heir. But now, no ordinary phrase is heard oftener than what's new. And this is the answer wise homemakers are giving these days. The three great Linux home brighteners. Linux self-polishing wax, Linux cream polish, and Linux clear gloss varnish. The modern shortcuts to perfect care for floors, woodwork, and furniture. Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new wax product, beautifies floors with a satiny yet tough anti-skid finish. Linux cream polish cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. And Linux Clear Gloss Varnish, which is brushed on, dries to an elastic, transparent surface that protects all wood and linoleum in your home. Do as thousands of modern homemakers do. Save hours of work each week. Enjoy sparkling new beauty in your home. Get the three great Linux home brighteners now. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the Miracle Wall Finish. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. As we look in on Nick Carter today, we find him in his laboratory at the top of the old brownstone house on the corner of 5th and 4th. It is night. The laboratory is dark except for the strange unearthly glow of a small mercury vapor lamp which casts an eerie light into the intent and watchful eyes of the great detective Nick Carter. There is silence. Someone moves in the shadow. You're right, Patsy. The ultraviolet ray shows that two different inks were used in the writing of this will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole job's a forgery. That's all. Turn on the lights. Oh, praise be. Now I can go home and get a night's sleep for a change. Oh, no, not yet. Get the vaporizer ready. I want to test this sheet of paper for latent fingerprints. Oh, you want iodine, osmium, tetroxide? Tetroxide. I want to take pictures. Okay. Iodine just isn't photogenic. Now, take it oh. easy, Patsy. It's only the night bell. Somebody's at the front door, so... I guess I'll never get over having my stomach do nip-ups if a phone or a doorbell rings suddenly in the middle of the night. Here, you take this stuff. I'll go down and see who it is. Mr. Carter, you are Mr. Nick Carter. Why, yes. Uh, what seems to be the trouble? It's my wife. She's disappeared. We had a quarrel, and now she's gone. Well, I wouldn't be too upset, Mr... Ashford, Harold Ashford. But I am upset. Anyone would be. You see, she's going to have a baby. When? Now, any minute. I mean, any hour. She was on her way to the hospital. That's when she disappeared, right on the steps of Mercy Hospital. Well, why weren't you with her at the time? I just told you we had a quarrel. Don't, don't you see? I... Now, look here, Mr. Ashford. Oh, just Suppose a minute, you... Nick. I think we'd get more information if we gave Mr. Ashworth a chance to collect himself. Here, sit down in this easy chair. Thanks. You're very kind, Mrs. Carter. I guess you've been through this yourself. Oh, no, my name's Bowen. Miss Patsy Bowen. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I apologize. <laughs> That's perfectly all right, Mr. Ashworth. You see, I was one of a large family, so I do know a little about these things. Mr. Carter, on the other well, hand... Now, look here, Patsy. Mr. Ashworth didn't come here, did he? Quiet, Nick. You may be tops when it comes to scientific detection, but how you ever pass in applied psychology? Now, Mr. Ashford, suppose you tell us all about it from the beginning. Yes. Yes, of course. Patsy, sometimes I have to hand it to you. Thanks. All right, Mr. Ashford, you and your wife are expecting a baby. Uh, what's her name, by the way? Nora. She was Nora Brent. Mm -hmm. Her two uncles own the Brent Tubing and Appliances Company. Then she has money. Oh, no. Her father was a minister. He died before we met. 
Her uncle's never approved of me. You see, I've been married before. Widowed or divorced? Divorced. That's what her uncles didn't approve of. And besides, Nora's a good ten years younger than I am. They say I married her on the rebound. You see, she had a childhood sweetheart, Jim Stanley, a boy she'd known all her life. He was reported missing with a carrier that went down in the Pacific. That was two years ago. Nora was pretty cut up about it. My first wife had just run away with another man. So you consoled each other? Well, maybe just at first, but it didn't take long for us to realize that we were made for each other. You've got to believe me, Mr. Carter, we loved each other. We were ideally happy. No arguments? No differences of opinion? No, never. That is, not until today. And what happened today? This morning, a letter came for Nora. It was addressed to Nora Brent. Not Mrs. Ashford, mind you. And up in the corner of the envelope, the sender's name and address read... Chief Petty Officer Jim Stanley, Tappan Even Hospital. But that's the man she was in love with. The man who was supposed to be dead. Now he's in a hospital only five miles down the bay. I take it she got excited when she saw the letter. I knew she would, Mr. Carter. And, well, maybe it was jealousy. Maybe I was afraid of what might happen. You see, we're expecting the baby almost any time, so... So what? So I destroyed the letter. Hmm. Very short-sighted. I realize that now, but I couldn't bear to think of losing her. I'd have done anything to prevent it. It would have been much better to have brought the whole thing out into the open. It's too late now. It's happened. Just what I was afraid of. We were sitting in my den after dinner tonight. I was so worried, I just couldn't seem to take my eyes off her. Pretty soon I realized I was making her nervous, so I said I thought I'd go to bed and read. I'd just got into my pajamas when the phone rang. I let Nora answer it because her uncle, Timothy Brent, generally called about that time to find out how Nora was feeling. Oh, so the uncles had forgiven her for marrying you. Oh, yes. Tim Brent's a swell guy. He came right around to see us as soon as Paul, the other uncle, died five months ago. But Paul never forgave us. He even cut Nora out of his will. Stubborn old customer, huh? And was it Uncle Tim on the telephone? No. I could hear Nora's voice, but not what she was saying. She was talking on the extension in the dining room. So... Pretty soon, she opened the bedroom door. She was sort of quiet and white. Oh, what did you do with that letter? What? What letter, Nora? The one from Jim Stanley. I just talked to him. But, Nora, there wasn't any letter. You mean Jim's alive? Harold, you've never lied to me before. How could you? How could you? Nora, please, I can explain. I don't want any explanations. I don't want... Nora. Nora, darling, what's wrong? What's the matter? Baby, I've got to get to the hospital. I've got... Nora, get... please, darling, don't be frightened. Just as soon as I get dressed again, I'll... I'll take it. It's probably Uncle Tim. Hello. Oh, yes, Uncle Tim. No, something's happened. It's, it's the baby. I'm going to the hospital right away. Please call Dr. Jenkins and tell him that I need him. Time to come right away. Nora, for heaven's sakes, wait just a minute until I no. get... No, my... Harold, I'm going for good. I don't ever want to see you again. <laughs> And she left without you? Yes. I heard the front door slam while I was putting on my shoes. I ran after her, but it's too late. Old Joe, that, that's the man who has the taxi on our corner, pulled away just as I ran out the front door. It was 20 minutes before I got another cab. I drove to Mercy Hospital as fast as I could make the driver go. It couldn't have taken us more than 12 minutes to get there, but it seemed like hours. What happened when you got to the hospital? I rushed up the steps into the reception room and demanded that the nurse ask at the desk to take me to my wife. And? They said they hadn't played eyes on her. Maybe she went somewhere there. That's what I thought. I thought maybe she'd been in an accident, or maybe the baby had been born in the way. I thought all kinds of horrible things. Then I remembered Joe, the taxi driver, owned the cab my wife had driven off in, so I drove back home again. Joe swears he drove her straight to Mercy Hospital. He even watched her go up the steps and open the big front door. Very interesting. Patsy, I think we shall have to interview both Joe and the nurse at the desk. I was hoping you'd say that, Mr. Carter. I brought Joe along. His cab's waiting outside. He can drive us to the hospital. Well, what can Joe tell Nick about the vanishing lady that he hasn't already told her husband, Harold? And how could Nora open the big front door of the hospital and yet apparently never enter it? We'll see in just a moment. If you've used new Linux self-polishing wax, then you know firsthand how different, how perfect a quick-drying wax can be. If not, it's high time you tried it, because here at last is sparkling new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance for all your floors and linoleum. 
developed by leading research chemists to give you the best, Linex self-polishing wax lends handsome appearance, lasting protection, real anti-skid finish to every floor surface in your home. Yes, Linex self-polishing wax is made from a formula that's completely new. It has the highest possible content of genuine Carnauba wax, and it has been proved by the underwriter's laboratories that linoleum, hardwood, and rubber tile are actually less slippery after application of Linex self-polishing wax. When you walk on a Linex surface, you can actually feel the difference. What's more, it dries quickly to a satiny luster without tiresome rubbing, and it takes only a jiffy to wipe on. So do as wise modern homemakers have learned to do. Choose genuine Linex self-polishing wax. If you want the modern finish of the brush-on type, which gives even longer-lasting protection, use Linex clear gloss varnish, which dries overnight to a beautiful gloss finish and gives your floors and linoleum amazing protection for months. Whether you prefer Linex self-polishing wax or Linex clear gloss varnish, you get the best when you ask for it by name, Linex. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that dries in one hour, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to our story. As we see Nick Carter again, he and Patsy and Harold Ashforth are in old Joe's cab, which is whirling them off to Mercy Hospital, on whose steps Mrs. Ashforth disappeared less than an hour previously as she was on her way there to have a baby. Nick is questioning the driver. Look here, Joe. Yeah? You're sure it was Mrs. Ashforth you drove to Mercy Hospital tonight? Sure, I'm sure. I'd know her anyways. When you got to the hospital, did you help her up the steps? No, I helped her out of the cab, and just as she opens the door, a man comes out from under the portico, and she runs to him. He puts his arms around her. So I guessed it was somebody she'd known, and I drove off. Who was this man? What did he look like? Well, I couldn't rightly say. It was too dark. I see. Well, here you are. Here's the hospital. Go oh, wait here, Joe. We may need you again. Yes, yeah, sure. reception desk is over here, Mr. Carter. That's the nurse that told me my wife was... Well, look who's there talking to her. It's Uncle Tim. What's been going on here, I'd like to know. Well, if the baby did decide to arrive ahead of time. Plenty of hospitalists get to take care of cases like that. But I tell you, Mr. Brent, we didn't turn your niece away. Mrs. Ashford never came here. I swear to you, she never walked in that door. Then why did I just get this wire saying you were full up? Mind if I have a look at that telegram, Mr. Brent? And who in blazes are you? This is Nick Carter, Uncle Tim. He's trying to find out what's happened to Nora. Hunter, didn't you stick with Nora? You'd done your duty as a father. We'd know where she was. Suppose you let me look at that telegram and see what I can make of it. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Hmm. Mercy Hospital full. Mrs. Ashforth taken elsewhere. Everything under control. No cause for anxiety. Signed, Mrs. Mary Brown. Who's Mrs. Brown? Never heard of her. You, Harold? Name means absolutely nothing to me. Mary Brown. Nice, indefinite sort of name. Let's see. This telegram was handed in at the Midtown Station at 10.45. That was only a few minutes after Nora left the house. Yes. Interesting. When did you receive the telegram, Mr. Brent? About ten minutes ago. I came right over here. I only live three blocks away. Why didn't you receive it earlier? Should have had it three quarters of an hour ago. I suppose I would have if I'd been home, but I went to a late movie. Patsy. Yes, Nick. Suppose you go to the telegraph office as where I was sent from. See if you can get a line and who handed it in. Then get hold of a nurse's registry. Just possible there may be a nurse by the name of Mary Brown. Okay. There is. Find out what hospital or sanatorium she works out of. Report back to Mr. Ashforth's apartment. Right, Nick. I'm on my way. And you, Mr. Ashforth, I suggest you go home. I have a hunch you'll get a telegram yourself in the not-too-distant future. You think so? Maybe there's one there already. I'll see you later. Mr. Brent, tell me. You really think your niece is still in love with this fellow, Jim Stanley? It's my personal opinion, Mr. Carter, that she found she didn't love her husband. She took that way out to sort of keep him at arm's length. Well, I guess I'll be getting on home. Is there something more I can do for you? No, I think you've done everything we could expect, Mr. Brent. 
But there are still a few questions I'd like to ask the nurse at the reception desk. Good night. Good night, Mr. Now then, sister. Honest, Mr. Carter, Mrs. Ashworth didn't come here tonight. We don't turn away cases like hers ever. Mr. Ashworth's doctor, what's his name? Stevens. He takes care of all the Brents and the Ashworths. Did he show up at any time tonight? Oh, no, sir. He hasn't been here all either. And yet Nora told her uncle to get hold of him. I wonder. All right, see, there's a telephone down the hall. Suppose you ask the operator to connect me with the ambulatory ward at Tappan Base Hospital. And while I'm getting that call, you might phone Dr. Stevens' house and find out for me why he didn't get round to deliver the Ashworth baby. Oh, let him think it's a routine inquiry from the hospital. Will you do that for me? Oh, anything I can do for you is a pleasure, Mr. Carter, I'm sure. Thanks, sister. I'll take the call down here. Gee. Myrtle, connect the gentleman on the hall phone with the Tappan Base Hospital. Yeah, the Tappan Base Hospital, the ambulatory ward. Yes, Mr. Nick Carter, the detective. Hurry up, will you, Myrtle? Hello? Is this the doctor in charge of the ambulatory ward? That's right. Nick Carter speaking. I want to find out about a patient named Jim or James Stanley. Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Carter. What would you like to know? Where is he now? Well, I don't know. He made a telephone call earlier in the evening, and apparently it upset him very much. He said he had to get into town at once, so, well, we let him go. He didn't say where he was going? No, but I gather it was somewhere in town. If you think there's anything that I can do... No, no, no. That's quite all right. Thanks. Oh, Mr. Carter, I got Dr. Stevens' house. He's out on an emergency. He never got the call about Mrs. Ashford. Gee, it must have been a big emergency. Hey... Where you going, Mr. Carter? Prevent another emergency, I hope. Now, thanks, Joe. Okay. Which is the Ashforth apartment? Ground floor right, just inside the front door. Thanks. Oh, yes. Somebody there, all right. Light slits, shades drawn. What's that? Two figures. Male. Great Jupiter, one of them's got a gun. Come on, Nick, old boy, no time for a door. Here we go through the window. All right, up with your hands, both of you. But he shot at me. Maybe, but he didn't hit you. She undoubtedly would have if he meant to kill you. That's right, I... Well, I was just trying to keep him off me. He's got some crazy idea that I ran away with his wife. I take it your chief petty officer, Jim Stanley. That's right. I found out today this guy had married Nora. Well, she sounded sort of upset when I talked to her on the phone, so I thought I'd just drop around and size up the situation. If he wasn't treating her right, I was going to beat his ears in. Nora and I grew up together. We were like brother and sister. You see, Mr. Stanley, unfortunately, Mr. Ashforth's wife disappeared just after you talked to her. And somehow, he rather imagined she might have run away with you. So that's why he jumped me. Oh, but he's got it all wrong about me and Nora. Oh, we had a crush when we were in school, but... I married a girl in Australia three years ago. I wrote Nora at the time, and she wrote back wishing me luck. Well, she never told me that. We women do strange things sometimes to keep our boyfriends guessing. Oh, Patsy, stay away from that broken window. Wait for me outside. Don't worry, I'm not the one who takes chances. Oh, look, Nick, I found out about the telegram, and there's no Mary Brown Miss or Mrs. in the nurse's registry. And the telegram was handed in by a man. In fact, I think he sent another... I ran into Miss Patsy coming round the corner. Oh, Miss Grant, hello. Yes, I had a hunch you'd get another wire. Let's have a look. No, don't try to come in. Patsy will hand it up. Here you are, Nick. Thanks. Your grandniece and her mother doing beautifully at Clay Sanatorium. What? Come and bring the papa. Mrs. Ashforth keeps asking for him. And no signature. She wants me. Nora wants me. And the baby's here. I have a little girl. It's wonderful. Where's my hat? No, I haven't got time. Come on, everybody. Well, Joe, we seem to have kept you rather busy tonight. Yeah, that's all right by me. It just shows me meter keeps ticking. I'm a father. Father of a baby girl. Sure, pal. Maybe you'll have better luck next time. 
After all, you and Nora are still young. I just what did you mean, Mr. Brent, about better luck next time? Anything unlucky about a baby girl? My brother, as you probably know, disinherited Nora. However, he did leave a codicil to his will. He couldn't bear to think of the Brent factory going out of the family. So he said that if Nora ever had a son, he would inherit my brother's share of the business. You see, my brother was a woman hater at heart. So having a girl baby cost Harold a half a million dollars. I see. Well, here you are, the Clay Sanitarium. Fancy looking place, ain't it? Fancy and expensive. Well, some of the very best babies get themselves born here. Old Dr. Jeremiah Clay is famous for that. He's brought more millionaires into the world than you can shake a stick at. Too bad Mr. Ashford's daughter isn't a millionaire, too. Oh, money doesn't matter. It's my wife and daughter who really count now. I'm glad you've come. Welcome, Mr. Brandt, and congratulations to you, sir. Uh, you must be the father. Sorry, I haven't that honor. This is Mr. Ashforth. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, this way, Mr. Ashforth, please. The new mother is so anxious to see you. Uh, this way, please. Uh, such a curious case. Women are often most unreasonable at these times. Didn't want the family informed. Of course, the minute it was all over, when she saw the baby, complete return to normalcy. One of the family at once. Uh, this is her room. Sorry, I'm afraid only the father can go in. Uh, uh, just at first, you know. Nora. Oh, Nora, darling. Oh, Harold. Harold. Dearest. Oh, my darling. Oh, Harold, too. Please, darling. It really wasn't so bad. I had a very easy time. It's the girl, you know. I'm sorry. Oh, dearest, I don't care what it is. Just as long as you love me. Silly, of course I do. Funny when they showed her to me. It's like being introduced to a perfect stranger. Oh, darling, we'll get acquainted with her together. Well, come on, Nick. Our job's finished. Let's go home. Oh, Dr. Clay. Yes? I think I'd like to have a look at Mrs. Ashforth's baby. Of course. I'll have her nurse show it to you. Uh, just a moment, please. This is the first time I ever knew you to show an interest in the nursery. I'm playing a hunch, Betsy. Oh? A hunch that may split this case wide open. This is where we keep the babies. I'm sorry you can't go in, but I've asked the other nurse to bring the baby to the window. I'll motion to her. You haven't many babies here, have you? No, this is a small private hospital, you see. Oh, there she is. It's a fine, healthy-looking little girl, isn't she? So that's supposed to be the Ashforth baby. Hmm? What do you mean, supposed? If there's a name on a tag, I put it there myself. That baby's at least three days old. Moreover, forceps were used at her delivery. Patsy. You heard Mrs. Ashworth say she had a very easy time. Nick, you mean it's been a mistake? Mistake nothing. It's been a criminal substitution. Nurse, how much did Mr. Timothy Brent pay you to substitute a girl for a boy baby? How dare you? I'll call Dr. Clay and have you arrested for slander. Oh, no, you won't. Of course, if you do, I'll insist that the police take a blood test of that baby. And if that test proves the baby's blood does not belong to Mr. and Mrs. Ashforth's blood group, you'll end up in behind bars for a long, long stretch. Oh, no. No, don't. I'll tell you everything. I did it for Timothy Brent. He said his niece would lose her mind if she had a boy baby. He said that... You lie. I had nothing to do with it. You did, Mr. Brent. You brought her here. You arranged for the whole thing. Are you double-crossing little... Easy, easy. You'll wake the patients. Now then, nurse. Where's the real Ashworth baby? The boy? In the first crib by the door, Mr. Carter. You're sure there's no mistake this time? Yes. That's the Ashworth baby. Very well. That's it. I think we'll introduce him to his mother. We'll talk to you later, nurse. And to you, Mr. Brent. I wouldn't have done it, but Mr. Brent said... I have nothing to do with this, Mr. Later, Brent, later. All right, Patsy. Go get the baby. Don't you want to carry him in, Nick? Oh, good heavens, no. I'm afraid I might break him. Ah, uh, here we are. All right. Come, come on, on now. Patsy. Come on, come on. Mrs. Ashworth, it seems there's been a slight mix-up. The baby they brought you before belonged to someone else. So we... Well, we thought you might like to see yours. It's a boy. A boy? Uh, bring him in, Patsy. Okay. Young man? 
This is your mother. Oh, oh, give him to me, please. Here you are. Oh, Harold. Oh, Harold, look at him screw his face up. Oh, he's so, so homely and so darling. I'd know he belonged to us anywhere. In just a moment, Nick will tell you the clues that enabled him to solve the case of the vanishing lady. But now, there's always added warmth of hospitality in a home that's beautifully cared for. See to it that your home extends that sort of hospitality. It's easy when you have the three great Linux home brighteners to help you. For example, notice how your furniture takes on new loveliness after you've used Linux cream polish. Because it cleans as it polishes. One quick, easy application of Linex cream polish erases finger marks, removes dust and old polish deposits, helps conceal scratches, all at the same time. So save half the time, half the fuss of furniture upkeep. Depend on Linex cream polish, the modern shortcut to furniture protection. Get it at your dealers now. Linex cream polish, which saves one whole step in your cleaning day routine. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners, Linux self-polishing wax, Linux cream polish, and Linux clear gloss varnish at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the modern wall finish that covers in one coat, dries in one hour. Now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, why didn't you have that old reprobate Uncle Tim Brent arrested? Yes, Nick. How come you let him go free? Well, when the DA's office goes over his books in order to straighten out the kid's inheritance, they'll do plenty to him without my help. Oh, of course. So that's why he had to change the boy for a girl. He's been up to some shenanigans with his brother's fortune. Obviously. Well, Nick, when did you first suspect the uncle? Right away. Oh, just like that, eh? Well, it couldn't have been anybody else. The man who met Nora on the hospital steps had to be responsible for her disappearance. Only two men knew she was on her way to the hospital. Her husband and her uncle. That's right. Her husband was left at the post, never caught up with her. Therefore, it had to be the uncle. Well, Nick, that was quite a story. Now, what can you tell us about next week's case? Well, let's see. Next week, I think I'll tell you about the pompous chemical magnet who rang our doorbell one evening, clad in pajamas, overcoat, and bare feet. And the pajama legs were partly burned off. In fact, that was the third night in a row that the old boy had been thrown out of a hotel because he... Uh, hold it, Patsy, hold it. Let's not give the whole plot away. That comes next week. Well, what do you call that story, Nick? I call it The Strange Case of the Involuntary Firebug. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White. The programs are written by Edith Miser, and any resemblance therein to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mutual Broadcasting System. Mutual Broadcasting System. Mutual Broadcasting System. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints.
this is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's baffling case, The Mystery of Hangman's Wood. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter discovered what caused the ghostly shadow of a long dead pirate to appear at full moon upon the side of a deserted barn and why, and what he did about it after he found out. You know, Mom is a person who's entitled to real consideration, not only on Mother's Day, but the whole year round. She deserves the most attractive home, the greatest convenience, the utmost leisure modern living can provide. And now American science has given her the modern shortcuts to happy homemaking. For example, the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux self-polishing wax, Linux cream polish, and Linux clear gloss, which works such magic in the care of furniture, woodwork, and floors. Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new wax product, beautifies floors with a satiny yet tough anti-skid finish. Linux cream polish for fine furniture cleans as it polishes, leaving no surface oil to attract dust. And Linux clear gloss, which is brushed on, dries to an elastic, transparent surface that protects all wood and linoleum in your home. Give your home a new, easy beauty treatment now with the three great Linux home brighteners. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the Miracle Wall Finish. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. As we join Nick Carter and his secretary, Patsy Bowen, this week, we don't find them in the old house in the corner of 5th and 4th. Instead, they're watching the sunset on the terrace of a little inn overlooking the placid waters of the Potomac. But it's only a busman's holiday. They've come in answer to a frantic telegram sent by Professor Markert. That famous archaeologist is explaining his problem to them in cultured but slightly agitated tone. You know, it's extraordinary, Mr. Carter. I might even say fantastic. Never have I come across a more curious manifestation of local superstition. As you know, I've been investigating the so-called pirate caves of the Potomac. Doesn't sound like a very cheerful thought, does it, Nick? Well, there have been many conjectures as to the origin of these holes, Patsy, but the most logical explanation is that they served as hiding places for pirates in the times when they preyed on Virginia shipping. As oh. we believe, they were also used as hiding places in which to store their loot. But you didn't send for us to discuss these pirate caves, did you, Professor? Oh, good grief, no. I, Mr. Carter, I want to see if you can solve the mystery of the specter of Hangman's Wood. Specter? Well, that sounds promising, Professor. I hope you're right, Patsy. Now, Professor, you say it all started night before last. You and your assistant, uh, what's his name, had been working later than usual. Yes, Mr. Carter. Harvey and I had become so absorbed in our search that we pursued our digging until long past supper time. In fact, the moon was just rising above Hangman's Wood when we emerged into the open air. Look, Professor, the moon's rising above the treetops. Oh, yes, yes. I had no idea we'd work so late. Oh, I had, Professor. I'm starving hungry. <laughs> you know, so am I now that you mention it. Well, let's pick up the shovels. We'll be getting back to the inn. Yes. Ah, oh, the moonlight is beautiful, isn't it? Turns the trees to silver with long, mysterious shadows stretching out below. Oh, it's eerie, if you ask me, sir. I wonder why they call this place Hangman's Wood. Because it was here that they hanged many of the pirates and robbers who waylaid ships coming up the river. That great gnarled and leafless oak that stands over there, Harvey, between us and the deserted barn, that's supposed to have held as many as seven bodies suspended from its branches at one time. No wonder it died off. Out of sheer horror, I'd say. Oh, oh good Lord, what's that? Oh, just an owl of some kind. Well, as I was saying, Harvey, during the full moon, the spirits of those hardy buccaneers who were hanged there on the gallows tree are supposed to return. Professor, Professor, look. Huh? Over there. Where? Where the shadow of the tree is thrown against the side of that barn. There's a shadow of something hanging from one of the limbs. Look, it looks like the body of a man. Yes. Yes, Harvey, it certainly resembles the shadow of a body hanging from a rope 
with its head bent sharply to one side as if the neck were broken. The interesting thing about it is that there isn't a body hanging from the limb of the tree to cast that shadow. Oh, heaven. The shadow of a man who'd been hanged, but no body to cast the shadow. You investigated, Professor? Well, <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, Mr. Carter, Harvey was rather upset by the whole thing, and, well, I'll admit he didn't have to argue too hard to persuade me to leave the vicinity. You say that local superstition says these uh, manifestations occur when the moon is full. That's right. But you saw that shadow two nights ago. Wasn't that a bit previous? The moon isn't full until tonight. Exactly. That's why I wired you that it was imperative for you to come this evening. I propose to return to Hangman's Wood and see if the phenomenon will repeat itself. All right. How about you, Patsy? Want to come along? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. I'd love to. Mr. Carter. Now, this is the gallows tree, and there is the old barn on which the shadow appeared. Everything is just as it was the other night. I don't see a blessed thing, do you, Nick? Wait till the moon rises above the treetops. That should be any moment now. Yes. Yes, here it comes. The shadow of the tree begins to form on the side of the barn. I don't see any hanging body, Nick. Hmm. There's a breeze rising. Yes, it often comes up with the moon, they tell me, Mr. Carter. Ah, yes. The full moon rides clear of the top branches of the old oak tree. The wind freshens, the branches murmur. <coughs> yes. oh, goodness, Nick, did you hear that? Yes, Patsy. The screech owl. Oh. And a screech owl in this vicinity, Mr. Carter, is supposed to be a harbinger of ill fortune. I rather suspect that particular screech owl, Professor, is even more ominous than that. What? There. Look at that shadowy shape slowly materializing in the moonlight on the barn door. Nick, it's just as the professor said. The shadow of a man hanging by his neck. Yes. And as you can see, there's nothing hanging from the tree which would cause that shadow. Nothing at all. That's not too significant, Pat, Professor. The interesting feature of that shadow is that it doesn't sway in the breeze. What's that? Yes, this breeze is strong enough to move any object hanging from the limbs of that tree. Provided it were hanging. (coughs) Uh. I do wish that bird would go away. He's probably got a nest somewhere in that old barn. I think we'd better investigate that barn, Professor. Particularly that door that frames the hanging shadow. Oh, Patsy, while we investigate the barn it rests on, you wouldn't care to climb the gallows tree and see if you can discover the origin of the shadow. I would not. Not that I think there isn't a perfectly normal explanation of some sort for that that apparition, mind you. Well, then. But nobody in his right mind has any business to go climbing trees in the dark. (laughs) Okay, Patsy, we'll come back tomorrow in the daylight for the tree. At the barn door. I think we'd better investigate that right now. Very well, Mr. Carter, if you think it best. Let's see. Now, you know, this barn door is interesting. Very interesting. This old lock is rusted with age. And unbroken cobwebs cover all the hinges and lintels. Well, that means no one's been inside the old relic for a dog's age. On the contrary, Patsy. Someone has been inside. And very recently. What? He was driving a horse and wagon. Look here. The ruts in the soft earth. Oh. The ones going into the barn are rather light. But here. Look at these that are superimposed on the first ones. Yes. Notice how much deeper they cut. How the horse coming away from the barn dug his hoops in as though pulling a heavy load. Oh, good heavens, Mr. Carter. You don't mean there's another mystery besides the shadow of the hanging man? Oh, dear. Now we have a horse and wagon that can drive through a barn door that's been locked for years. Maybe the driver just said open sesame and the door disappeared into thin air. No, the trick is slightly more obvious, Patsy. I'd like to have a look a little higher up. Professor. Yes? Bend over so I can climb up your back. I want to stand on your shoulders. Uh, Like this? Yes, that's it. All right, now steady. All right, I've got you. All right. Yes. Yes, I was right. There's a long crack running parallel with the ground. That means the hinges are on the inside. The whole wall swings inward. All right, steady, Professor. I'm coming down. I sure are. Now, let's see what happens if we push the bottom of the wall right about here. 
All right, all together now. Oh, Nick, it's swinging up. It's open. Say, that's neat. Must work on a system of pulleys and counterweights. Gosh, Nick, it's dark in there. Well, it's not too dark when you get used to it. I've got an idea there may be something interesting hidden in here. Something that someone has gone to great pains to keep secret. The hidden door, the body of the shadow are all part of the plot to keep interlopers from... Oh, Nick. Nick, something swished at me. Calm yourself, Patsy. It's only a bat. Old oh. barns are usually full of them. Yes, there's another. I definitely don't like that. They get in your hair. Oh, nothing here. Nothing but a bit of old hay in this corner. Oh, there's nothing in it. Nothing. Here, wait a minute. Hold on. Huh? What is it, Nick? There's a hole under the hay. A hole leading down. Give me the flashlight, Patsy. Yes. Thanks. <gasps> Great Scott, look there. It's the entrance to another pirate hole with a ladder leading down into it. That looks like one of the deeper ones. Well, Nick, you don't expect us to crawl down there. No, Patsy. Whatever was hidden down there was removed in the heavily laden cart whose tracks we saw outside the barn. See? Here's the imprint of cake that had been rolled across the soft ground. And here one was stood on end. Yes. And look, here one of them sprung a leak. There's a small trail of blackish powder. Well, what do you make of that, Patsy? No sort of acid, Nick, like gunpowder. Right. Oh, good grief, Professor. Put out your pipe. Yeah, what for? Oh, it's dangerous to smoke a pipe in a place that's bulging with gunpowder. Well, it's not bulging with it, Patsy. There isn't enough left here to fill a firecracker. Someone's got wind of the fact that Professor Mackett called us in, and the whole lot's been removed. Yes, but where, Mr. Carter? For what purpose? I wish to heaven I knew. The amount of explosive that was carried away in that heavily laden cart can do a great deal of rather serious damage. Nick, what do you suppose they're planning to blow up? I don't know yet. But I hope to find out shortly. First, we send off two telegrams. Okay. One to the FBI asking for any information they may have regarding Dynamite Joe Porter and his gang. Dynamite Joe? Yes, I've heard of him. He's the notorious English criminal who specializes in blowing up banks. And also Rex Railroad Train. If he thinks they're carrying anything that might interest him... Where's the second telegram going? To Annapolis. But why Annapolis? Because Annapolis, which is a bare five miles up the river, is the site of a government powder magazine. I want to know if they've missed any of their stores lately. Yes, and I think I may even send another telegram to the Port Authority at Norfolk. Come on. We better hurry back to the telegraph office before it closes. There are a great many things to do, and too little time to do them. Well, Nick must suspect that big things are afoot from his reaction to what he found in the old barn... Will he be able to find what these things actually are and put a stop to them before any damage has been done? We'll see in just a moment. If you want new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance for all your floors and linoleum, it's high time you use the new Linex self-polishing wax. Until you do, you don't know how different, how perfect a quick-drying wax can be. For the formula of Linex self-polishing wax is completely new, the result of extensive research by leading chemists. It contains the greatest possible amount of genuine Carnauba wax to lend satiny appearance, lasting protection, real anti-skid finish to every floor surface in your home. Yes, the underwriter's laboratories have proved that linoleum, hardwood, and rubber tile actually are less slippery after the application of Linex self-polishing wax. You can feel the difference when you walk on a floor to which it's been applied. And Linex self-polishing wax takes only a jiffy to wipe on drying quickly to a handsome luster without tiresome rubbing. So choose genuine Linex self-polishing wax, the finest product of its kind. And when you want the modern finish that's brushed on for even longer-lasting protection, get Linex Clear Gloss, which dries overnight to a beautiful gloss finish that protects your floors and linoleum for months. Whether you choose Linex self-polishing wax or Linex Clear Gloss, ask for it by name, Linex, and get the finest. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that dries in one hour at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now, back to our story. As we rejoin Nick Carter and his assistant, secretary, and right-hand man, or should we say woman, we find them at breakfast the following morning. They're at a little hotel near the site of Hangman's Wood, 
And it's somewhat later than their customary hour for breakfast, as Nick well knows. I knew I should have ordered another poached egg. I'm hungry as a bear this morning. Must have been the night air, Patsy. Mm. Nick, I mm. wonder what caused that shadow of the hanging man we saw last night. This neat little device I have here. What in heaven's name is that? A little tube I found fastened in one of the lower branches of that dead tree. I took a stroll out to Hangman's Wood before you were up this morning. Oh, I'm certainly glad you didn't wake me. I hate early morning walks. Precisely why I didn't wake you. This gadget I found out there is an ingenious telescope-like lens with a small black silhouette inserted somewhere in the middle. When the light of the moon shone through at a certain angle, of course, the silhouette was projected and made a shadow on the barn door. Well, how could you know what to look for? It had to be something like this, Patsy. Anything hanging from the trees would have moved in last night's breeze. The moment I saw the shadow was stationary, I knew the answer. Oh, pass the muffins, will you please? Uh-huh. Good morning, Professor. Oh, good morning. Now, the innkeeper gave me these telegrams for you, Mr. Carter. They just arrived. Oh, thanks, thanks. Ah, yeah. Dynamite Joe Porter released from Sing Sing Prison beginning of last month. He leaves to have left the country. What makes you think that Dynamite Joe is in back of his neck? Oh, I just have a hunch that this is one of his jobs. Well, now, let's see what Annapolis has to offer. 24 kegs, latest super gunpowder, missing since Friday week. Have you located it? I wish to heaven I had. But what is there in this neighborhood that would interest Dynamite Joe? Well, it has to be something big to tempt that hyena. I know banks worth his trouble. He can't be planning to blow up a train. One keg of gunpowder would be more than sufficient for that job. Now, what in this neighborhood would take 24 kegs of it deadly stuff? Maybe he's going to blow up an apple. No, no. In that case, he'd have finished the job when he stole the kegs. Great Scott. Maybe he's going to blow up the Capitol. No, Washington is upstream. He would, wouldn't have hidden the dynamite five miles downstream. If that was what he had in mind. Oh, well, of course. Besides, neither of those blastings would interest Joe. He only dynamites for personal profit. Now, what could that be between here and Annapolis? Well, there's nothing between here and Annapolis, Mr. Carter, but the Smithfield Marshes. About the dreariest stretch in the whole Potomac Valley. As you know, the ocean's tides are still in evidence in this district, and from here to Fort Whitney, the flats or marshes behind the river wall are well below the level of the river at high tide. You know, the last time the river wall broke, the water level of the river dropped so fast that several boats were left stranded on the shoals. That's it. Of course, the river wall. Eh? Oh, what a fool I was not to have thought of it before. There must be some boat coming up the river with a cargo valuable enough to attract Joe's attention. But, Nick, how... Professor, get your hat. Yes. Patsy, tell the innkeeper to provide us with a small boat suitable for rowing. We'll need two pairs of oars, one for you and one for the professor. What are you going to be doing while we row? I'll be doing the investigating. Now, come on. Oh, if only we had a reply to the wire I sent to Norfolk, we might have the answer. But in any case, there's no time to lose. We must keep Joe from blowing up that river wall. Faster, you two. Faster. I'm pulling as fast as I can. If you wouldn't insist on hugging this river wall, there's a nice breeze out in the middle of the stream. No signs of the dynamite yet. We've got to find it. Sent for the river patrol to help us, but it'll probably take hours before their speedboat can get here. Oh, oh Nick, I just remembered something. What? Another telegram. Came for you while you were seeing about the boat. Must be from Norfolk. Oh, let me have it, please. Oh, I'm sorry, Nick, but you rushed us off in such a flurry. It went right out of my mind. Here you are. Thanks. The Nancy Conliffe carrying cargo of captured German gold found in salt mines due to reach due to the point at 10.30 this a.m. What? So that's what Dynamite Joe is after. Quickly, both of you. Back to your oars. Right. <clears throat> Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here's something. Something in a cylindrical tin container tucked into the side of the wall just above the waterline. And here's a wire connecting it to another. And another. Yeah. Professor, this whole section of the wall is mined. You want to set it off by an electrical charge running along this wire. Well, what time is it now? 10.21. If that boat is due at 10.30, the explosion is due any minute. Then let's get out of here. No, Patsy, we've got to go on. Now, slowly, slowly. There's something I've got to do. Got to find out where this wire leads. 
where he's hidden the machinery with which to set off this explosive. It seems to lead to that little shack half overhanging the water, doesn't it? The, the one over here at the end of the river wall. Yes. Yes, this is the place. All right, stop it. Okay. Ties past so we won't drift away. No granny knots, please. You can depend on me, Nick. I used to be a Girl Scout. Now, let's see. Now, there's a little trap door in the floor of the shack where it hangs over the river. I hope it's not locked. Ah, open. I'm going to take a look inside. If I stand up, I should just about be able to see. Yes. Yes, this is the place. Oh, Nick, you're rocking the boat. I'm going to pull myself up. You two can follow suit. Steady. You next, Professor. Uh, You'll just give me a hand, Mr. Carter. I, 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 I'm not as agile as you are. Uh, oh, thanks. All right, come on, Patrick. I think we can pull you through between us. I can make it myself, thanks. Maybe, but I'll give you a hand anyway. Now, up you come. Uh, there. Oh, well, you didn't have to be so rough about it. I'd have made it. Right, oh. Now you know, all here. Get your hands up in the air. Nick, look. Yes. This, unless I'm mistaken, would be Dynamite Joe Porter. Stick him up, as you say, on your side of the ocean. Seems to be determined. All right, Joe. They're up. That's straight, yeah? Well, get you blokes. I've been waiting for you all morning. I hoped you wasn't going to be late for the big event. I wanted to show this Mr. Nick Carter how it's done on our side of the big pond. Well, now, that's right neighborly, Joe. But aren't you going to search us first to see if we're armed? Not me. In the first place, I ain't giving nobody a chance to do me dirt whilst I'm busy with another chap. Besides, weapons will do you no good. But don't take your hands down. I've got one false move and you're a goner. What are you going to do with us, Mr. Dynamite Joe? I've got that all planned out, sister. There's a little steamer coming up the river in a few minutes. The Nancy Cunliffe. Not much to look at, but she's got a cargo of gold bars in her hold that'll make me as rich as Mr. Rockefeller. Delightful. You and me and Mr. Carter here are going to wait right here until this here Nancy Cunliffe runs round the bend. You keep your hands in plain sight all the time and we don't have no trouble, see? When the boat shows up, I blows up the river wall, the water rushes out across the lowlands... And the boat finds she ain't got water enough to sail in and runs aground. Then my lads have a launch, all ready and waiting. They knows what to do. They takes over while I finishes off you nosy snoopers so you won't never bother no one again. You understand what I'm getting at? I'm afraid I do, but I don't quite like it. Well, maybe something will happen to prevent him from carrying out his unpleasant little scheme. Don't get discouraged yet, Patrick. Spoken like a man, Carter. You don't disappoint me, you don't. I've heard you was a gayman. Thank you. How much longer do we have to wait for the Nancy Connor to appear? Only a few minutes more, matey. Just make yourself comfortable while you're waiting. I'd finish you off now, but the boat might even inside in the middle of the execution. And I can't let nothing interfere with that part of the plan. First the boat, then you blokes. That's the way I planned it, and that's the way it goes. Yes, I heard it. I heard it too, mates. And the time's come. When she gets a little further upstream, I'm going to press this here lever in this box. And when I do, it'll be the biggest racket you ever heard. All right, now. Here she goes. And I can't tell you how happy I am to have you here as audience. Now then. One, two, three. What the? Something gone wrong, Joe? What could go wrong? I'll fix this up myself. It's got to be right. All right, Joe, get your hands in the air. Fast. Uh, you, get him up my song, play us. That's better. I'll keep him that way. Oh, good for you, Nick. Oh, that was excellent, Mr. Carter. I feel much relieved. Oh, so do I. Our right, professor, get that rope over in the corner and tie up this big shot from overseas. I think the authorities would like to take care of him for the rest of his life. <laughs> In just a moment, Nick will return to tell us about the clues which enabled him to solve the mystery of the hangman's wood. A lovely home adds to the joy of living, and the three great Linux home brighteners add to the ease of keeping your home lovely. Linux cream polish, for example, renews the original gleaming beauty of your fine furniture, the handsome appearance of the wood grain itself, in one quick, easy application. For Linux cream polish actually cleans as it polishes to save you one whole step in your cleaning day routine. 
Yes, that cloudy look left by dust and previous polish is erased in one quick process that also removes blurry fingerprints and helps conceal scratches. And what's more, Linux cream polish leaves no surface oil for dust to cling to. So do as many wise modern homemakers do. Take the streamlined way to furniture care. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes. Ask for all three great Linux home brighteners, Linux cream polish, Linux self-polishing wax, and Linux clear gloss at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the modern wall finish that beautifully decorates the average room for only $2.98. Tomorrow marks the beginning of the mighty 7th War Loan Drive. And the most important thing you can do to support our fighting forces is to invest in war bonds. An investment in final victory, an investment in peace, an investment in America's future, and yours. 85 million Americans hold war bonds. And 85 million Americans can't be wrong. Get your extra bond now. Now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, that was a pretty close call you and Patsy had. Well, not as close as you might think, Ken. No? Why, if something hadn't gone wrong with Joe's apparatus, the gunpowder would have gone off, and you wouldn't have had as good a chance to capture him the way you did. But I knew the gunpowder wouldn't go off. But oh. how could you possibly know that, Nick? Well, it was this way. As we rode along the sea wall, I punched a hole in each can of powder with my knife. And as the tide came in, the water flooded the cans and soaked the powder so it wouldn't explode. Oh, Nick, you're wonderful. I'll say, but suppose the tide had been going out instead of coming in. Wouldn't have made any difference, Ken. Because just to be sure, after I punched holes in the cans, I also cut the wire. You always think of everything, Nick. Oh, thanks for the vote of confidence, <laughs> but, Betsy. Nick, tell me, when did you first suspect that it was the work of an English gangster? When we heard the voice of that screech owl which was the way that Joe's gang warned each other. You see, our screech owls are quite a different species from those in Great Britain. Oh? When I heard that peculiar, eerie call, I realized it was an imitation of the British screech owl, which is a bird definitely not found in the woods of Virginia. Well, well, live and learn, I always say. And now, how about a hint or so about next week's story? I don't see why not, Ken. It's a story about one of New England's most famous possessions. The rocking chair. The rocking chair has a good homing sound, hasn't it? But this rocking chair only rocked at certain times, certain very definite times, just before some member of the family was to die. Has a nice homey sound, doesn't it? Well, there was nothing homey about the deaths. They happened in all sorts of ways. Until Nick took over the case. Then both the rocking and the death stopped, suddenly and for good. And what do you call this exciting story, Nick? I call it The Haunted Rocking Chair. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White. The programs are written by Edith Miser, and any resemblance therein to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America, and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints.
This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's strange case, The Haunted Rocking Chair. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated the old chair which was supposed to rock whenever anyone in the Trumbull family was due to die, and how he solved the mysterious death of a famous artist. You know, it pays to keep up with the world. And homemakers throughout America are learning how well it pays to keep up with modern homemaking methods. For they now have their homes sparkling with new beauty. And they save hours of time each week with those three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Linux clear gloss, which is brushed on, gives lustrous, longer-lasting protection to every wood and linoleum surface. Linex Cream Polish, which cleans as it polishes, renews the sleek, gleaming beauty of fine furniture. And Linex Self-Polishing Wax, the amazing new wax finish, lends rich, satiny loveliness to any floor, wood, linoleum, or tile. Take the modern homemaker's shortcut to furniture, floor, and woodwork care. Help your home look its best and give yourself the greatest leisure with the three great Linex Home Brighteners. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. Once again, we keep our weekly appointment, which takes us to the sedate old Victorian mansion on the corner of 5th and 4th. It is late afternoon. The long shadows fall across the quiet streets. A solitary flower peddler ambles slowly down the block. His horse follows sedately, pulling a dilapidated truck full of potted geraniums and petunias. The peddler is exercising a fine Italian tenor voice. Everybody wants the flowers. Nice the flowers. I got a petunia. I got a geranium. I got a little I got to say, ever the nicer young lady is home. Got the petunias, got the begonias. Tell me, wait a minute. <laughs> it's okay, Garibaldi. She's a coming gay. <laughs> <laughs> a good afternoon, Miss Patsy. Hello, Tony. How's Garibaldi? Oh, it's fine. Good. <laughs> Tony, have you got any climbing roses? We lost ours, you know. Winter killed. No. Uh huh. That's uh, too bad. It's a shame too. Uh, you want to pull the scarlet or that new dawn or a blazer, maybe? Well, I know got them today, but uh, I'm going to get them for you. Good. We'll take one of each. Uh, Miss uh, Patsy, um, are you boss? Uh, he's home, maybe? You mean Mr. Carter? Yes. Yes, he's upstairs in the laboratory. Uh, are you asking him, please, can he see Tony? Well, it's after office hours, Tony. Well, i got to see him, Miss Patsy. Please, i got to see him. Well, what's it about? Uh, my sister, Maria. She's, she's afraid of it. She's got afraid to death. What's she afraid of, Tony? A rocking chair. What? A rocking chair that was belonged to an old lady. And this old lady is dead a long time ago. But summertime she's come back. She sits in the rocking chair and a rock and a rock and a rock. And every time she's a rock, somebody gets dead. Hmm, that sounds promising. Suppose you tell me all about it, Tony. Then I'll see if I can't persuade Mr. Carter to pay your sister a visit and investigate that rocking chair. Oh, but Nick, you could do with some fresh air. We could rent a speedboat and take a run up the sound. The island where Tony's sister lives isn't very far beyond Hellgate. How does Tony's sister happen to be living on an island the other side of Hellgate? It's the old Trumbull Estate, Shipwreck Island. 
Tony's sister Maria is the housekeeper for Eric Trumbull, the famous painter who lives there now. Hmm, I see. The old house has been in the Trumbull family for three generations. It was built by Obadiah Trumbull, an old sea captain who was suspected of being a freebooter at the time of the Civil War. The old boy had four wives. In succession, I hope. Oh, but of course. Now, where does the rocking chair come in? Oh, that belonged to the last of old Obadiah's wives. He brought her home as sort of an afterthought when all the children of his other wives had grown up. They hated her. She was little with skin the color of dark ivory, and her face was sort of like a monkey's. Some say she was a Creole, and others claim she was Portuguese. At any rate, she talked with an accent and claimed to have the powers of a voodoo witch doctor. Probably hated her because they were afraid of her. Mm, Probably. No sooner was Obadiah safely in his grave than the children turned on her. Eric's father, who was the eldest, had her declared insane. Nice people. She was locked up in an attic room and fed three times a day, but no one ever spoke to her, and she never came out of that room. No one would have known she was there if it hadn't been for that rocking chair. I could hear it creaking all hours of the day and night. After nearly 30 years, she was suddenly taken very ill. When she found she was going to die, she asked them to send for Eric's father. It was a nasty night with the wind howling about the evening. Entre. Come in, stupid. So you have come, eh? The doctor has told you I am about to die. And you think at last you will be rid of me? Listen, you fool. You will never be rid of me. I will return sometimes and sit in that rocking chair where I have spent so many lonely years. You will not see me, but I will be there. Sometimes the chair will rock, and that will mean there is to be a death in this family. There is about to be a death now, I think. Yes. See? The chair. Already it starts to sway. This time it predicts my death. But it will rock for you. All of you. And as the chair rocked faster and faster, she died. Eric's father saw it. Probably a form of self-induced hypnosis brought about by the old girl's suggestion. Hmm, Possibly. The rocking chair heard from again? Yes. Every now and then. But the funny part is that almost every time, according to Tony's sister, someone in the family died within the year. A family that size, just by the law of averages, someone is apt to die within the year, whether the rocking chair rocked or not. Well, I hadn't thought of it that way, Nick. Anybody living in the old house now, except Eric and Tony's sister? No. They came back a little over a year ago. Eric was too broke to live anywhere else. Has Tony's sister ever heard the famous rocking chair? Uh, Not until lately. Seems that everything was going along as well as could be expected until Captain Ralph Trumbull, Eric Trumbull's cousin, and his wife moved in. I gather the captain's wife is very attractive. And the captain isn't always home, and Eric is a notorious ladies' man. That's about the size of it. Mm. And to top off the whole thing, the rocking chair seems to have started to rock again. Well, what do you expect me to do? I just want you to find out what makes that rocking chair rock so Tony's sister can stop being frightened. All right, I'll look into it. If you can get them to rent us that new speedboat. But remember, I don't want any hard-boiled eggs in my lunch. Before night. Oh, Nick, there isn't a cloud in the sky. Tony said he got word to his sister we were coming. She'll be waiting for us on the dock. That must be the island up ahead, Nick. Slow down or we'll pass it. Well, you look at that house. It's got everything. Cupola, widow's walk. I'll bet there's even an iron deer on the front lawn. And I could certainly use a coat of paint. Look there on the end of the dock. That must be Tony's sister. She's not exactly what you'd call a silk, is she? Oh, hand me that line, will you? Hello? Are you Tony's sister? Si. I'm called Maria. You are Mr. Nick Scott and the missus, no? No, I'm Patsy Bowen, Mr. Carter's secretary. Oh, good. 
Give me your hand. I'll help you. Oh, thank you. Oh, be careful, please. So many of these boards are so old. Okay. We'll be careful. Well, Maria, how about it? You think I can get a look at this notorious rocking chair that's causing all the trouble? Oh, see, that's easy. The captain is away on a cruise. He won't be back until next week. Mr. Eric and the captain's wife are in the studio. He's painting her picture. Painting a picture, is he? What's wrong with that? Oh, he's always painting her when the captain is away. The studio's in the front on the second floor. The room with the rock and the chair is on the third floor over the kitchen. We'll take the back stairs. No one will see us. This is the room, Mr. Carter. Hmm. Door's locked. See, si. it has not been entered since Mr. Eric's father was found hanging to the rafters and they, they threw the key into the well. Is there any way we can crawl in through a window? No. The only window is two floors above the roof of the kitchen. There's a tree outside, but the branches are too small to hold anybody. Then I'll have to pick the lock. That shouldn't be much of a job with my pick lock. Ah, I see. This old house is so quiet, you... I can almost feel it breathe. Wish it wasn't so dark up here. Nick. Nick, do you hear that? Santa Madonna. This is the chair again. It rocks. Someone want to die. Someone want to die. Quiet, Maria. Quiet. Just a minute now. The lock isn't as simple as it looks. There. That did the trick. Now. Oh, no one is there. The room is empty. Look. Over there, right beside the window. The rock is still rocking. And there's dust all over everything. There should be prints of some sort. But there aren't, Nick. Not a mark on the floor anywhere. The spirits are leaving no footprints. Now, the window. The little pane at the lower left-hand corner is missing. But the window is locked tight. Nobody could crawl through an opening so little as that. Nick, the cushion. The cushion on this chair is still warm. Where? Where? Where are you today? Oh, Santa Maria. This is the captain. He's come home. He's looking for his wife. Uh-oh. You better run down, Maria. See if you can stall him. Sir! And find your woman. You better answer me, huh? Sir! Well, a locked room and a rocking chair that rocks all by itself, with nobody around to set it rocking, and an angry captain trying to find his missing wife. How can Nick put all these things together and get the right answer? We'll see in just a moment. The things you learn firsthand are the things you really know best. That's why women who have used the new Linex self-polishing wax are so enthusiastic about it. For they've found how different, how perfect a quick-drying wax can be. They've learned what sparkling new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance it gives their floors and linoleum. Developed by leading research chemists to give you the best, the formula of Linex self-polishing wax is completely new. It has the highest possible content of genuine carnauba wax, lending handsome appearance, lasting protection, real anti-skid finish to every household floor surface. The underwriter's laboratories have actually proved that linoleum, hardwood, and rubber tile are less slippery after application of Linex self-polishing wax. The minute you walk where it's been applied, you can tell the difference. What's more, Linex self-polishing wax dries quickly to a satiny luster without tiresome rubbing. And it takes only a jiffy to wipe on. So follow the example of wise American homemakers. Use genuine Linex self-polishing wax. And remember, when you want a modern finish of the brush-on type to give even longer-lasting protection, get Linex Clear Gloss, which dries overnight to a beautiful gloss finish that lasts amazingly. Whichever you prefer, Linex Self-Polishing Wax or Linex Clear Gloss, you get the finest product of its kind when you ask for it by name, Linex. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that dries in one hour, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to our story. Investigating an old house in which an ancient rocking chair started rocking without any cause or reason, Nick runs into a complicated set of circumstances. Eric Trumbull is painting a portrait of the captain's beautiful young wife, much against the captain's wishes. 
And Maria, Eric's Italian housekeeper, is scared of both the rocking chair and the quick-tempered captain. As we pick up our story, the captain is storming through the house looking for his wife. Maria! Maria! Oh, there you are. Where in thunder is my wife? Is she not in her room, Captain Trumbo? You know blame well she's not. Oh, I remember now. She's gone to the mainland to do the marketing. No, no, she hasn't. Her hat's right here on the table. And the rowboat's tied up to the dock. Well, maybe she got a lift. Who in blazes are you two? Just friends of Maria's brother. The Trumbles don't like visitors. Captain Trumbull, don't you think you're a bit hasty? Suppose your wife is posing for Eric Trumbull. Lots of perfectly nice women model these days. Not my wife. At the door of his studio. Eric! Eric, open up! I know my wife's in there. Open this door, I'll break it down. All right, all right. Really, Ralph, you have to be so boisterous. You're not yelling into a gale, you know. Where are you, Claire? Here I am, dear. Oh, really, Ralph, this is too naughty of you. I was having my portrait painted for your birthday as a surprise. There it is. Eric, I told you to keep away from my wife. But when I come back unexpectedly, I find you both in the studio with the door locked. Oh, don't be so Victorian, darling. Eric hates to be interrupted when he's painting. Yes, now, do go away, old boy, so we can get on with the portrait. The blaze is with the portrait. You'll never do any more painting on this canvas. Nick, you're tearing the picture to shreds. Rugged old sea dog, isn't it? Ralph, I hope you realize you've destroyed a priceless work of art. Don't worry, I'll pay you for it. Although I have my doubts about how priceless it is. Claire, get your things together. We're leaving this house. No. This minute. Miss Bowen and I'll be delighted to take you to the mainland with us. Good. You go ahead. I'll join you on the dock as soon as I've made out a check for my cousin's priceless work of art. Going back to Shipwreck Island? We just left it a short while ago. I know it, Patsy, but I got to thinking. Eric Trumbull may not be the nicest guy in the world, but I'd hate to see anything happen to him. I think it'd only be fair to warn him. Warn him about what? About the captain's crazy jealousy. From the things he said as we were taking him and his wife back to the mainland, I suddenly realized how intensely he hates Eric. I don't think Eric realizes it. Good grief, look. Tied up to the tumble dock. It's a police launch. Yes. We're too late, Patsy. What a fool I was not to come back right away. Oh, Nick, look. There's Lieutenant Riley standing on the breakwater. Something serious must have happened if he's been called in. Oh, hi there, Nick. <laughs> I thought you'd be back when you heard the news. But you're too late, my boy. The whole thing's solved. What's solved, Lieutenant? Eric Crumble's death. What? I was afraid of that. What happened? Hanged himself, he did. Hmm? We're just waiting for the photographers to finish before we cut him down. No, Riley, don't touch him. Hmm? Don't touch a thing till I have a chance to see him. But this isn't suicide. It's murder. And would you mind telling me why you're so sure it ain't suicide? Because Eric Trumbull was psychologically incapable of killing himself. Do you think the captain came back and did it, Nick? No. The captain wouldn't have hanged him. Now, if he'd been beaten to death... You couldn't... What's that? Uh, it's the housekeeper. The room's just down the hall a bit here. Oh, Maria. Taking it awful hard, she is. Okay, Nick. After you. Yes. The feet clear the ground by bare six inches. Six inches is enough. Medical examiner took a look at him and says it's death by strangulation, me boy. No mistake. I'm not doubting that. You say nothing's been touched, Riley? Not a thing, Nick. Then it's definitely murder. Oh, no, you don't, Nick. Just take a look at this here suicide note pinned there on his chest. I can't live without her, and I won't. Signed, Harry Trumbull. That, me boy, is in his own handwriting. Checks with the writing we found in his diary. Possible. But this is only part of a piece of paper. The upper part's missing. So what? It's a suicide note. That's enough for me. Riley, if a man's going to commit suicide, he has to stand on something. Hmm? Box, chair, even a few books, and then kick them away from him. But there's nothing here. Nothing within 15 feet of the spot where the body's hanging. You're right. Consequently, Trumbull was strung up by someone else. 
Someone who threw the rope over that beam, hauled the body up, and then tied the rope to that bracket. Oh, now, now, wait a minute. What would Mr. Trumbull be doing all that while? There's no signs of a struggle here. Probably because the murderer was careful to sneak up behind him and knock him unconscious first. Huh? Your medical examiner will take a good look, Riley. I think you'll discover a lump at the base of the brain somewhere. Hey, I'd better go and talk to him. Who, who would ever think of looking for a lump on the head of a guy who's hiding himself? Nick? Hmm? Nick, will you come out in the hall a minute? Yes, right away, Patsy. As soon as I unpin the so-called suicide note. All right. What's up? It's Maria here. She wants to talk to you. Mr. Carter, please... I hear what you say, that it is not a suicide. Is that true? I'm afraid so, Maria. Oh, I know it. I know it. It was the captain. They had a terrible battle fight after you left to go to the boat this morning. Maria, what makes you so sure that Captain Trumbull killed his cousin? Is that the note you have in your hands? It's part of a letter Mr. Eric sent it three days ago to New Bedford where the captain's ship had gone. Mr. Eric was in love with the captain's wife. He was painting a picture of her. Yes, we know that. He did it then. I know it. Well, you waited on the dock. We were there less than five minutes. Oh, the captain is so strong. For him, five minutes is plenty. What makes you so sure it wasn't somebody else? Somebody who came to the island after we left. Because nobody came. When you are gone, I lock all of the doors in the windows. I go to the kitchen to fix Mr. Eric his lunch. When I take it up to him, I find him. Like that. And you're sure no one else was here? You didn't open the door to anyone? I sway on the Bible. Hmm. Tell me, Maria. Why did you kill Eric? You think I did it? No, you are wrong. It wasn't the captain that let the proof of that letter was written to him. The captain didn't do it, Maria. For two reasons. One, the letter, though undoubtedly written by Eric, was never sent. But, Nick, how could you possibly know that? Because this torn suicide note covers more than half a sheet of note paper. Any letter that's gone through the mail has been folded at least once. This one was never folded. Consequently, never sent. But the second, and the most important reason, as we left the island this morning with the captain and his wife, I happened to take a look at the house. Eric Trumbull, alive and healthy, was glaring at us from his studio window. Oh, no! No! Consequently, Maria, since no one entered the house after we left, and since you were alone with Eric Trumbull, the only person who can possibly be responsible for his death is you, Maria. Your last name is Trumbull, isn't it? Yes. Maria Trumbull. I was Eric's wife. That's why I killed him. Yes. I had an idea that was the reason. He married me 20 years ago in Sorrento when I nursed him back from the dead. During all this time, no one has ever known. I sold my house and my little farm. It was that money paid for his first exhibition. Oh, I do not begrudge him that. He was a genius, senor. They are not like other men. After a little while, I did not even mind his love affairs, so long as it was only his model. You see, I, I knew they would not last. Oh, Maria. But this time it was different. The captain's wife, she was a woman of his own class. He wanted her to divorce the captain and marry him. Don't know what would have become of me. And so, this afternoon, when I found the letter he was writing to the captain, I knew it was over between us. I knew he was through with me. After all the hardships, all of the insults, something inside of me turned strange and cold. And I killed him. I am not sorry. Maria. You think that is strange? No. I I got tuberculosis. In the six months, I'll be dead. Well, Nick, you're right again. He found a lump as big as an egg behind his left ear. You got you got any idea who could have done it? Maria knows, Riley. Huh? She was Eric's wife. What? I have no doubt she'll be glad to tell you whatever you wish to know. In just a moment, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and tell you what caused the rocking of the haunted rocking chair. You and your family take pride in your home, of course. That's why you keep it bright and sparkling. And the finest household help you can find are the three great Linux home brighteners. Take Linux cream polish, for instance. What a help it is in keeping your fine furniture lovely. Because it cleans as it polishes, Linux cream polish erases finger marks, removes deposits of dust and old polish, helps conceal scratches, all in one quick, easy application. 
And it leaves a lovely, gleaming luster that brings pride to the heart of any homemaker. What's more, Linex cream polish leaves no surface oil to attract more dust, to make more work. So save half the time, half the fuss of furniture upkeep. Care for your furniture the modern way with Linex cream polish, the up-to-date shortcut to furniture protection. Get it at your dealers now. Linex cream polish, which saves one whole step in your cleaning day routine. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners, Linex self-polishing wax, Linex cream polish, and Linex clear gloss at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the modern wall finish that beautifully decorates the average room for only two ninety eight. dollars Make it a point, too, to stop at your nearest war bond headquarters for that extra war bond. It takes money as well as men to finish this war. The men are doing the big job overseas. Let's do our job over here to raise the money now during the mighty 7th War Loan Drive. Invest all you can in your future and America's. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, what happened to Maria? Did Riley arrest her? Yes, Ken, he did, but she died before she could be brought to trial. And what about the rocking chair? After considerable observation, we found out it was just a trumbled cat. She used to climb up the trees, jump through the broken pane, and into the chair, which stood right beside the window. She'd sit there in the old chair and wash herself, and her movement would make the old chair rock. But how come the cat just started recently to sit in the old chair like that? Well, we learned it was only recently that the cat came to live at the house. Disgustingly simple when you know the answer. <laughs> That's what I always say. And Nick always laughs at me when I say it. But it's true. Well, what's about your story for next week, Nick? Uh, got a couple of not-too-well-veiled hints on that one? Well, I don't see why not, Ken. Fancy and I were taking a shortcut through the park one day in my car. Which is more like a police squad car than a pleasure car. When we heard a police call over the radio, directing the nearest squad car to a certain address to take care of a dead body. And were we interested to find that the address where the body had been found was our own office at 4th and 5th. Well, that sounds like an interesting start to a story. And when the band of thieves kidnapped me and tried no, to... No, hold it, Patsy. Save something for next week. <laughs> Well, Nick, what do you call the story? The Body on the Doorstep. Carter, Master Detective, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White. The programs are written by Edith Miser, and any resemblance therein to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linex home brightness. Linex clear gloss, Linex cream polish, and Linex self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paint. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linex dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paint.
This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's curious case, The Museum Tragedy. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter discovered the solution to the mystery of the shattered watch and learned the secret of how and when the old watchman was killed. You know, the world moves fast nowadays. New progress is being made constantly and it's only wise to take advantage of every improvement. That's why wise homemakers throughout America are welcoming the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux self-polishing wax, Linux cream polish, and Linux clear gloss, those new improved shortcuts to modern home care. Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new wax product, beautifies floors with a satiny yet tough anti-skid finish. Linux cream polish for fine furniture cleans as it polishes, leaving no surface oil to attract dust. And Linux Clear Gloss, which is brushed on, dries to an elastic, transparent surface that protects all wood and linoleum in your home. So do as thousands of modern homemakers do. Save hours of work each week. Enjoy sparkling new beauty in your home. Get all three great Linux home brighteners now. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's strange case from the life of Nick Carter. As we pick up Nick and Patsy for today's story, we find them in Nick's car on their way home. This is a fine time to be getting home, Nick. Three o'clock in the morning. Well, I'm sorry, Patsy. If I could have got away any sooner, I would have. You know how police chiefs are when they get talking. The Chief Bronson was no exception. I'll say. I thought he was going over every case he'd ever been up against. You know what I think, Nick? No, but I'm happy to know that you do. This is no hour for bum jokes, Nick. Mm, all right, Patsy, what do you think? I think that Bronson was just trying to get a free course on how to catch criminals according to the most up-to-date methods. He practically pumped you dry. Don't I know it. There are times when you can't... Nick, watch out! Yes, I see him. I hope you have your police badge with you. Looks as though we were pinched for speeding. Don't worry until you have to. Hey, you! Yes, what's up, officer? Any trouble? Trouble? I'll say so. Could you stop at the next telephone down the street and call police headquarters? Tell them to send some men up right away. What's the matter? The night watchman in the museum has been murdered. Not Sam Hildred. Yeah. You you know him? I should say I do. I've known him for years. How did it happen? Must have been shot by a burglar. I tried to call headquarters from the museum, but the cook cut the wires, and I can't use the phone. Will you put in a call for me? Certainly. Patsy, mm -hmm. take the car and find a phone. Tell whoever's in charge to send some men up here at once. Are you going to stay here, Nick? Yes, maybe I can do something before they get here. Okay. Where shall we get on the trail, the better. She calls you Nick. You you ain't Nick Carter, are you? Yes, I am. Glory be, that's a break for sure. Uh, come inside, Mr. Carter, and see if you can help me find any good clues. I didn't take time to look. I'll be right with you. All right, Patsy, get going. Right, Nick. I'll be back as soon as I phone. We'll have to go around the back door. Everything else is locked up. Okay. Uh, what's your name, officer? Uh, Bert, Mr. Carter. Well, how'd you happen to find him, Bert? Well, you see, this is my beat. I'm on the park detail. When I get through at 2 o'clock, I generally stop in and have a cup of tea with Sam Hildred. And that's what I did tonight. Sam wasn't in his office, so I waited for him, thinking he was making his rounds, maybe. But when he didn't show up after about a half hour, I went to look for him. And after I'd looked about 15 minutes, I found him with three bullet holes in him. Three bullet holes? Yes. Somebody had it in for him, all right. Anything else? I looked around but couldn't find a soul. The place was deserted. Then I went back to his office to use the phone. But as I said, the wires had been cut. I didn't want to leave here until somebody came, so I stopped the first car that went by. And it happened to be you. Well, let's go in and see what we can find. The killer must have left some clues somewhere. They all do. <laughs> No, 
Not a pretty sight, is he? No. Three bullet holes are never pretty to look at. Now, this is rather odd. Well, what's that? You notice how two of the bullets got him right near the heart? Both apparently fired from a distance. Either one would have killed him. Third shot got him in the abdomen. And that one was fired from up close. Yeah. You can see where it burned his vest. That is a funny one. He must have wanted to be sure he was dead. Yeah, looks as if there's a watch in this pocket where the bullet went through. Yes. The bullet smashed right through it. Stopped it at 2.27. That tells us the time of the murder, all right. That's one clue we got anyway. Apparently. Well, if this was done by burglars, something must have been stolen. Let's see if there's anything missing. I saw a broken display case when I was looking for Sam, Mr. Carter. Right over here. Oh, yes. Card says... These exhibit from the Van de Vries collection. Van de Vries? Why, he's the most famous collector of Egyptian relics in the world. These things must be very valuable. Can you see what's missing, Mr. Carter? No. Something missing here in the center of the collection, but I didn't know what was there. We'll have to get the museum's curator to tell us that. Anything else gone? I didn't see anything, but uh, I wouldn't know either. Well, let's have a look around. See if we can find anything out of... Now, oh. here's the car. Not much good to us, I'm afraid. The number's been filed off. As far as I can see, there are no prints on it either. Well, maybe some show up in the laboratory, but I doubt it from the looks. Yeah, this is the gun, all right. Three shots fired recently. Uh, somebody's coming, Mr. Carter. This is very bad for our reputation, Lieutenant Riley. Not all it's bad for. Oh, is that you, Nick? Right first time, Riley. So they dragged you out of bed, did they? I uh, say they did. I wish murderers would be more considerate into who they're killing in the daytime. Uh, uh, Nick, this is Mr. Steiner, the curator of the museum. I How brought him along yeah. to see what's missing. Oh, Mr. Carter, this is terrible. Such a thing hasn't happened here in 20 years. Do you know what's been taken? No, I left that for you. Oh, your watchman is over here if you want to see him. Uh, merciful heavens! The Van der Vries case is broken open. The most valuable collection in our home... Lieutenant Riley, huh? the Ankatara scarab is gone. The what is gone? The Ankatara scarab. It's almost priceless. One of Mr. Van der Vries' most valuable pieces. One of the few remaining jewels in the Fifth Dynasty of Egypt. Worn by Princess Amun Ra herself. Oh, yes. Oh. Very important collector's item, wasn't it? Oh, yes, yes. Only a collector would be interested. But it was priceless. No, oh, how can we ever explain to Mr. Van der Vries? Uh, cold-blooded old fish. More interested in how he's going to explain the theft of Van der Vries than he is in his dead watchman. Well, Riley, to these old fossils, life and death mean very little. They live mm. almost entirely in the past. Oh, there you are, Lieutenant. Oh, hello, Williams. Well, what do you got here? Look, you and McLuhan go over everything. Get fingerprints if you can, and get plenty of pictures of the car. Yeah, 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 we know. Usual stuff. You don't have to tell us. Well, get busy, then. Uh, uh, did Doc Bradley come with you? Yes, yes, Riley, I'm here. Ah. Show me the body and let me get back to yes, bed. right over there, Doc. See what you can tell us. I always do, don't I? Give me time, that's all. Take all the time you need, but hurry it up. Okay, okay. Hmm. Death is instantaneous. Mm -hmm. Any of the three bullets would have been fatal. Mm -hmm. Dead between two and three hours. Can't say definitely. Mm okay. Have to probe for the two bullets in his chest. But the others right near the surface. What? Hmm. Funny. Fired close to the body, but it didn't go very deep. His watch stopped it, Doc. I have the watch here. Took it out of his pocket to examine it. No fingerprints on it, though. Yeah, what do you make of it, Nick? Not much, yet. Any ideas? Always have ideas, Riley. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. Well, let's hear them. Oh, no. Not until I know whether they are right or wrong. Are you going to spend the night here, Nick? Oh, hello, Patsy. As a matter of fact, I've got all I can here, I think. Let's go, then. It's not getting any earlier. I know. Well, good night, Riley. I'll get in touch with you in the morning. In the morning? What do you think it is now? Correction accepted, Patsy. All right, Riley, I'll see you after breakfast. Okay, Nick, but don't wait too long to eat that breakfast. Good morning, Nick. Oh, morning, Patsy. Didn't expect you for hours yet. Well, I was going to sleep late, but I was too curious to find out about the murder. The true professional instinct. What are you doing, Nick? Going through our files, 
trying to pick out all the crooks who'd be interested in stealing the missing scarab? Well, would that be a special kind of crook? Definitely, because there's only a very limited call for such things, and the thief would have to know where he's going to dispose of it before he stole it. Oh, I see. And only very few crooks would know where to get rid of a scarab after they got hold of it. Only a collector would be interested in buying it. Have you found many names? Only three so far. Who are they? Now, just a minute. I'll look through this last batch. Yes. Just a few more cards. No. Guess these three represent the most likely-looking suspects. What are their names? Danny Mearson, Jim Powell, and Jack Grogner. I don't seem to recognize any of those names, Nick. No, we've had no active connection with any of them. Oh. Oh, Patsy, look in the other file, will you? See if you can find out where each of these three was last heard of. Okay, Nick. What was that first name? Danny Mearson. Yes. Mearson. Mearson. Here it is. Well, he stole a rare old vase out of Senator Johnson's home two years ago and is now in state prison. Hmm. How about Jim Powell? Jim Powell. Oh, yes. He's doing time in Nevada for forgery and counterfeiting. His sentence has several years to run yet. And Jack Grogner? Grogner. He's wanted on a burglary charge by the Montana police. Disappeared six months ago and believed to be dead. Well, Grogner wasn't the killer type anyway, so I guess we can count him out. You can count the other two out, too, being as they're both in jail. Well, that remains to be seen. Call Riley. Ask him if he knows anything about either Powell or Mearson. Okay. Haven't you any other clues, Nick? This seems to be guesswork. Eliminating suspects is never guesswork, Patsy. Part of the routine work that solves many a case. My more spectacular means fail completely. Police headquarters, Lieutenant Riley speaking. Lieutenant, this is Patsy. Oh, hello, Patsy. Hey, what's Nick doing? Still sleeping? Indeed he's not. He's working on last night's murder. Well, has he got anywhere? We don't know yet. That's what I called you about. Hmm? Do you know where either Danny Mearson or Jim Powell would be now? Our records show that they're both in prison. Well, uh, let me see here. Uh, Powell was in jail last I knew. We've had no word from the contrary. Oh, but Danny Mearson was let out on parole two days ago. Just a minute. Nick, he hmm. says Mearson was let out on parole two days ago. Hmm, that's so. Very interesting. Hey, Patsy, does Nick think baby Danny did it? Could be, Lieutenant, could be. But if I know Nick, he's not ready to say anything yet. Well, tell him to hurry up. If he don't, I'll go ahead and solve the case myself. Do you have any clues, Lieutenant? Well, uh, you see... Of course we do. Well, good for you, Lieutenant. Now, you let Nick know when you catch the murderer. Why, you little... Goodbye, Lieutenant. <laughs> so Danny Mason's free again, huh? He'll be needing money if I know him. And in two days, I think we could line up a customer for the scarab. He'd need money in a hurry. He always was a snappy dresser. He used to be known as the dude. And he couldn't buy any snappy outfits from what the prison would give him when he left. But you've got nothing against him, Nick. You can't have him picked up on suspicion without something to go on. True enough, but I can call on him and see what he has to say. Mm, if you can find him. He always used to stay at the old Santley house. And even if he did do it, he's probably so sure he left no clues behind him that I shouldn't be surprised if we found him at the Santley house now. Call Riley. Tell him to meet me there in half an hour. Hello, Danny. Do you mind if we come in? What's this all about? Just a little visit. We want to look over your apartment. Yeah? Got a warrant to search it? We sure have. What's the idea, anyway? Well, are you going to invite us in, or do we have to knock you down and climb over you? All right, all right. Come on in. Come on, Nick. You're invited in. Thanks. Take a look around, Nick. I'll keep an eye on our friend Danny here. Right, Riley. I was just dressing to go out, you. Wouldn't mind if I don't stop just because you're here. Not at all, not at all. Just go right ahead as if you was all alone. Thanks. What are you looking for? Uh, just a little thing that disappeared last night. Yeah? Well, whatever it is, you won't find it here. Yeah, that's sure a snappy shirt you're wearing, Danny. Pretty expensive, ain't it? So what? Oh, nothing at all, nothing at all. Pretty classy tie, too. You must be in the door. Look, can't I wear a decent shirt and tie without the cops making cracks about it? Sure. 
Oh, sure. I, I was just thinking it, Doc. You find anything, Nick? No, not a thing. Hey, see, I told you, you're not supposed to. Maybe we are. But I'm not convinced yet. Well, Doc, it's pretty snappy get-up. What the well-dressed man will wear. But why didn't you wash your face? Wash my face? Yeah, it's filthy dirty. Better wash it before you go out. So what if there's a little dirt there? I'll fix it later. I gotta go now. Why don't you wash it now, Danny? Why don't you let me alone? I'll wash it when I'm good and ready. Danny, you're going to wash your face before you leave this room. Oh. All right, if you feel that way about it, but I can't see... Look out, Riley! <laughs> Nick insists that Danny Mearson wash his face, and Danny objects strongly to doing so. What is behind this, and who shot who and why? We'll see in just a moment. Every time there's a thunderstorm, or the folks go swimming, or the youngsters make mud pies, somebody's likely to come tracking into your house. But it's no job at all to keep your floors spick and span when you use Linex self-polishing wax, the new home brightener that proves how different, how perfect a quick-drying wax can be. Yes, here at last is sparkling new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance for all your floors and linoleum. Developed by leading research chemists who give you the finest, Linex self-polishing wax lends handsome appearance, lasting protection, real anti-skid finish to every floor surface in your home. Linex self-polishing wax is made from a formula that's completely new, and it has the highest possible content of genuine Carnauba wax. The underwriters' laboratories have actually proved that any linoleum, hardwood, or rubber tile floor is less slippery after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied, as you yourself can prove the moment you walk on it. And it's so easy to apply. Linex self-polishing wax takes only a jiffy to wipe on, drying to a satiny luster without tiresome rubbing. So follow the example of other wise homemakers. Choose genuine Linex self-polishing wax. Ask for all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that covers in one coat, dries in one hour. And now back to our story. Nick has just insisted that Danny Mearson, suspected of the murder of the watchman at the museum, wash his face. Danny grudgingly agrees. Suddenly... Oh, oh. I warned you, Danny. You'll have to learn to shoot faster and straighter than that before you can hope to get away with that kind of a trick. You shot my hand off. I just shot the gun out of your hand. You live to go to the chair. Uh, for what? For murdering the museum watchman and stealing the Ankatara uh, scarab. I never heard of it. Hey, what hit me? Who oh, the... You're okay, Riley. Danny tried to make you get away and started by knocking you out, but he didn't get far. Why, oh, that dirty low-down thieving. You sound more like yourself now. Can you hold a gun, Riley? Can I hold it on him? I'll say I can. Good. Keep your eye on Danny while I see why he didn't want to wash his face. Huh? You mean there really was a reason why he objected to... I'm sure there was. Aha! Uh -huh. I'll say there was. See here, Riley? The Ankatara scarab. Huh? The scarab? It looks more like a beetle to me. That's what it is, Riley. A sacred Egyptian beetle. Where was it, Nick? Right where I thought it would be, in the drain pipe in the basin, suspended by a thread. Just about filled the drain pipe. Danny knew that if he ran the water, we might wonder why it didn't run off as fast as it should. And he wasn't going to take that chance if he could help it. Well, Danny, how about that? Will you confess to the killing now? No, you can take me in for having stolen goods in my possession, but I don't know anything about me killing. Besides, I got an alibi. So, you got an alibi, eh? Well, you're coming down to headquarters with me, and I'll let you tell me all about this alibi of yours. You still think that Danny Mearson killed him, Nick? I feel sure he did that. Whether we can prove it or not depends on how strong his alibi is. You can fake an alibi, can't you? Yes, of course you can. And I feel sure that's what Danny's done. But you won't know and... Oh, excuse me. Nick Carter's office. Is Nick there, Patsy? Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Here you are, Nick. Oh. Yes, what'd you find out, Riley? Danny's alibi is watertight, Nick. We can't beat it. You sure of that? Positive. The watchman was killed at 2.27, uh, according to his watch. 
And between 2.15 and 2.30, Danny was in an all-night drugstore three miles from the museum. Clark remembers him and remembers the time positively. And to make it worse, the cop on the beat stopped in there at 2.20 and talked to him. The cop knows Danny and swears to the time. It isn't possible, Riley. Danny did it, I know it. Well, I don't know about that, Nick. Seems to me like there's several other people who might be guilty as well as Danny. You say there's no question about the time. Not a bit, Nick. The cop and the clerk both swear he was there in the drugstore at 2.20 last night drinking coffee. I suppose the time shown on the watch when it stopped is a plant. <laughs> Just try telling a jury that Danny did it, but that the watch is wrong when the old guy was shot. They'd never swallow that. You know it. Yes, yes, I know it, Riley. But I believe that's what happened just the same. Until you find some way to prove it, it don't mean nothing, Nick. All right, well, I'll find some way to prove it. We should look, Nick, but, but make it fast. All please. right, all right. So long. Did he say Danny's alibi is good, Nick? An airtight alibi, apparently. Uh, but I don't believe it. Why are you so sure he did it, Nick? He could be innocent. No, Patsy, he couldn't. For one thing, he started swearing he had an alibi before he knew what it was all about. Another thing, the watchman was shot twice from a distance, and one close to. And it was the close-up shot that wrecked the watch. You mean the watchman was killed first? And that the killer set the watch ahead, then shot him again so as to establish his alibi. That's exactly what I think happened. Now try tell that to a jury. Yeah, it would be pretty hard to believe unless you know more about crooks than most juries do. How could you prove a thing like that, Nick? I don't know, Patsy, but there must be some way. Well, if there is, Nick, you'll find it. Well, I hope so. I'm going to do my darndest anyway. Well, let's go back to the museum. Maybe we overlook something there that'll give us the answer. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to see, Mr. Carter? No, no, I think not, Mr. Steiner. I've gone over everything here in the vicinity of the murder with a fine-tooth comb. And you find nothing that helps establish the murderer's identity? No, nothing at all. No fingerprints on the case where the Van de Vries collection was. No marks of any kind anywhere. But you still feel sure that Danny Mearson is guilty? I'll stake my reputation on it. I've got to find some way to break down his alibi. Nick. Could you try a lie detector on him? Oh, no, Patsy. Unfortunately, too many people still believe that a lie detector is only a makeshift. They're not real evidence. They do? They don't believe that a wiggly line running across a chart can mean anything definite. No, but we scientists know better than that. And take our seismograph, for example. From the wiggly line that the pen on the seismograph makes, we can tell... Seismograph? Yes. You have one here? In the museum? Why, yes, we do. Why? Where is it? We're in the next room here. Just the other side of the Egyptian exhibit. Good. But why are you so interested in that? Dr. Steiner, that seismograph of yours is going to prove Mearson guilty of the murder. Well, Nick, we're all here, just as you wanted. What's up? Yes, Mr. Carter. I demand to know why my client, Mr. Mearson, has been brought here to Lieutenant Riley's office. Now, he's admitted being a receiver of stolen goods but he's guilty of nothing else. All right, all right, Mr. Ramberley. Let's get right down to the facts. You say your client is guilty of nothing but receiving stolen goods. I do, and I protest Just against your... Just I'll do the talking now. <clears throat> you claim that Mearson could not have stolen the scarab and murdered the watchman because at the time the murder and theft were apparently committed, he was engaged in conversation with a policeman and a drug clerk some three miles from the museum. That's right. Absolutely right. And it's a terrible outrage Amberley, to... Did you notice that I used the word apparently when I spoke of the time the murder was committed? Well? I did that purposely. The watchman's timepiece was set ahead by Mearson to establish an alibi for himself. That's a lie. It ain't true. Oh, that's ridiculous. Not quite as ridiculous as you might think. The evidence I have here is unemotional, truthful, and positive. It's a seismographic chart. A what? What's that? Yeah, Nick. Well, what in the name of the far science is a seismographic... Seis a seismographic chart? Yeah. I'll tell you. In the room next to the Egyptian collection is a seismograph. Huh? It's an instrument used to detect earthquake tremors, and it's Ooh. so sensitive that it'll record even the slightest disturbance. Now, I have here the chart that was made on the seismograph at the museum last night. Oh, all this is most irregular. So is murder, Mr. Ramberley. Now notice. At 12.45, there was a slight tremor, or trembling of the earth, due to some distant earthquake. Hmm. At 1.05, five minutes past one, there were two sharp eruptions in the immediate vicinity. 
The reason for them is not definitely determined. But they could have been caused either by nearby blasting or by the reports of a gun shot off in the next room. Huh? And there was no blasting done last night. Oh, get to the point, Carter. My time is valuable. Human life is valuable, too. And the next thing this chart shows is that at 1.17, 17 minutes past 1, 12 minutes after the first two shots, there was another sharp report recorded. And from then on, until 15 minutes before 6, the line is straight as a die. Which means simply that no shots were fired in the museum between 1.17 and 5.45 in the morning. Then that means that the watchman was shot and killed at five minutes past one. Danny turned his watch ahead and shot him again at 17 minutes past one, which gave him plenty of time to get to the drugstore and set up his alibi. Oh, Nick, that's wonderful. It's as good as a lie detector. But that doesn't prove I'll that... I'll tell you, Sam, Billy, they got me. But, but Danny... It all happened just like they said. It was quite the scare, but the old guy caught me as I came out of the room, so I had to bump him off. And I fixed the watch to give me an alibi. They got me licked with that... that well, let's call it a truth machine, Danny, because that's what it really is. It tells the truth. And in this case, makes others tell the truth, too. A wonderful machine, Danny. A wonderful machine. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will be back to tell you about next week's story. A story even more exciting than the museum tragedy. You know, the things you have in your home reflect your own good taste. So naturally, you want to keep them as lovely as you can. And Linux Cream Polish does just that for your fine furniture. Because it cleans as it polishes, one quick, easy application of Linux Cream Polish erases finger marks, removes dust and old polish deposits, helps conceal scratches, all at the same time. And it leaves a handsome, gleaming surface you'll be proud of. A surface free of oil to discourage dust. So save half the time, half the fuss of furniture upkeep the easy, modern way. Make a habit of using Linux Cream Polish for fine furniture. It saves one whole step in your cleaning day routine. Get it at your dealers now. And don't forget that he also has Linux Clear Gloss, the long-lasting brush-on protection for all your floors, which flows on easily and dries overnight to a beautiful gloss finish that lasts for months. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the modern wall finish in rich, glowing colors that lighten and brighten every room in your home. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. You know, Nick, science is wonderful, isn't it? Yes, Ken, you're right. And our story next week is further proof of that fact. Well, how's that, Nick? It was a scientific explanation of why the wound in the dead man's body was made the way it was that gave me my first real clue to his murder. And when the dead man just walked into the office, sat down in a chair, and died without saying a word, well, you can see how badly we needed clues. What do you call the story, Nick? I call it short-range murder. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The entire program was written and directed by Jock McGregor. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners, Linux Clear Gloss Varnish, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Man Who Lived Too Long. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated the strange mystery of a dead man who lived eight days in a week. When you keep up with the times, you not only know what's new, but lots of times you find new ways to help yourself. Take, for example, the modern way to save household drudgery. The three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Those efficient new shortcuts to the care of woodwork, furniture, and floors. Linux clear gloss, which is brushed on, brings lustrous, longer-lasting protection to every wood and linoleum surface in your home. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes, renews the sleek, gleaming beauty of your fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new wax finish, lends rich, satiny loveliness to all your floors, wood, linoleum, or tile. What's more, all three great Linux home brighteners do the job in record time. So start now to enjoy leisure. Ask your hardware, paint, or department store for the three great Linux home brighteners, the modern shortcuts to new home beauty. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. It's quiet in the old Victorian mansion on the corner of 5th and 4th. Nick Carter is working on some intricate aniline dye tests. Patsy is transcribing notes. A long, calm afternoon of intensive work is ahead. Suddenly, the telephone rings. Nick Carter's office. Patsy, is Nick there? Oh, hello, Lieutenant Riley. Say, you sound excited. Anything wrong? Plenty's wrong. Let me talk to Nick. Oh, hold it a second. Well, what's bothering Riley today, Patsy? He won't tell me. Here. Thanks. Hello, Riley. What's on your mind? You've got to hustle down to my office at once. Why? I got a case that'll blow the top off the city if it breaks. It's got to be checked. Well, what's behind it? Ever hear of world research? Well, who hasn't, Riley? They're the biggest industrial chemists and research labs in the country. Well, there's a guy down here named Baker. He's accusing them of murder. Who's murder? You'll find out when you get here. Come on. Who's murder, Riley? His own murder. This guy Baker here is claiming he's dead already. <laughs> Nick, this here is Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker, Nick Carter. I want him to hear your story. Go ahead, Mr. Baker. How has world research murdered you already? As I stand before you now, Mr. Carter, I'm a dead man. Shall be buried in a very few days. Go on. I'm an inventor, Mr. Carter. Not by profession, but by hobby. During the day, I'm a broker. Evenings, I work in my laboratory. I've been doing research with a friend of mine named John Dre. You can check that. Get on with your story, man. I want you to check it to prove I'm not crazy. Well, Dre and I have perfected a new radio development that'll revolutionize the industry. It's been patented. You can check that, too. We'll decide what to check, Mr. Baker. Go ahead. World Research has been after us for weeks to sell out to them. We refused. Apparently, they were desperate. Today, I found this piece of apparatus connected inside one of my experimental machines. A look at it. Oh, what a mess of wires and tubes that is. It was brought into my laboratory by World Research. It's a gamma ray projector of tremendous power. All the while my experimental radio has been operating, this little horror has been projecting gamma rays until my body is saturated with them. I can't live, gentlemen. World research has murdered me. What do you want us to do? Check my story from beginning to end. Then let me come down here and begin action against world research. If I'm going to die, Mr. Carter, I, I want my revenge before I'm in the grave. Look, Mr. Baker, you're talking like an idiot now. Easy, How Riley, we... easy. Mr. Baker, Lieutenant Riley and I will give this case our most careful attention. You ask for vengeance. I promise you this, you will get it, if you deserve it. Well, Nick? I'm finished.
finished, Patsy. Is this apparatus Baker brought in really deadly? No. You mean he lied? I'm not sure. All I do know is that this so-called gamma ray projector is just a mess of tubes and wires. It doesn't make sense. Then the whole case doesn't make sense. And why did Baker come in with that tall story? Yes. Possible world research may be trying to buy him out. But why claim murder? Such an odd, impossible murder. Maybe he's wacky, Nick. I hear most inventors are. Maybe. Well, there's one way to find out. Get the car, Patsy. We're going to visit Mr. Baker in his laboratory. I'm out of breath. How much higher? One flight. The janitor said Baker's lab's on the top floor. I hope I can make it. Now, take my arm. Oh, Nick. Are you sure Baker's in? Yes, the janitor said so. Well, then maybe he... Hold it. Here we are. Sounds pretty quiet in there. Maybe he went out. Maybe. Wait a minute. Funny. Door's open. Well, let's go in. Gosh, what a mess this place is. I thought all labs were neat, like yours, Nick. Not all. Only the really efficient ones. Doesn't seem to be anybody here. Can't understand it. Lights on, door unlocked. <laughs> Nick! What is it, Betsy? Behind that table on the floor. Look. Uh oh. Baker, all right. He's he's dead, isn't he? Yes. Then he was right about those gamma rays and things. No, Patsy. This time, no one bothered with science. Someone simply brought a revolver, aimed it at Mr. Baker, and shot him to death. I got over here as fast as I could, Nick. If this ain't the screwiest case I ever came across... You can look the body over, Riley. Uh, I've already made a preliminary inspection. He was shot at close range with a twenty-five caliber gun. Colt automatic. One of those lady-sized pocketbook automatics, eh? Yes. How come you're so sure, Nick? Because I found the ejected shell right here. Oh. See? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, what is it, Nick? Well, something I hadn't noticed before. Look there, under the body. You can just see the edge of the handle. Glory be, it's the gun itself. Watch out for prints on it. Oh, Nick, I know better than that. Uh, right as usual, Mr. Carter, it's a twenty-five automatic. Let's have a look at it, Riley. Nick, yeah. maybe Mr. Baker shot himself. Maybe he was so desperate about those gamma rays and stuff... Patsy, he... he didn't commit suicide. He was murdered. How come you're so sure, Nick? Patsy could be right, you know. Look the gun over by reflected light. Not a print on it. How could a man kill himself and then wipe his prints off the gun? Mm. Obviously, someone held this gun with a handkerchief or glove, killed Baker, dropped the gun, and left. But who, Nick? It's question number one. I'd also like to know how valuable his invention really is and who profits by his death. Where are you going to start to get the answers? We'll try John Dre, Baker's partner, first. Maybe Mr. Dre's an authority on murder. It's true, Mr. Carter. Our radio development is potentially worth a fortune. It's new and tremendously important. Look over the patent yourself. We uh, registered it jointly. Mr. Dre, if you were partners, how is it you and Baker worked in separate labs? Research was only a hobby with Baker. He had a regular brokerage business outside. He wanted a place where he could work now and then, three, four hours a day. Exactly how much did World Research offer you to sell out? Quarter of a million. And you refused, Mr. Dre? Uh, not exactly. We made a counteroffer. And now that Baker's dead and the patent's all yours, you're waiting for the answer, huh? Uh, certainly not. I told you we registered the patent jointly. I can't touch Baker's share. Can you tell me who does inherit Baker's share? His sister, I believe. Julia Baker. She lives with him over at the... I know the address. Thanks a lot, Mr. Dre. Oh, uh, by the way... Eh? Yeah? Would it be possible to develop an electrical gamma ray projector? What? Nonsense. I, I thought you were a scientist, Mr. Carter. You know gamma rays can only be produced by radioactive elements? Yes, I know it. I'm just wondering if Baker knew I'd know it. Come on, Patsy. Let's pay a visit to Baker's heir. <laughs> I, 
I suppose it's true I inherit Ben's share in the invention, Mr. Carter. I I never thought about it much. Miss Baker, tell me, do you know if there's a copy of the patent here? I don't know. I think it's with Ben's attorney. That's Roland York at Maiden Lane. Was your brother working on it very long? For years, it seems. I don't know where he found the time. I hardly ever saw him outside of Sundays. He spent Sunday with me. He worked very hard at the brokerage, ten hours a day. What did he do? He was the statistical expert. No time off? Hardly any. Must have been pretty lonesome here for you. It was. Even at night when he came home from work, he couldn't spend much time with me. He was so tired, he'd just have dinner and then go to bed. What were his hours at the brokerage office, Miss Barra? He worked from nine in the morning and till nine at night, usually. Mm, pretty stiff hours. And what time did you have dinner at home? Around 9.30. And then your brother went to bed? Yes, around 11. Mm, I see. I... I can't understand who'd want to murder my brother, Mr. Carter. He was a good man, was friendly, was interested in everybody. He... Oh, for heaven's sakes, Mr. Carter, who killed him? I don't know yet, Miss Baker. Frankly, at the moment, I'm much more interested in another problem. Oh, I... I don't understand, Mr. Carter. Come along, Patsy. I want to have a talk with the janitor of the building where Baker's lab is located. Nick, does this fantastic problem that's bothering you have anything to do with Baker's murder? Maybe the crux of the murder... You mean the answer to why Baker lied about that gamma ray projector? No. Well, then I don't Wait get it. Here's the building. All right. Come on. Okay. Here's the janitor's door. Yes. You remember me? Nick Carter? Working on the Baker case. Oh, sure. Come on in, Mr. Carter. It's awful hot here out on the sidewalk. No, I've only come to ask you one question. Oh, here, go ahead. When did Mr. Baker usually work in his laboratory? Why, every day. You're sure? Aye, sure. He worked here every day, Monday through Saturday. He come morning sometimes, sometime afternoon, sometimes evenings. But I see him come in here every day except Sunday. He always make it a point to say hello to me when he comes in or goes out. How long did he usually work? In four-hour stretches. That's what I was afraid of. Four hours a day, six days a week. It makes 24 hours, one whole day. Where in blazes did he get that extra day? Nick, what on earth are you talking about? Don't you see, Patsy? Ben Baker... Duck, Patsy. Somebody shot at us from across the street. I saw the flashes. Oh, Nick, the janitor. He's been shot. Help me get him inside, Patsy. Quick. All right. Is he hurt badly? Patsy, this man is dead. What is this mysterious question that's bewildering Nick? Why was the janitor in Ben Baker's lab building murdered? We'll see in just a moment. All of us learn best by doing. That's why American homemakers who have used Linex self-polishing wax have learned so quickly how different, how perfect a quick-drying wax can be. For one practical test is all you need to prove to yourself that this new wax preparation is the key to perfect floor care for wood and linoleum alike. The formula for Linex self-polishing wax developed by leading research chemists, is completely new, giving new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance to all your floors. And Linex self-polishing wax contains the greatest possible amount of genuine carnauba wax for that handsome, satiny look only real wax can give. What's more, the underwriters' laboratories have proved by test that any linoleum, hardwood, or rubber tile floor is actually less slippery after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied as you'll prove for yourself the moment you step on it. And, of course, Linex self-polishing wax takes only a jiffy to use, or you simply wipe it on without tiresome rubbing, and it dries quickly to a beautiful luster that's a joy to behold. So choose genuine Linex self-polishing wax, the finest product of its kind. Ask your dealer now for all three great Linex home brighteners to give your home new beauty the easy way.
And now, back to our story. The strange murder of Ben Baker, broker and amateur inventor, has faced Nick Carter with many peculiar problems. Why did Baker lie about his impending death? How important was his invention? Who would profit by his death? As Nick uncovers an even more fantastic problem, Baker's janitor is shot to death. Now we find Nick, Patsy, and Lieutenant Riley at the scene of the second murder. Nick, I'm really lost. I can't make head or tail of this mess. Can't you give us any idea of what's going on, Nick? Why was Baker's janitor killed? Probably because he knew some vital clue to the identity of the murderer. Nick, what's this big question you say is bothering you? Riley, how can a man live eight days in one week? Oh, now, that's silly, Nick. There's only seven days in anybody's week. Well, nevertheless, Ben Baker lived eight days in a week. I don't understand, Nick. Well, oh, listen. He worked 12 hours a day in the brokerage house, including an hour off for lunch. Uh-huh. He left his house at eight in the morning for work. He returned at 9.45 or so for dinner. After dinner, he went to bed. I've checked all those times. And they're all verified. Which accounts for 24 hours. But according to the janitor's testimony, he worked at least four hours a day, six days a week in his lab. Mm. That's an extra 24 hours. An extra day. Now, where did Baker get that eighth day in his week? Gosh, it don't make sense. You're telling me. Nick, what in the jumping blue blazes is going on around here? A guy comes around and says he's been murdered, and he ain't. When you check his story, you find all of a sudden he is. Then the killer knocks off a janitor after he's already given his evidence. And then we find the only one who profits by Baker's death is his sister, who's a frightened girl who looks as though she wouldn't hurt a fly. Wait a minute. Baker was knocked off with a 25 automatic. It's a woman's gun. But Baker accused World Research. What have we got to do about it? Get a search warrant, Riley. Huh? Meet us down at the office of Baker's attorney, Roland York. I want to get a look at that patent. <laughs> been all through the files, and here's everything there is on that invention. Oh, gosh, what a mess of documents. Mm. Looks as though it's as much trouble patenting an invention as it is making one. Yes. Mm. Well, Nick, anything phony about this stuff? Strangely enough, no. Mm. Apparently, Baker and Dre have worked out quite a brilliant improvement on radio television transmission. It's not epoch-making, but it's sort of thing that can cut costs of transmission 50%. Hmm. Patent seems to be legitimate. Made out by Baker and Dre jointly. That's what Dre said. Here's something. Hmm? Baker's share goes to his sister when he dies. That's what she said. Ah, but here's something no one mentioned. Mm-hmm. What's that? If Baker and Dre both die before commercial exploitation of the idea begins... Roland York, the attorney, acquires all commercial rights subject to the obligation to pay both heirs their fair share. Nick. Are you thinking what I'm thinking, Patsy? I know what you're both thinking. That maybe John Dre is the next man scheduled to die. That may be true, so let's get busy. All right. What do we do? We're up against a shrewd killer, and we don't know exactly what he's after. Although I have a hunch, if we knew where Ben Baker got his extra day, we'd be a lot closer to the solution. Mm. Riley, get hold of Roland York. Yeah? Hold him for questioning. As tactfully as you can. Right, Nick. Patsy, you and I are going places. Where, Nick? To John Dre's laboratory. To protect him? Maybe. Also, maybe to find Ben Baker's extra day. There's Dre's place up ahead, Patsy. Last door. The light's on, Nick. Gosh, maybe Dre's been killed already. You're remembering the way we found Baker, huh? All right, let's go in. Oh, who's that? Oh, sorry, Mr. Dre, you startled me. But we are... Quiet, Patsy. Who are you? Oh, let me introduce myself, Mr. Dre. My name is Kent. I'm from World Research. What are you doing here? Why, I... Well, I was sent over to express our deep sympathy for your recent bereavement. So? And also, you understand how embarrassing it is to talk business at such a time. Go on. Well, and also to say that your counterproposal is really much too high. You think so, huh? You must reconsider, Mr. Dre. Now that Baker is dead, huh? I... 
I don't understand. Baker was the one who was holding out for the high price, wasn't he? Well, Mr. Dre... Now that Baker's out of the way, you brazenly come here hoping you can persuade me to accept a smaller figure. I assure you... Nick. Yes, Betsy. I just realized, maybe it isn't Roland Jork. Maybe Baker told the truth about world research. Maybe the patent does threaten their business. Why, maybe they... Did I hear you call this man Nick? Well, I... I had assumed I was speaking to Mr. John Dre. Do you mean to tell me that I... What's the meaning of this... What are you people doing in my lab? Investigating murder, Mr. Dre. So I was right. You are an imposter. This is outrageous. How Mr. dare you... Mr. Carter, will you have the goodness to explain what's going on here? Oh, it's really quite simple, Mr. Dre. We came here to throw a little light on the murder mystery That's and... What... Yes, Nick? Say that again. Say what? Really, Carter, this is ridiculous. Quiet, please. Have... Repeat what you said, Patsy. Well, I said we came to Mr. Dre's laboratory to throw a little light on the murder. That's it, light. Light in the laboratory. And that's the explanation. The explanation of what? Ben Baker's extra day. I think I know where he got it. Come on. Where to? Let's go have a look at Baker's electric meter. What's an electric meter got to do with an extra day? It'll show where it went. Here, through this door. Down to the cellar. Watch your step. Pretty dark. I've got a flash. Gosh, the cellars in these old loft buildings are creepy. Like catacombs. Yes. It's so deep, these stairs go down forever. We won't be long. Flash your light around, will you, Nick? Afraid? Uh, only of mice. Careful, here's the bottom. Don't trip. The right. floor's pretty broken up. Now, where are the meters? Well, there they are, Nick. Over there against the far wall, behind that pile of barrels. All right, come on. Who's the killer, Nick? Do you know? Not for sure yet. But I've got a pretty good idea. Maybe Julia Baker isn't as weak and helpless as she seems. Maybe. Maybe I was right about world research. Maybe. Maybe Roland Jork got ambitious. Maybe. Can't you say anything but maybe? Uh, here's the meters. Let's see. First, second. Oh, there. Top floor offices. Baker's was 6R. There it is, on the right. Yes, and there, I hope, is the solution to the case. Where? On the dials. Read off the kilowatt hours. But why, Nick? Because when we compare the meter reading now with a reading a month ago, we'll find that very little electricity has been used. Nick, I can't follow you. What is that? Now, Patsy, behind these barrels. It's the killer. Nick, we're trapped. No, no, Patsy, not quite. Let him come a little closer. When I give the word, help me push these barrels over. All right, now, Patsy. Nick. All right, we can come out now. Our friend's been knocked cold. We'll find him under a couple of crates. But who is it, Nick? Put your light on quickly. In a second. I'll be happy to illuminate the very unattractive face of your murderer. And there you are. Gee, Nick, that's... Yes, Mr. John Dre. <laughs> In just a moment, Nick will return to give you the final details of today's story and explain why John Dre killed the man who lived too long. The best way to keep up the appearance of the things you own is to protect them. And the finest protective finish you can find for dozens of household uses is Linex Clear Gloss, the modern brush-on finish for linoleum and wood surfaces. Here's the self-leveling gloss finish which flows on easily and dries to a lasting finish that protects for months Protects not only against wear, against dirt, against spotting, but actually protects against hot grease, boiling water, fruit acids, even alcohol. Yes, for any surface you want to save, it pays to use Linex Clear Gloss. And Linex Clear Gloss lends sparkling beauty as well, requiring only the whisk of a damp cloth to wipe away surface smudges. Give your floors and woodwork the gleaming luster, the sturdy protection of Linex Clear Gloss, the finest in household finishes. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners. Linex clear gloss, Linex self-polishing wax, and Linex cream polish for fine furniture at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that goes on like magic. Its beautiful colors will lighten and brighten your home at an average cost of just $2.98 a room. Ask for Chemtone, which covers in one coat Dries in one hour.
And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, where did Baker get that extra day? He didn't, Ken. That's the point of the whole case. Baker never spent any time at all in that lab. If he had worked there experimenting, his meter would have registered many hours of electricity. But as it was, the meter showed almost no electricity used at all. But Nick, the janitor said he was there. Which is why the janitor was killed. John Dre rented the lab in Baker's name. Then he killed the janitor to keep him from telling me that the man found dead in the lab, Baker, wasn't the man who said hello to him as he went in and out. But why was that necessary, Nick? Baker and Dre made the mistake of patenting their invention jointly. Now, the patent law is very strict on one point. It provides that only the actual inventor is permitted to take out the patent. If any other name appears on the patent, it's thereby automatically void. Oh, I see. So World Research could have broken the patent if they found out that Baker was not an inventor, but merely Dre's financial backer. Right, Patsy. And rather than take that chance, Dre tried to set up a false identity for Baker. He told Baker to go to the police with his story about being murdered, hoping that when the police checked up on him, they'd believe that Baker actually was a practicing scientist. Well, then why did he kill Baker after all? Dre was afraid someone might cross-examine Baker and get the truth. So he killed Baker to keep the secret secure. Well, Nick, how about a little preview of next week's story? Well, next week, Ken, Patsy and I are called to the home of the foremost amateur art collector in the country to find out why one of his portraits has suddenly started squinting. Did you say squinting? He did. And he wouldn't have been able to break the case if he hadn't taken the fingerprints of a man who died 200 years ago. Fingerprints? 200 years old? And squinting portraits? For the love of Pete, Nick, what do you call this case? I call it the case of the nearsighted picture. Friends, today is the second anniversary of the United States Cadet Nurse Corps. And today, America has urgent need of 60,000 cadet nurses. Every cadet nurse is a girl with a future. The United States Cadet Nurse Corps offers all expense scholarships, plus monthly allowances and uniforms to high school graduates under 35 who are in good health. And candidates joining 90 days prior to the war's end will be allowed to finish their training. Don't overlook this opportunity to serve. Inquire at your local hospital now. Join the United States Cadet Nurse Corps and do your part. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux self-polishing wax... Linex Cream Polish, and Linex Clear Gloss, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linex dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. show starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. 
a man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Make-Believe Murder. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter was initiated into one of the most exclusive clubs in the world and how his initiation turned out to be not one murder, but two. These are busy days, and no one is any busier than a lady who keeps house. It seems as if you no sooner get one job done than another pops up. So it's a lucky thing that American science has created such work savers as those three great Linux home brighteners. Yes, here's the way to save hours of work each week. That's why American homemakers from coast to coast are swinging over to the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, the modern brush-on finish, Linux cream polish for fine furniture, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. So do as thousands of other wise women do. Save hours of work, enjoy sparkling new home beauty with the three great Linux home brighteners. Get them at your hardware, paint, or department store and see what modern magic they work for you. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. A single light burns brightly down in the basement deep under the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 5th and 4th, illuminating a small paper target. Twenty yards away, Nick Carter stands, a small automatic in his hand, firing methodically. Ah, To the left, about eight feet, eight inches. Try again. Left again, nine feet, two inches. Nine feet exactly that time. Nick! Hey, Nick! Yes, Patsy? Cease firing. I want to come in. Come ahead. I've just about finished. We've got to close up shop for today. Nick, you'll be late. Patsy, I've won my bet with Sergeant Matheson. What bet? I bet him a dollar the Austrian Mauser wouldn't eject a cartridge more than ten feet. I've just fired 50 rounds, and not one cartridge is more than nine and a half feet from the gun. Oh. I win a dollar, and Jansen is cleared of the murder charge, which proves that he couldn't have done it. Personally, I think... Uh Uh-huh. I was waiting for you to notice. Evening gown, huh? Well, Miss Bowen, you look most charming. You really think so, Nick? May I ask where you're going tonight? Out? With you? With me? Please, Harry, Nick, we'll be late. Late for what? Don't tell me you've forgotten. And you were so anxious to go when the letter came. Honestly, Nick, sometimes I believe you're not human. Now hurry and get into your dinner clothes. I'll explain on the way over. Well, Patsy, where are we going? To a murder. You can stop kidding me now. I remembered, Patsy. I was so wrapped up in that ballistics work, it slipped my mind. You sure? I'll recite it like a lesson. I've been invited to join the famous Alphabet Club, the most exclusive gathering of eminent talents in the country, right? Right. Incidentally, why is it called the Alphabet Club, Nick? Because the first letters are the names of the charter members of the first four letters of the alphabet. Arnold Archer. The financier. Mm-hmm. Nelson Burns, the architect. Walter Crane, the boy wonder engineer. And George Dennis, the attorney. Oh. Now, incidentally, they're not only the charter members... They're the initiating committee, too. They're the ones who are going to put me through the ropes before the rest of the club arrive for dinner. Oh, that initiation stunt's a cute idea. Yes, in fact, rather tickles me. Staging a make-believe murder. They swear I'll never be able to break it. Challenging the mastermind, eh? That, that's the club over there. You can park in front. Right on. We're just about on time. Oh, please hurry, Nick. <laughs> I saw Burns the other day. He swore they'd cooked up a beauty. You know, I'm really intrigued. Yes, please? Miss Bowen and Mr. Carter. Oh, yes. Good evening, madam. Good evening, sir. Welcome to the Alphabet Club. Thank you. The members are waiting in the lounge room. Will you follow me, please? Could I join too, Nick? No, Patsy. They don't admit women. But they asked me to bring you along because they said they knew I worked with you on my cases. Mm, pretty swank place, isn't it, Nick? I wonder how much the club dues are. Right here, sir. Uh, just one moment, please. Gentlemen, Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen. Ah! <laughs> well, for the love of... Ah! Gentlemen, 
Gentlemen, open the door, please. <laughs> Mr. Archer, Mr. Burns, please open. Mr. Crane, Mr. Dennis. Enter. Enter the house of death. Murder awaits Nick Carter. Golly, it's pitch dark. Watch your step, Patsy. Don't trip on any dead bodies. Oh, what's that noise I hear? Sounds like we're in a toy shop. <laughs> <laughs> Let's close it off, Miss Bourne. Lights, please. Let's have some light water. That's it. Here we are. Oh, golly. <laughs> Who's that lying on the floor? I assume it's Santa Claus. All right, you are. The name of this mystery is Who Killed Santa Claus? And if Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen want any dinner, they'd better find out who done it, and quick. Very well, gentlemen. <laughs> I shall begin with the taking of the evidence. My name is Arnold Archer. I love Santa Claus, but today I hate him. Why? Because he brought me this cat pistol. And I really wanted a horn. My name is Nelson Burns. And this horn <laughs> is a sad disappointment to me. I hate Santa Claus. I really wanted the sword he gave Walter Crane. And I wanted the cat pistol he gave Archer. Well, who's Santa Claus? Well, that's George Dennis. He'll say hello after Mr. Carter finds out who done it. Well, gentlemen, I see you all have a good and sufficient motive for killing Santa Claus. I must now examine our make-believe corpse to discover the method of this brutal, foul, and illegal make-believe murder. In my opinion... Patsy. Nick, what is it? Get on the phone. Call Maddie. Get the homicide squad up here fast. Mr. Carter... I'm not joking, Mr. Archer. You'd better call the other members and cancel the dinner. Your make-believe murder has turned real. Dennis has been shot to death. Oh. All right, all right. Now, just a minute. I want to get you guys straight. Who's the corpse, Nick? George Dennis, the lawyer. You remember him, Matty. He was retained as an expert in the Wilner case. Yeah, I got that. Now, which one is Arnold Archer? I am. The financier, Sergeant. Uh, Believe me, Sergeant Matheson, this must be some kind of ghastly mistake. Well, none of us would want to kill Dennis. We were his friends, Sergeant. Of we course. couldn't have any reason to kill him. Oh, you're Burns, huh? Nelson Burns. Yes. And the gentleman over there is Walter Crane. I think this is in pretty bad taste, Carter, and I don't like it. Dennis was killed accidentally, there's no doubt of it. It's pretty cheap to try and turn this into a murder case for the sake of notoriety. Now listen, wise Wait, guy. Mr. Crane, you're positive this was an accident. Why? Well, isn't it obvious? The four of us were alone in this room when the steward knocked on the door. Dennis lay down on the floor, I put out the lights, and Nelson Byrne fired off the blanks. Yes. Well, evidently, a round of live ammunition must have gotten mixed up with the blanks. No, no, that's not true. I swear it. Mr. Burns is right. I checked a gun. There are four rimfire blank shells in the chambers. Only four? I see Patsy understands what I mean. Doesn't anyone else? What is this, Nick? When Patsy and I were outside, we heard five shots. Five? Meaning that a fifth shot was fired along with those four blanks. Meaning that one of you three gentlemen took advantage of the make-believe murder to murder George Dennis. Why, that's uh -huh. ridiculous. Quiet, Quiet gentlemen, please. please. None of you are to leave this room. Matter, get your squad in here. Search these men. Then take this place apart if you have to. I want to find the gun that killed Dennis. Okay, Nick. The murderer wants to save us the trouble. He can talk now. Believe me, gentlemen, this won't be any make-believe search. Nobody have anything to say? All right, Matty, get going. Right. We're over here, Matty. Comparing yes. notes. Got anything to offer, Sergeant? Well, uh, let's hear what you've got first. Well, Archer's the famous financier. Worth over a million. Wouldn't kill for money. Nelson uh, Byrne, same status. Plenty of money. Ditto for Walter Crane. Uh -huh. All four men were pretty close friends at college. Known each other for years. Apparently, they're still friends. Now, that might not be true. People grow apart sometimes. On the other hand, all three are pretty ruthless kind of men. I imagine you have to be tough to make the success they have. And you have to have a certain amount of cold courage to pull off a murder the way this one's been handled. Now, how about the gun? There ain't no gun. What? You heard me, Patsy. There ain't no gun. Nick, we took them guys apart and put them together again. We took the room apart. There ain't but one gun in the place. The one that fired the blanks. But that's impossible. <laughs> You're telling me? Nick, we opened every book. We even took the toys apart. No soap. And the gun couldn't have been thrown out the window because there ain't no window. Hmm. Look, it's uh, getting pretty late, Nick, and they're getting kind of sore in there. Do you want me to hold them? I'll tell you what, Matty. 
There are bedrooms upstairs. They can all go upstairs if they want and try and get some sleep, but they're not to leave the club. Right. And I want a ballistics report on the bullet that killed Dennis as soon as possible. Right. If you want me, I'll be in the kitchen. Yeah, what doing? Getting something to eat and pumping the steward. I'm hungry for food and facts. <laughs> This is a man that can cook after my own heart. Thank you, sir. Mm, me too. I'll take lessons from you any day. Thank you, ma'am. Too bad a dinner like this had to be wasted. Oh, it's not the dinner I mind, sir. It's the fact that you're joining the club was so... so... Inauspicious? The very word, sir. You think they'll take me in anyway, despite what happened tonight? Why, of course, sir. I'm sure the gentlemen are still anxious to have the famous Nick Carter as a member. Even what it means, the famous Nick Carter has become merely an infamous detective accusing the members of murder? I'm sure it was an accident, sir. You think a live shell might have gotten mixed up with the blanks? Yes, sir. I see. Steward, do you know who loaded the gun? It was Mr. Crane, sir. The engineer? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Crane always plans our little festivities, sir. He planned the entire initiation tonight. Talking about it all week, he was, sir. I used to see him late at night, thinking it over in the lounge, chuckling to himself. Was it his gun? Yes, sir. I see. Well, thanks very much, Stuart. Both for the excellent food and for the information. Especially the food. Come on, Betsy. Mm-hmm. I think I'd like to go upstairs and have a few words with Crane. Nick, do you think Crane... I don't know, Betsy. Certainly, he's a likely prospect. I didn't like the way he kept insisting it was an accident. What I don't like is the fact that Walter Crane, engineer, gentleman with a calculating and mechanical frame of mind, gentleman who loaded the gun himself, failed to notice an extra shot was fired. Ah! Nick! That's no initiation. Come on, upstairs, quick. Hey, Nick! You hear that? Came from upstairs, Maddie. Come quick. Sounded like Crane to me. Nick, this might be a trap to get us up here. Now, wait Why a minute. Ma- this is Crane's room right here. <laughs> Glory be. It's Crane, all right. Dead on the floor. With a toy sword in his heart. <laughs> Who's the man who turned make-believe murder into reality and then covered it up by a second murder with a make-believe sword? How will Nick break this strange case? We'll see in just a moment. Most folks remember what a long, tiresome job it used to be to keep floors in linoleum spick and span. But now, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, the modern shortcut to beautiful floors, has cut that job to a minimum. For Linex self-polishing wax, made from a new formula developed by leading chemists to give you the finest, is designed to save you work, to give your floors and linoleum amazing new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance. For one thing, Linex self-polishing wax takes only a jiffy to wipe on and dries without tiresome rubbing to a handsome satiny luster. For another, because Linex self-polishing wax contains the greatest possible amount of genuine carnauba wax, the finish lasts longer. What's more, the underwriter's laboratories have proved by actual test that any hardwood, linoleum, or rubber tile floor is less slippery after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied. No wonder it's called the anti-skid floor finish, and it always gives that satiny look that only real wax can give. So it's just common sense to depend on Linex self-polishing wax, the new way to perfect floor care. Enjoy greater leisure, greater convenience, greater beauty in your home with Linex Self-Polishing Wax, available at your hardware, paint, or department store. Ask your dealer now for all three great Linex home brighteners, the easy way to more attractive living. And now back to our story. The make-believe murder of George Dennis, which was staged as Nick's initiation to the Alphabet Club, suddenly turned real. Nick could find no motive for the murder, and Sergeant Matheson was unable to locate the gun that fired the death shot. While Nick and Patsy were collating evidence in the club, they heard a scream and rushed upstairs to find Walter Crane stabbed to death, a toy sword in his heart. Now, with Sergeant Matheson and Patsy, 
Nick examines the dead man as the other club members, Burns and Archer, rush into the room. For heaven's sakes, Carter, what is it? Who screamed? All right, all right, don't park here. This ain't no Coney Island peep show. But Arnold, it's, it's hey, Crane! He's what do you good guys heaven. think this is, a reunion? Go on, get out of here. Go on back to Just your room. Just a rooms. minute, Matty. I want to ask a couple of questions. Okay. Mr. Archer, where were you when you heard Crane scream? Well, I just finished bathing. I was in the shower room. I see. That's why you're still carrying a bath towel. Yes. And you, Mr. Burns? Well, I was in my room waiting for Archer to finish. I was smoking a cigar at my window. Where's the cigar? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think I dropped it out the window when I heard Crane yell. Matty, get one of your men to check that. Right. Be back in a flash. Now, well, let's have a look at that sword. May I borrow your towel a moment, Archer? Certainly. I don't want to smudge any prints that might be on it. You are? Thanks. Let's wrap this towel around it. Mr. Carter, surely you don't think I... You what, Mr. Burns? Well, merely because I said in jest that I wanted Crane's toy sword during the make-believe murder. You don't think I... that I killed Crane with it? Deductive reasoning isn't that obvious, Mr. Burns. You have nothing to worry about on that count. Thank you. But both of you have plenty to worry about on other counts. No, Mr. Carter. Look here, gentlemen. You can... I don't think either of you understand. Two murders have been committed in this club... Someone's guilty. That leaves three suspects. You, Mr. Archer. What? You, Mr. Burns. But I... And the steward. They execute men for murder, gentlemen. Try to understand that. Well, I found a cigar all right, Nick. All right, Matty, thanks. These gentlemen may return to their rooms. All right, gents. Well, Nick, what about Crane? Killed almost instantly. Just time enough to scream. Uh-huh. Whoever killed him used plenty of power to thrust this dull blade deep enough to penetrate the heart... Any prints on the blade, Nick? I'll take the towel off and look. No. The blade's dry and clean as a mirror. You look at it by reflected light. Not a latent print on it, not even a smudge. Yeah. <sighs> that doesn't help much. Well, I got news. It ain't going to help much more. Yes? They took this slug out of Dennis. Here, you are. look at it. Thanks. Hmm. 22, I see. Ain't it... Wait. Hello. You see, huh? Nick, what is it? No rifling marks on this bullet, Patsy. No rifling marks? No lands or grooves on the slug at all. Now, what's that supposed to mean? The killer threw it at Dennis? That's impossible. We heard the extra shot. Maddie's just being difficult, Patsy. I think Maddie's bad news is the best I've had on this case. Well, now, what's that supposed to mean? It means I think I know where to find the gun that killed Dennis. Come on, Patsy. We're going to have a look at Dennis's house. Well, how in blazes did the gun get there? I didn't say the gun was there. The gun's in this house. Th then why do you go into Dennis's place? To find out why it was fired. Oh, not a scrap of paper worth looking at in his desk, Patsy. Ah, looks like we'll have to open that safe. Too bad Dennis was a bachelor. No one here to give us the combination. Well, we could wait for a court order to have the safe open, but I don't think we'll bother. Let's have the stethoscope in my bag. Okay, Chief. You going to crack this crib? Okay, where did you pick up that jargon? From a crime magazine. Here's your scope. Thanks. Well, that magazine must have been 15 years old. Crooks don't talk that way anymore. No? Well, how would they describe what you're doing? They'd say that I was exercising a natural facility and delicacy of touch to turn the dial. Meanwhile, using a medical device to hear the tumblers fall. <laughs> Quiet now. Shouldn't take long. It's a three-job. Three-bolt job. What made you go straight, Nick? That, Patsy, is a base insinuation. My criminal facility was acquired during a long career of fighting crooks. There we are. <laughs> All right, let's go through this stuff quickly. Here's Dennis's insurance. $100,000. Bar Association's beneficiary. Packages of old letters. Skip them. Oh, here's a note from Archer. Offers Dennis $150,000 for the shares of stock Dennis holds in Archer's company. Nice sum. Wait a minute. Here's a will. Oh, let's see. Ah, now, this is very interesting. Mr. Dennis leaves all cash and stock holdings to his old ex-college roommate, John Wendell. Who's John Wendell? John Wendell happens to be the steward of the Alphabet Club. Well. Old college friend, eh? <laughs> Maybe that won't interest Matty. Nick, do you think it was Wendell, the steward? He he killed Dennis for the stock? Hey, wait, let's have a look at that envelope here. Looks like it contains stock shares. It does. It. Nick, there's only one share of stock in here. One single share. Par value, $500. Someone's taken the rest. Just one share, huh? Hm. 
Betsy, where's that note from Archer you just read me? Here, Nick. Why? Let's see. Oh, for you, $150,000 for... Uh-huh. Betsy, you didn't read this correctly. It says that Archer offers Dennis $150,000 for his share of stock. Dennis only owned the one share. Then why should Archer offer him $150,000 for a share of stock worth only $500? You'll find out shortly. Let me have that phone. Oh, why do you always have to be so mysterious, Nick? I don't like making statements until I'm positive. Alphabet Club, Sergeant Matheson speaking. Maddie, this is Nick. Oh, what'd you find, Nick? I think I found all the answers. Well, Nick, leave me here. Not on the phone. I'm going to demonstrate. Now listen. I'm listening. Get the surviving members out of bed. Yeah. Tell them I've broken the case. Tell them I'm going to reenact the crime for them. Yeah, how? When Patsy and I come to the door, I want the steward to meet us. Then we'll play the make-believe murder all over again, just as it happened. You can take Crane's part. Reenact the make-believe murder? Right. I think you're crazy, Nick. Maybe. But this time, the make-believe murder is going to lead to an honest-to-goodness solution. set, Patsy? I've got it, Nick. We're going to repeat everything we did earlier this evening. Right. And that repetition means every detail, no matter how small. Right. First, I rang the bell. Yes, sir? Miss Bowen and Mr. Carter. Good good evening, madam. Good evening, sir. Welcome to the Alphabet Club. Hi. I uh, think I asked you to follow me, Mr. Carter. Right. Go ahead. All set in there, Maddie? Lights out and ready to go. Gentlemen, Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen. Uh, Make like I'm screaming, Nick. That was Crane's job. Ah! Go on, Stuart. Ah! Knock again. Then I said... Gentlemen, please open the door. Right. And then? Only four shots that time. Happens, Burns, opening the door. Then what? I said something about entering the house of death. We came in. And heard toys. <laughs> then I told Crane to put on the lights. I'll take care of that. Thanks. I asked who was lying on the floor. And I assumed it was Santa Claus. And you started explaining, Archer. So explain. The... Uh... The name of this mystery is Who Killed Santa Claus? If Mr. Carter wants any dinner, he'd better solve it. Gentlemen, I shall begin with the taking of the evidence. Oh, this is screwy. My my name is Arnold Archer. Today, I hate Santa Claus. Why? Because he brought me this cap pistol. I wanted a horn. My name is Nelson Burns. And this horn... One minute, Mr. Burns. Yes? We left out a detail. Mr. Archer was supposed to snap his cap pistol when he spoke. Go ahead, Mr. Archer. Well, go ahead. Fire that gun, Mr. Archer. You'll never get me. Oh, Oh, no, you don't. Watch out for that toy gun. Glory be, that cap pistol was loaded. It fired a real bullet. And that that lie still, Archer. You'll never break away. That, Maddie, is a solution of our missing gun. But, Nick, why? The single share of stock Dennis held was the answer. He never owned more than one share of stock, and yet Archer wanted to buy it back for $150,000. $150,000? What for? I'm afraid Mr. Dennis was guilty of an old legal racket. As a stockholder in Archer's firm, he had the right of access to the company's books. You seem to have all the answers, Carter. Yes, he searched through those books until he dug out enough of the evidence of illegal market operations to ruin us. And then offered to sell his share of stock and stockholders' right to bring action back to you. For an exorbitant sum. Uh Aha! Blackmail! Legal blackmail. Mr. Archer, you were afraid Dennis was going to blackmail you for the rest of his life. So you killed him. Which is the final irony of the case. That the make-believe murder was committed with a make-believe gun. In just a moment, Nick will be back to give you the final details and tell you how a toy gun could commit a make-believe murder. Here's a special message for the man of the house. If you're a golfer with pet clubs that must last for the duration, or if it's your special job to keep the household woodwork in shape, Linex Clear Gloss is good news for you. For Linex Clear Gloss gives a good-looking, yet tough, protective finish to any surface. When you use it on your treasured golf clubs, they'll look like new. 
And when you put Linex clear gloss on closet doors, window frames, and stairway banisters, what a help that is. Yes, any surface protected by Linex clear gloss requires only a minimum of upkeep. For the whisk of a damp cloth removes finger marks, dust, smudges, leaving a gleaming, lustrous surface that lasts and lasts. One application of Linex clear gloss, which flows on evenly, leaving no brush marks, will serve you for months and look well the whole time. Ask your dealer now for Linex clear gloss, the finest in household finishes. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners and... Linex Clear Gloss, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, and Linex Cream Polish for fine furniture at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember, your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. Chemtone covers most wall surfaces in one coat, dries in one hour, bringing bright new loveliness to your walls and ceilings in bedroom, living room, or hall. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, I thought Sergeant Matheson checked the toy gun when he searched the room and found nothing wrong with it. That's right, Ken. A point very few people know is the fact that, a, that certain types of cap pistols can fire live ammunition. The bullet is wedged into the barrel through a small hole in the plate that should support the cap. Then the hammer is snapped and discharges the bullet. Accurately enough to kill at short range. So Archer killed Dennis with the gun and then pretended it was a toy. Right. He disposed of the cartridge by the simple means of swallowing it. I guessed that, and he admitted it. Well, why did he kill Crane? Because Crane's methodical memory couldn't be fooled. He finally recalled where the extra shot came from. When he called Archer into his room and confronted him, Archer killed him. Said he just grabbed up the toy sword and stabbed. Did you know that before? Well, I had a pretty good idea. On the pretext of protecting fingerprints on the sword, I borrowed Archer's towel. He claimed he'd been bathing, but his towel was quite dry. Didn't even dampen the metal blade. That's right. I remember you mentioned it. I staged the repeat performance to frighten Archer and save us the trouble of a long cross-examination. I knew that Archer, in self-defense, would probably load his toy gun again, hoping to use it to effect an escape. That was what I was playing the scene for. Golly. Pretty clever. Well, what story have you got in mind for us next week, Nick? Well, Ken, next week, Patsy and I are going to meet a corpse that has been shot to death by a person or persons unknown. The only clue to the mystery is a letter in the pocket of the dead man. But the odd thing is the fact that there wasn't any stamp or address on the envelope, and there wasn't anything on the paper inside. A letter without anything on it? Well, what do you call this story, Nick? The case of the unwritten letter. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson plays Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linex home brighteners, Linex self-polishing wax, Linex cream polish, and Linex clear gloss, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linex dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Dual Broadcasting System. Dual Broadcasting System. Dual Broadcasting System. There is something in any person that makes him more than eager to join a club which has difficult entrance requirements. And the highest form of flattery is to find that your initiation to the club has been tailored to suit your own particular vocation. Thus, if you're a detective and you've been invited to join the exclusive Alphabet Club, your initiation involves the solving 
of a murder. Hello, creeps. This is T4Y, opening the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. We were reading some detective stories last week, trying to cure an annoying case of insomnia. One particular set of tales was interesting enough, had sufficient deductive reasoning so that we thought you, too, would be interested in it. So tonight, we bring you an exciting chapter from the life story of that detective name of Nick Carter. A single light burns brightly down in the basement, deep under the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 5th and 4th, illuminating a small paper target. Twenty yards away, Nick Carter stands, firing methodically. Uh, to the left, about eight feet, eight inches. Try again. Left again. Nine feet, two inches. Nine feet exactly that time. Nick! Hey, Nick! Yes, Patsy? Cease firing. I want to come in. Come ahead. I've just about finished. I've got to close up shop for today. Nick, you'll be late. Patsy, I've won my bet with Sergeant Madison. What bet? I bet him a dollar the Austrian Mauser wouldn't eject a cartridge more than ten feet. I've just fired 50 rounds, and not one cartridge is more than nine and a half feet from the gun. Oh. I win a dollar, and Jansen is cleared of the murder charge, which proves that he couldn't have done it. Personally, I think... Uh-huh. I was waiting for you to notice. Evening gown, huh? Well, Miss Bowen, you look most charming. You really think so, Nick? May I ask where you're going tonight? Out. With you? With me. Please, Harry, Nick will be late. Well, wait, for what? Don't tell me you've forgotten. And you were so anxious to go and let it came. Honestly, Nick, sometimes I believe you're not human. Now hurry and get into your dinner clothes. I'll explain on the way over. Well, Patsy, where are we going? To a murder. All right, all right. You can stop kidding me now. <laughs> I remembered, Patsy. I was so wrapped up in that ballistics work, it slipped my mind. You sure? I'll recite it like a lesson. I've been invited to join the famous Alphabet Club, the most exclusive gathering of eminent talents in the country, right? Right. Incidentally, why is it called the Alphabet Club, Nick? Well, the first letters of the names of the charter members are the first four letters of the alphabet. Arnold Archer. The financier. Mm -hmm. Nelson Burns, the architect. Walter Crane, the boy wonder engineer. And George Dennis, the attorney. Oh. Now, incidentally, they're not only the charter members, they're the initiating committee, too. They're the ones who are going to put me through the ropes before the rest of the club arrive for dinner. Oh, that initiation sounds a cute idea. Yes, in fact, rather tickles me. Staging a make-believe murder. They swear I'll never be able to break it. Challenging the mastermind, eh? That, that's the club over there. You can park in front. Right on. We're just about on time. Oh, please hurry, Nick. <laughs> I saw Burns the other day. He swore they'd cooked up a beauty. You know, I'm really intrigued. Yes, please. Miss Bowen and Mr. Carter. Oh, yes. Good evening, madam. Good evening, sir. Welcome to the Alphabet Club. Thank you. The members are waiting in the lounge room. Will you follow me, please? Could I join too, Nick? No, Patsy. They don't admit women. But they asked me to bring you along because they said they knew I worked with you on my cases. Mm, pretty swank place, isn't it, Nick? I wonder how much the club dues are. Right here, sir. Uh, just one moment, please. Gentlemen, Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen. Ah! Well, for the love of... Ah! Gentlemen, gentlemen, open the door, please. <laughs> Mr. Archer, Mr. Burns, please open. Mr. Crane, Mr. Dennis. Enter. Enter the house of death. Murder awaits Nick Carter. Golly. It's pitch dark. Watch your step, Patsy. Don't trip on any dead bodies. Ah, what ah, that ah. noise I hear? Sounds like we're in a toy shop. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go down, Miss Bowen. Light, please. Let's have some light water. That's it. Here we are. Oh, golly. <laughs> Who's that lying on the floor? I assume it's Santa Claus. All right, you are. The name of this mystery is Who Killed Santa Claus? 
And if Mr. Carter and Miss Bourne want any dinner, they'd better find out who done it, and quick. Very well, <laughs> gentlemen. I shall begin with the taking of the evidence. My name is Arnold Archer. I love Santa Claus, but today I hate him. Why? Because he brought me this cat pistol. And I really wanted a horn. My name is Nelson Burns. And this horn <laughs> is a sad disappointment to me. I hate Santa Claus. I really wanted the sword he gave Walter Crane. And I wanted the cat pistol he gave Archer. Well, who's Santa Claus? Oh, that's George Dennis. He'll say hello after Mr. Carter finds out who done it. Well, gentlemen, I see you all have a good and sufficient motive for killing Santa Claus. I must now examine our make-believe corpse to discover the method of this brutal, foul, and illegal make-believe murder. Am I a... Patsy. Nick, what is it? Get on the phone. Call Maddie. Get the homicide squad up here fast. Mr. Carter... I'm not joking, Mr. Archer. You'd better call the other members and cancel the dinner. Your make-believe murder has turned real. Dennis has been shot to death. Oh. All right, all right. Now, just a minute. I want to get you guys straight. Who's the corpse, Nick? George Dennis, the lawyer. You remember him, Matty. He was retained as an expert in the Wilner case. Yeah, I got that. Now, which one is Arnold Archer? I am. The financier, Sergeant. Uh, Believe me, Sergeant Matheson, this must be some kind of ghastly mistake. Well, none of us would want to kill Dennis. We were his friends, Sergeant. Of we course. couldn't have any reason to kill him. Oh, you're Burns, huh? Nelson Burns. Yes. And the gentleman over there is Walter Crane. I think this is in pretty bad taste, Carter, and I don't like it. Dennis was killed accidentally, there's no doubt of it. It's pretty cheap to try and turn this into a murder case for the sake of notoriety. Now, listen, why, Wait, I... Mr. Crane, you're positive this was an accident. Why? Well, isn't it obvious? The four of us were alone in this room when the steward knocked on the door. Dennis lay down on the floor, I put out the lights, and Nelson Burns fired off the blanks. Yes. Well, evidently, a round of live ammunition must have gotten mixed up with the blanks. No, no, that's not true. I swear it. Mr. Burns is right. I checked the gun. There are four rimfire blank shells in the chambers. Only four? I see Patsy understands what I mean. Doesn't anyone else? What is this, Nick? When Patsy and I were outside... We heard five shots. Five? Meaning that a fifth shot was fired along with those four blanks. Meaning that one of you three gentlemen took advantage of the make-believe murder to murder George Dennis. Uh -huh. Quiet, uh -huh. gentlemen, please. None of you to leave this room. Matty, get your squad in here. Search these men. Then take this place apart if you have to. I want to find the gun that killed Dennis. Okay, Nick. The murderer wants to save us the trouble. He can talk now. Believe me, gentlemen, this won't be any make-believe search. Nobody have anything to say? All right, Matty. Get going. Right. We're over here, Matty. Comparing yeah. notes. Got anything to offer, Sergeant? Well, uh, let's hear what you've got first. Well, Archer's a famous financier. Worth over a million. Wouldn't kill for money. But... Nelson Burns, same status. Plenty of money... Ditto for Walter Crane. Uh -huh. All four men were pretty close friends at college. Known each other for years. Apparently, they're still friends. Now, that might not be true. People grow apart sometimes. On the other hand, all three are pretty ruthless kind of men. I imagine you have to be tough to make the success they have. And you have to have a certain amount of cold courage to pull off a murder the way this one's been handled. Now, how about the gun? There ain't no gun. What? You heard me, Patsy. There ain't no gun. Nick, we took them guys apart and put them together again. We took the room apart. There ain't but one gun in the place. The one that fired the blank. But that's impossible. <laughs> You're telling me? Nick, we opened every book. We even took the toys apart. No soap. And the gun couldn't have been thrown out the window because there ain't no window. Hmm. Look, it's uh, getting pretty late, Nick, and they're getting kind of sore in there. Do you want me to hold them? I'll tell you what, Matty. Their bedroom's upstairs. They can all go upstairs if they want and try and get some sleep, but they're not to leave the club. Right. And I want a ballistic report of the bullet that killed Dennis as soon as possible. Right. If you want me, I'll be in the kitchen. Yes, what doing? Getting something to eat. And pumping the steward. I'm hungry for food and facts. <laughs> now, this is a man that can cook after my own heart. Thank you, sir. Mm, me too. I'll take lessons from you any day. Thank you, ma'am. Too bad a dinner like this had to be wasted. Oh, it's not the dinner I mind, sir. It's the fact that your joining the club was so... so... Inauspicious? 
The very word, sir. You think they'll take me in anyway, despite what happened tonight? Why, of course, sir. I'm sure the gentlemen are still anxious to have the famous Nick Carter as a member. Even what it means, the famous Nick Carter has become merely an infamous detective accusing the members of murder? I'm sure it was an accident, sir. You think a live shell might have gotten mixed up with the blanks? Yes, sir. I see. Steward, do you know who loaded the gun? It was Mr. Crane, sir. The engineer? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Crane always plans our little festivities, sir. He planned the entire initiation tonight. Talking about it all week, he was, sir. I used to see him late at night, thinking it over in the lounge, chuckling to himself. Was it his gun? Yes, sir. I see. Well, thanks very much, Stuart. Both for the excellent food and for the information. Especially the food. Come on, Betty. Mm-hmm. I think I'd like to go upstairs and have a few words with Crane. Yes. Do you think Crane... No, no, Betsy. Certainly, he's a likely prospect. I didn't like the way he kept insisting it was an accident. What I don't like is the fact that Walter Crane, engineer, gentleman with a calculating and mechanical frame of mind, gentleman who loaded the gun himself, failed to notice an extra shot was fired. Yes. That's no initiation. Come on, upstairs, quick. Hey, Nick, you hear that? Can't come upstairs, Maddie. Come quick. Sounded like Crane to me. Nick, this might be a trap to get us up here. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, this is Crane's room right here. Glory be. It's Crane, all right. Dead on the floor. With a toy sword in his heart. Well, heaven's sakes, Carter, what is it? Who screamed? All right, all right. Don't park here. This ain't no Coney Island peep show. But, Carter, it's, it's there, Crane. He's what do you guys have... think this is, a reunion? Go on, get out of here. Go on back to your Just room. Just a minute, Matty. I want to ask a couple of questions. Okay. Mr. Archer, where were you when you heard Crane scream? Well, I just finished bathing. I was in the shower room. I see. That's why you're still carrying a bath towel. Yes. Yeah. And you, Mr. Burns? Well, I was in my room waiting for Archer to finish. I was smoking a cigar at my window. Where's the cigar? I don't know. I I think I dropped it out the window when I heard Crane yell. Now I get one of you men to check that. Right. Be back in a flash. Well, let's have a look at that sword. May I borrow your towel a moment, Archer? Certainly. I don't want to smudge any prints that might be on it. You are? Thanks. Let's wrap this towel around it. Mr. Carter, surely you don't think I... You what, Mr. Burns? Well, merely because I said in jest that I wanted Crane's toy sword during the make-believe murder. You don't think I... that I killed Crane with it? Deductive reasoning isn't that obvious, Mr. Burns. You have nothing to worry about on that count. Thank you. But both of you have plenty to worry about on other counts. No, Mr. Carter. Okay, Joe, you can't... I don't think either of you understand. Two murders have been committed in this club. Someone's guilty. That leaves three suspects. You, Mr. Archer. What? You, Mr. Burns. But I... And the steward. They execute men for murder, gentlemen. Try to understand that. Well, I found the cigar all right, Nick. All right, Matty, thanks. These gentlemen may return to their rooms. All right, gents. Well, Nick, what about Crane? Killed almost instantly, just time enough to scream. Uh Uh-huh. Whoever killed him, he has plenty of power to thrust this dull blade deep enough to penetrate the heart. Any prints on the blade, Nick? I'll take the towel off and look. No. Blade's dry and clean as a mirror. You look at it by reflected light. Not a latent print on it, not even a smudge. Mm. That doesn't help much. Well, I got news. It ain't going to help much more. Yes? They took this slug out of Dennis. Here, look at it. Thanks. Mm. 22, I see. Is it... Wait. Hello. You see, huh? Nick, what is it? No rifling marks on this bullet, Patsy. No rifling marks? No lands or grooves on the slug at all. Now, what's that supposed to mean? The killer threw it at Dennis? That's impossible. We heard the extra shot. Maddie's just being difficult, Patsy. I think Maddie's bad news is the best I've had on this case. Well, now, what's that supposed to mean? It means I think I know where to find the gun that killed Dennis. Come on, Patsy. We're going to have a look at Dennis's house. Well, how in blazes did the gun get there? I didn't say the gun was there. The gun's in this house. Th- then why do you go on to Dennis's place? To find out why it was fired. <laughs> Scrap of paper worth looking at in his desk, Betsy. Well, looks like we'll have to open that safe. Too bad Dennis was a bachelor. No one here to give us the combination. Well, we could wait for a court order to have the safe open, but I don't think we'll bother. Let's have the stethoscope for my bag. Okay, Chief. You gonna crack this crib? Hey, where did you pick up that jargon? From a crime magazine. Here's your scope. Thanks. Well, that magazine must have been 15 years old. Crooks don't talk that way anymore. No? Well, 
How would they describe what you're doing? They'd say that I was exercising a natural facility and delicacy of touch to turn the dial. Meanwhile, using a medical device to hear the tumbler scroll. <laughs> Quiet now. Shouldn't take long. Three job. Three bolt job. What made you go straight, Nick? That patching is a base insinuation. My criminal facility was acquired during a long career of fighting crooks. There we are. All right, let's go through this stuff quickly. Here's Dennis's insurance. $100,000. Bar Association beneficiary. Packages of old letters. Give them. Oh, here's a note from Archer. Offers Dennis $150,000 for the shares of stock Dennis holds in Archer's company. Nice sum. Wait a minute. Here's a will. Oh, let's see. Ah, now, this is very interesting. Mr. Dennis leaves all cash and stock holdings to his old ex-college roommate, John Wendell. Who's John Wendell? John Wendell happens to be the steward of the Alphabet Club. Well. Old college friend, eh? <laughs> Maybe that won't interest Matty. Nick, you think it was Wendell, the steward? He, he killed Dennis for the stock? Hey, wait, let's have a look at that envelope here. Looks like it contains stock shares. It does. It... Nick, there's only one share of stock in here. One single share. Par value, $500. Someone's taken the rest. Just one share, huh? Betsy, hmm. where's that note from Archer you just read me? Here, Nick. Why? Let's see. Oh, for you, $150,000 for... Uh-huh. Betsy, you didn't read this correctly. It says that Archer offers Dennis $150,000 for his share of stock. Dennis only owned the one share. Then... Why should Archer offer him $150,000 for a share of stock worth only $500? You'll find out shortly. Let me have that phone. Oh. Why do you always have to be so mysterious, Nick? I don't like making statements until I'm positive. Alphabet Club. Sergeant Matheson speaking. Maddie, this is Nick. Oh, what'd you find, Nick? I think I found all the answers. Well, Nick, leave me here. Not on the phone. I'm going to demonstrate. Now listen. I'm listening. Get the surviving members out of bed. Yeah? Tell them I've broken the case. Tell them I'm going to reenact the crime for them. Yeah, how? When Patsy and I come to the door, I want the steward to meet us. Then we'll play the make-believe murder all over again, just as it happened. You can take Crane's part. Reenact the make-believe murder? Right. I think you're crazy, Nick. Maybe. But this time, the make-believe murder is going to lead to an honest-to-goodness solution. <laughs> I've got it, Nick. We're going to repeat everything we did earlier this evening. Right. And that repetition means every detail, no matter how small. Right. First, I rang the bell. Yes, sir? Miss Bowen and Mr. Carter. Good good evening, madam. Good evening, sir. Welcome to the Alphabet Club. Hi. I, uh... I think I ask you to follow me, Mr. Carter. Right. Go ahead. All set in there, Matty? Lights out and ready to go. Gentlemen, Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen. Uh, make like I'm screaming, Nick. That was Crane's job. Ah! Go on. Ah! Knock again. Then I said, Gentlemen... Please open the door. Right. And then? Only four shots that time. Happens Burns, open the door. Then what? I said something about entering the house of death. We came in. And heard toys. <laughs> then I told Crane to turn on the light. I'll take care of that. Thanks. I asked who was lying on the floor. And I assumed it was Santa Claus. Then you started explaining, Archer. So explain. The, uh, the name of this mystery is Who Killed Santa Claus? If Mr. Carter wants any dinner, he'd better solve it. Gentlemen, I shall begin with the taking of the evidence. Oh, this is screwy. My my name is Arnold Archer. Today, I hate Santa Claus. Why? Because he brought me this cap pistol. I wanted a horn. My name is Nelson Burns. And this horn... One minute, Mr. Burns. Yes? We left out a detail. Mr. Archer was supposed to snap his cap pistol when he spoke. Go ahead, Mr. Archer. Well, go ahead. Fire that gun, Mr. Archer. You'll never get me. Oh, I'll never get you. Watch out for that toy gun. Glory be, that cap pistol was loaded. 
It fired a real bullet. And that's that my still, Archer. You'll never break away. That, Mary, is the solution of our missing gun. But, Nick, why? The single share of stock Dennis held was the answer. He never owned more than one share of stock, and yet Archer wanted to buy it back for $150,000. $150,000? What for? I'm afraid Mr. Dennis was guilty of an old legal racket. As a stockholder in Archer's firm, he had the right of access to the company's books. You seem to have all the answers, Carter. Yes, he sits through those books until he dug out enough of the evidence of illegal market operations to ruin us. And then offered to sell his share of stock and stockholder's right to bring action back to you for an exorbitant sum. Aha! Uh -huh. Blackmail! Legal blackmail. Mr. Archer, you were afraid Dennis was going to blackmail you for the rest of his life. So you killed him. Which is the final irony of the case. That the make-believe murder was committed with a make-believe gun. <laughs> Nick, I thought Sergeant Matheson checked the toy gun when he searched the room and found nothing wrong with it. That's right, Ken. A point very few people know is the fact that, a, that certain types of cap pistols can fire live ammunition. The bullet is wedged into the barrel through a small hole in the plate that should support the cap. Then the hammer is snapped and discharges the bullet, accurately enough to kill at short range. Sir Archer killed Dennis with the gun and then pretended it was a toy. Right. He disposed of the cartridge by the simple means of swallowing it. I guessed that, and he admitted it. Well, why'd he kill Crane? Because Crane's methodical memory couldn't be fooled. He finally recalled where the extra shot came from. When he called Archer into his room and confronted him, Archer killed him. Said he just grabbed up the toy sword and stabbed. Did you know that before? Well, I had a pretty good idea. On the pretext of protecting fingerprints on the sword, I borrowed Archer's towel. He claimed he'd been bathing, but his towel was quite dry. Didn't even dampen the metal blade. That's right. I remember you mentioned it. I staged the repeat performance to frighten Archer and save us the trouble of a long cross-examination. I knew that Archer, in self-defense, would probably load his toy gun again, hoping to use it to effect an escape. That was what I was playing the scene for. Golly. Pretty clever. That closes... Tonight's story on the Mystery Playhouse. The tale you heard was from the life story of Detective Nick Carter. Now, some interesting notes. This time, and really, we have definite word from mine host of the Playhouse, Peter Laurie by name, remember, that T4Y has lost his lease that, in effect, Mr. Laurie is coming home to roost and expects to be back here among the cobwebs before you have time to recount your points. I wrote and told him we were expecting him. What more can I do, hmm? Now I see it's getting early again. This is T4Y closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Oh, yes. Good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness, a man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, 
The Unwritten Letter, another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated the strange murder of a man who died with a blank letter in his hand and captured a killer through an interview with a corpse. All work and no play makes Jill a tired housekeeper, but any homemaker can have enjoyable leisure time to spend as she likes when she depends on the three great Linux home brighteners, those efficient new shortcuts to the care of woodwork, furniture, and floors. Linux clear gloss, the modern brush-on finish, Linux cream polish for fine furniture, and Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. Yes, the three great Linux home brighteners are the modern way to save household drudgery. They'll do your work in record time and do it with spick and span thoroughness. So start now to enjoy new leisure. Ask your hardware, paint, or department store for the three great Linux home brighteners, the efficient shortcuts to new home beauty. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. Breakfast is over in the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 5th and 4th, and Patsy and Nick are on their way into the master detective study to begin the morning's work, when suddenly... Oh, bother. I might have known there wouldn't be any peace today, just when we need it. Nick Carter's office. Uh, Miss Bowen, Sergeant Matheson. I hope this is a social call, Sergeant. We've got a whole morning's work ahead of us. Yeah? Ask Nick if he'd like to be interrupted. Nick, Sergeant Matheson wants to know if you'd like to have your work interrupted. Ask him for what? For what, Sergeant? I don't think Nick will settle for anything less than murder. Ask him how he'd like to be haunted this morning. Haunted? Yeah. That sounds interesting. Let's have the phone, Patsy. Hello, Matty. Aha. Uh-huh. Gotcha, hey, Nick. What's all this about haunts? Oh, uh, some dame called up this morning from an old loft building down in the village. 23 Blaine Street. She claims she's being haunted. Not at night, mind you, but during the day. Uh-huh. Daytime goes. That's a new one. Yeah, she claims they rumble at her all day long. I'm just on my way down there. You want to come along? For spooks that rumble by day, you bet. Meet you in front of the building in 20 minutes. Right. Bye. Get your hat, Patsy, and put in a call for the car. You and I have a date with a ghost. This is it, Patsy. 23 Blaine. Golly, what an ancient building this is. Looks as if Peter Stuyvesant built it. And there's Mary coming down the street. Oh, good morning, Nick. Morning, Matty. Good morning, Miss Bowen. Hi. So Nick wouldn't settle for anything less than murder, eh? I notice you beat me here. I take it all back, Sergeant. Let's go in and meet the ghost. Who was it called you, Matty? Oh, some dame named Madame Sear. Uh, that's her name there on the letterbox. Madame Sear. Medium. Well, if that isn't the payoff. A medium afraid of ghosts. And in the daytime. Door's locked. Must be a bell button under Madame Sears' nameplate. Ring it, Bessie. Okay, I will. Oh, Nick! It's a little up a piece. Better get in there fast, Matty. Get your shoulder against the door. Uh, go shooting guns uh, together, Nick. Uh, all right, again. What's more, should do it. Careful. Watch out for the debris, Patsy. Right. Come on, Matty. Uh, this isn't turning out to be the scully. What is it, Nick? Hold it. Said I wouldn't settle for anything less than a murder, Bessie, huh? Well, you were right. There's a man on these steps. And he's been shot to death. Quiet, everybody, please. Quiet. Quiet. Matty, I'm not ready to examine the people in this building yet. I want them to be taken to a room and kept there. Right. York, get them out of here. Yes, sir. All right, all of you, get going. Go on, over here. Just follow the detective there. Go on, follow him. Okay, Nick. Now, what's the score? I've searched this man's pockets. His name's Joe Kane. Address and business unspecified. Uh huh. We shot through the chest twice with a 45 caliber slug. Died instantly. Yeah? What do those bruises and scratches on the face mean, Nick? Kane was killed somewhere on the stairs. He dropped and rolled partway down. Anything else? Two clues. One fairly unpromising. The other, very odd. Ah, uh, go ahead. He's got a racing sheet in his pocket. A schedule of some small racetrack in a town upstate. Uh. I've never heard of the place or the horses listed. But then again, Nick... We don't know too much about horse racing. And uh, the odd clue. In Kane's hand was clutched a large blue envelope. 
Right here. Uh-huh. Apparently, the reflex of death made him hold tight. Well, what's odd about that? One thing. There's no address, stamp, or mark on the envelope. There's a sheet of paper inside with nothing written on it. Well, for the love of Pete. An envelope without an address? A letter with nothing written on it? But what does that mean? I wish I knew. But I've got a hunch if we could answer that question, we'd know who killed Joe Kane and why. Well, we know one thing, Nick. It's got to be one of the people in this building. We covered the front door. No one came out while we were going in. That's right. We've already checked the roof. It's sealed shut. No one went out that way. And the back door is bolted on the inside. The windows? All barred with heavy grates. The killer's got to be one of the people inside. Good work, Matty. Now, what about him? Well, there are three floors in this building. Each one is occupied. The first floor, Madame Sear, the ghost fear and medium. The one who called you? Yeah. The second floor, a guy named Charles Dower. Business as yet unspecified. The top floor is Hal Trask. He's a printer. Madam Sear, Charles Dower, Hal Trask. Right. That makes three. Uh, plus the janitor, a guy named Olson, who was sweeping around the upper stairs. I see. All right. Let's go in and have a talk with him. Uh, York's got him in Madam Sear's studio. You going to question him separately, Nick? No. All together. Right. Sometimes when four witnesses gel in a community story, it's easy to break them down later individually. All right, all right. Now, quiet, folks. Quiet, please. Now, this is Nick Carter. He wants to ask you a few questions. We've all seen the dead man. Has any of you ever seen him before? Seen him alive? Either you're afraid to answer or none of you has ever seen him. Now, which is it? You. You're Mr. Olson, aren't you? Yes, sir. Ever seen the dead man before? No, sir. I, I don't see much of anybody in this building, sir. I... That is right, Mr. Carter. We are all quiet. We all value our privacy. Mm. None of us pries into the secrets of strangers. We do not peek at those who walk the stairs. We keep to ourselves. Madam Sear, you telephoned to complain about ghosts this morning? It was a revelation from the other world. I am ashamed of my first fear. I no longer complain. And Mr. Trask? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Printer, sir. Glow Press up on the top floor. I never seen a dead man before, Mr. Carter. I see. Mr. Dower? Yes, sir. Hello. Aren't you bad luck, Charlie Dower? Served two terms in Atlanta, specialist in card marking and tin horn gambling rackets? Well, Mr. Carter. No wonder I... his business was unspecified, Matty. Hey, what a memory you got, Nick. I'd forgotten Dower. He's been out of circulation five years. So here we are. Unknown, Mr. Kane murdered on the steps of this building by one of you four. All of you claim you never saw the man before. And I have the problem of finding which one of you is lying. Well, it's not me. All right, quiet, quiet. Well, what's the program, Nick? All these people that stay inside the building. I want to search for the murder weapon. Although I doubt if you'll find it in an old rat trap like this. It'll stay here, hidden for a hundred years. Yeah, we'll try. I want the squad to check the history of the building and every person in here. We'll do it. Patsy and I are going to take the car and run up to Taunton. We'll be back in a few hours. But right. Why go to Taunton? Because it's the home of the Taunton racetrack. Joe Kane's tip sheet was the schedule of today's races. Maybe we can find out something about murder up there. Just another few minutes, Nick. That sign said Taunton half a mile. All right. Oh, why have you been so glum all the way up here, Nick? I've been mulling over the case, Patsy. I don't like it. What don't you like about it? The whole thing is a phony ring about it. Three crooks, or semi-crooks, all operating in that building. All probably lying as hard as they can. Yes? How did Kane get into the building? The door was locked when we tried it. Either he rang one of the bells, which means the tenants were lying, or he had a key, which means Olson, the janitor, was lying. That's true. In the second place, what about that blue envelope containing an unwritten letter? Why was Kane carrying it? But... Invisible ink, maybe. Secret message. Carried so that we jump to that obvious conclusion? No, no, no. I doubt it, Patsy. Uh oh, slow down. Here's Taunton. We'll go through it before we see it. Seems pretty quiet for a racetrack town. Uh huh. I haven't seen anything faintly resembling a track. I better ask that youngster over there. Hi, Sonny. Oh, hi there. Yes, you, son. Come over here a minute, will you? Oh, yes, sir, mister. What's on your mind? Which way to the racetrack? Uh, the which? The racetrack. The Taunton racetrack. I don't know what you're talking about, lady. You live here long? All my life. Here. Take a look at this. 
Harden Racetrack. Handicap race. He missed you. This is some kind of a gag. There ain't no track in Taunton. We never had a race in this town. You're being taken for an awful ride by someone. You're telling us. Nick, this is weird. Thanks, son. Let's get back to the city, Betsy. True enough, we've been taken for a ride. And believe me, it's carried us miles closer to the solution of this case. <laughs> Nick, I wish you'd explain. Oh, don't act so mysterious. I'll explain soon, Patsy. But I want to hear now. You will, just as soon as I've spoken to Maddie. And ask the janitor a few questions. All right, here we are, 23 Blaine. I hope Maddie's inside. Come on. Oh, Nick. Sometimes you can be so aggravating. Patience, Patsy. <sighs> Come on inside. Nick! Oh, for Pete's sake... Am I glad you're back? You got a fresh lead, Matty? Fresh lead? Fresh trouble? That's what I got. Well, I'll iron it out as soon as I've spoken to Olson, the janitor. Olson's my trouble, Nick. He's just committed suicide. An unwritten letter. A non-existent horse race. And now the suicide of a key witness. How will Nick straighten out this tangle of events? We'll see in just a moment. The up-to-date way of doing a thing is usually the best way. And you certainly find that's the case when you beautify your floors in linoleum with Linex Self-Polishing Wax, the modern way to perfect floor care. One practical test is all you need to know that here is a quick-drying wax which is really different. Linex Self-Polishing Wax, made from a new formula, was developed by leading research chemists to give new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance to all your floors. And Linex self-polishing wax contains the greatest possible amount of real carnauba wax for that handsome, satiny finish only real wax can give. What's more, the underwriters' laboratories have proved by test that any linoleum, hardwood, or rubber tile floor is actually less slippery after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied. Best of all, Linex self-polishing wax takes only a jiffy to use, for you simply wipe it on without tiresome rubbing and it dries quickly to a beautiful luster that's a joy to behold. So choose genuine Linex self-polishing wax, one of the finest products of its kind. Ask your dealer now for all three great Linex home brighteners to give your home new beauty the easy Linex way. And now back to our story. A complaint about a haunted loft building brought Nick Carter, Patsy, and Sergeant Matheson down to an ancient office building in time to hear, but not witness, the murder of Joe Kane. Curious clue to the murder was an unwritten letter in the dead man's hand and a racetrack program for a non-existent race. Then the janitor of the building, Sergeant Matheson announces, suddenly has committed suicide. Now Nick, Patsy, and the sergeant examine the dead body. It's pretty careless of you, Matty. Oh, honest, Nick, how was I to know? I was down in the cellar with the squad looking for the murder gun. When all of a sudden we hear the shot. We never thought that You'll Olson find would... the weapon in Olson's hand. Yes, I understand. Well, five will get you ten. This is the gun that killed Kane. But why should Olson kill himself? Yeah, probably thought we were hot on his trail. Maybe, but I'm not so sure Olson did kill himself. What? Why not? To Pat, to convenience. I've worked on thousands of cases, Matty. I never yet had a killer give up so easily. But it looks legit, Nick. Bullet wound in the right temple, gun in the right hand. I happen to know Olson was right-hander because I saw him sweeping. There are powder burns around the wound. The gun was fired at close range. Why, the body looks as though it had fallen naturally. Maybe, but I doubt it. I'm going to take the gun back to my lab for a quick check. Mm. Have a man send over the fingerprints for the entire crowd here, Matty. Right. Oh, uh, any of those reports come in yet about the building and the people? I expect them any minute now. Wait here for me when you get them. That's it. I'll be back in half an hour. All right. Oh, and by the way, Matty. Yes, Nick. How much would you like to bet that Olson never was janitor of this building? Oh, no. All right, Patsy. There you are. Every print on this gun, dusted and brought up. And all of them sharp and clear as crystal. Now what? Now we compare. Let's have that sheet Matty sent over. Um. Here you are. Thanks. What are you looking for, Nick? Oh, I found it already. Just checking to make sure. Found what? Oh, don't be so mysterious, Nick. Look for yourself, Patsy. Every print on this gun belongs to Wilson. You can't miss it. 
Yes, I see, Nick. Well, doesn't that prove suicide? Think hard, Betsy. What happens when you shoot a forty-five automatic? Why, uh, but... Uh, it fires a bullet. And then what happens to the gun? Uh, it stays in your hand, I guess. Gently, quietly, without a fuss? Oh, no, no, it, it kicks. Exactly. And would you explain why Olson's prints on the gun are sharp and clear as crystal? Oh. Obviously, if he'd held the gun and shot himself, his prints would have been smudged and smeared by the recoil. But they aren't. Nick. Uh-huh, you get it now, huh? Olson was murdered by the same person who killed Joe Kane. Then the gun was wiped clean and carefully placed in Olson's hand. That's why the prints are so clear. Oh, that just mixes the case up more than ever. Oh, no, Patsy. It's becoming clearer than ever. Let's hustle back to Maddie. I only hope there haven't been any more murders while we were gone. All right, Maddie, we're back. Oh, Nick. Hey, Nick, you're fantastic. How did you know, man? How did you know? About the murder? No, 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 about Olson. Reports just come in. You were right. He was lying. He wasn't the janitor of this building. Golly. The janitor of this place is a guy up on the corner. He takes care of this whole row of buildings. Then everybody in here was lying when they accepted him as the janitor. I don't think so. This is a dark little place. And the real janitor probably doesn't spend more than a few minutes a week here. Yeah, just about. They're all pretty careless. The few times he was seen wasn't enough to make an impression. So when Olson said he was a janitor, he was accepted. But the killer? The killer was lying, naturally. Oh. Hey, wait a minute, Nick. How did Olson get in here? Oh, Joe Kane let him in. Joe Kane? The dead man? Yes. When? Probably a few seconds before we arrived. Olson followed Kane into the building. Uh-huh. How did Kane get in? Pretty sure Kane let himself in. How? With a key. Nick, you sound as though you got the whole business washed up and finished. Think I'm pretty close to it. You know why Kane carried that blank letter? I do. And about the non-existent horse race? Yes. And why Olson killed himself? He was murdered, and I think I know why. Well, then would you please talk? One more little test, Maddie, and the murderer will talk in person. Well, what's the test? We've got three people left. Madam Sear, Trask the printer, and Dower the gambler. Yeah. All of them claim they don't know Joe Kane. Well, one of them's lying, and I want to find out which. How? I'm going to make some arrangements with Patsy. And then we're going to meet around Madame Sears' crystal globe, all of us. Holy smoke. More ghost stuff, so to speak. The body of Joe Kane is going to walk into the room, and we'll see who recognizes it. Oh, but that's silly, Nick. They all saw Kane's body. There's a tremendous difference between recognizing a living man and a dead body, Betsy. Totally dissimilar people look identical when they're dead. We've had hundreds of cases of husbands identifying dead strangers as their wives in the morgue. Mm-hmm, and vice versa. It's, it's true, Patsy. I see Nick's point. Now, those suspects who really don't know Kane will not recognize a living imitation after having seen the body only once. But those who knew him... I get it. I get it. Then let's get moving. We'll meet the dead body at seven tonight. Gather together in Madame Sears' studio for a last attempt to solve this murder. You do well to trust the world of the medium, Mr. Carter. It is capable of miracles far beyond your mere earthly efforts. Uh, quite. I've requested Sergeant Matheson to have present the only surviving occupants of this building. Mr. Trask, Mr. Dower, and Madame Sear, of course. Miss Bowen, my secretary, will act as witness. Sergeant Matheson will preside. <coughs> and I'll ask the question. Will you all be seated, please? Everybody down, folks. Come on. I presume you work best with the crystal in the dark, Madam Sue. Oh, that is correct. Lights out, please, Maddie. Right. Thank you. And now, Madam Sue, with your help, we will try to recreate the murder scene in the magic crystal. First, there must be silence. And silence you shall have. The crystal is cloudy tonight. There is much antagonism in this room. The veil can be parted... Only with difficulty. Ah. Now the clouds begin to vanish from the glass. I see faint lights. Faint forms swirling in the blackness. I see a figure. 
It is a man. It is the dead one. He walks through night followed by shadows. There is one shadow I see with a gun. <gasps> Sergeant Madison, I, 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 I hear it again. The, the spirit's talking. Oh, for the love of Pete. Do, do you hear it? All right, the groaning and the rumbling of the dead. And this right, is what made you telephone this morning? In heaven's name, protect me. You hear it, don't you? You hear it? Wait, listen. Someone's coming to the door. It is the other world coming to us. In the name of heaven, do not let that thing in here. <gasps> it's Joe Kane. The dead man. Yes, Joe Kane, all right. I thought he was killed. And that, ladies and gentlemen, winds up the seance in our case. Lights, please, Maddie. Right. Well, oh, but you... No excitement, please. Quiet. The show's over. But I was... Sit down, Madam Sear, please be calm. Uh... It's not Joe Kane. Merely an actor, appropriately costumed and made up. Nick, they both recognized him. They were both lying. Madam Sear and Mr. Dower. Trask never batted an eyelash. He told the truth. Yes, Patsy. And I might add... It's because Mr. Hal Trask told the truth about not knowing Joe Kane that he'll be executed for his murder. You'll never prove it, Maddie. Oh, no, you don't, brother. It's a very oh. clever crime, Mr. Trask, and for an unusual racket. Yes, Patsy, you were right. Trask told the truth. He did not know Crane. Dower and Madam Sear lied. They knew him. They'd seen him in the building frequently. But they didn't know he ran the Globe print shop upstairs. Yeah, we, we figured it'd be better to say we never saw him before. Naturally. Both of you are afraid of the police. Try to keep clear of murder by lying. You didn't know that Joe Kane's racket was printing phony programs of non-existent horse races and that he used these to induce innocent victims to book bets with him, bets which he pocketed and disappeared with. You're right, Connor. Kane had a hot racket. We heard about the dough he was making. It was a good thing. So good that you and Olsen decided to come up and acquire a piece of his money. A big piece. Only Olsen acquired nothing but death. And you've acquired a one-way trip to the chair. In just a few minutes, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and tell you why the murdered man carried an unwritten letter. Dust, finger marks, and accumulated polish all are likely to make furniture look dull and cloudy. So naturally, the first step in furniture care is to remove that cloudiness and then give your furniture a beauty treatment with the finest polish you can find. Well, Linex Cream Polish for Fine Furniture does the whole job at once. Yes, that's right. Linex Cream Polish cleans as it polishes. That means you cut the job in two, save half the time, half the work. That's why so many thousands of modern American women are swinging to Linex Cream Polish, which cares for household things the easy way. See that your fine furniture keeps its good looks with Linex Cream Polish, which restores its original gleaming beauty in one simple process. Because Linex Cream Polish dries hard, it even cuts down future work or it leaves no oil on the surface to attract more dust. So make it a point to use Linex Cream Polish, which cleans as it polishes. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners, Linex Cream Polish, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, and Linex Clear Gloss, the longer-lasting brush-on finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that brings quick new sparkle to walls and ceilings. Chemtone covers in one coat, dries in one hour. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, I understand the motive for Joe Kane's murder, but what about that unwritten letter? Well, get the picture, Ken. Trask and Olson decided to rob Joe Kane. They'd heard he was making a fortune out of his racetrack fraud, and they wanted a piece of it. But neither of them knew him. So? Obviously, they couldn't take a chance of Kane arriving in his office while they were rifling the place. So Olson remained downstairs to watch, while Trask went up to rob. But how could Olson watch for Kane if he didn't know him? By a simple thug's trick. He placed a large blue envelope in the Globe Print Shop letterbox. All he had to do was watch that. He knew whoever took the blue envelope out of the letterbox would be Joe Kane. Well, that's oh. clever enough. When Kane arrived and picked up his letter, Olson quickly followed him into the building, first signaling upstairs on the buzzer to Trask. Olson followed in case Trask couldn't get away in time. And evidently he couldn't. Right. Kane saw Trask leaving his office. He pulled a gun, the forty-five automatic. Olson closed in from behind. Kane was killed and rolled down the steps. I doubt if Trask ever got a really good look at Kane. Then, as we pounded on the door below, he thought quickly. Trask pretended to be the proprietor of the print shop. Olson grabbed a broom and played janitor. 
golly. But later, Trask realized Olson's pose would be uncovered. So the first chance he had, he murdered his partner to keep him quiet. He tried to get rid of the gun by planning it as a suicide weapon. But uh, how about the ghosts that Madame Sear thought she heard? We heard them, too, when you kidded her into staging a seance. Well, that's the strangest thing about the case. If it hadn't been for Madame Sear's ghost, we'd never have entered the case and never have broken it. And if it hadn't been for the ghost, there wouldn't have been a case in the first place. Why not? Because Madame Sears' ghost was the distant rumble of a new printing machine Joe Kane had just had installed so he could print more of his phony race sheets. I had an officer turn it on to haunt the seance. Well, Nick, I hope you have as exciting a story for us next week. What's it going to be? Well, Ken, next week we're going to meet the champion apple pie maker of the East, who, fortunately for me, also happens to be an old friend of mine. She came to complain that her landlord papered her walls without her permission. Unfortunately, when we arrived, we discovered that the paper hanger had not only hung the wallpaper, he'd hung himself. Sounds like a strange story. What do you call it, Nick? The Case of the Hanging Paper Hanger. And now an important message from Nick Carter. Remember what happened after World War I? Inflation and the boom period, then the crash, and the worst depression America has ever known. Now let's not permit that to happen again. Let's resolve to buy only what we need, paying ration points in full, paying no more than ceiling price. Let's resolve not to profiteer on our own services or produce. And let's buy and keep war bonds to protect America's future and our own. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson plays Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linex Self-Polishing Wax, Linex Cream Polish, and Linex Clear Gloss, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linex dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Hanging Paper Hanger. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated the strange case of a landlord who decorated an old lady's apartment against her will, and how a broken perfume bottle caught a murderer. August means dog days, and dog days mean heat. But you can have plenty of time for cool, leisurely relaxation when you do your homemaking the easy Linux way. 
Just follow the example of wise American homemakers everywhere who have learned the magic shortcut to household care. Those three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, the modern brush-on finish. Linux cream polish for fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. Start now to enjoy extra relaxation every day. Enjoy that added leisure in a home that's sparkling with bright new beauty. Just ask your hardware, paint, or department store for the three great Linux home brighteners. And save time the easy Linux way. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. It's been a busy day in the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 5th and 4th, and Nick and Patsy are deep in consultation on a new method of blood classification when there's an urgent ring on the doorbell. Patsy answers it and ushers in a little gray lady, very nervous and very frightened. Look, Nick, we have a guest for lunch, Nick. This lady says she's an old friend of yours. Well, I, I don't know whether you'll recollect me, Mr. Carter. Now, you're a great and famous man. Remember you? Why, of course I do. How are you, Mrs. Nelson? It's been ages oh, since we've seen you. Now, you do remember. It's been ten years since I cooked for him, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Now, this is my secretary, Patsy Bowen. Uh, how do you do? Mrs. Oh. Nelson's the greatest apple pie baker in the East. Oh, mm. Thank you kindly, Mr. Carter. Well, what can I do for you, Mrs. Nelson? Oh, well, sir, I... Oh, it's a funny thing. Uh, I've got a job now over at the Maxwell Manufacturing Plant. I clean up nights. Uh-huh. So I live near as I can to the plant to save traveling time, you see. And, oh, it's a very nice little boarding house, and a very nice man runs it, Mr. Harrow. Now, I didn't have any complaints until now. Well, what's happened, Mrs. Nelson? Well, you see, it's like this, uh, I like a bit of color in my room, so I pasted things on the wall. All kinds of bright ribbon, bright labels, and colored pictures. It makes a kind of patchwork quilt, you see. Oh, must be very pleasant. Oh, it was, Mr. Carter, until yesterday. Mr. Harrow, my landlord, is a paper hanger by profession. And yesterday I come home from work to find that he'd papered the whole room with new wallpaper. He, he just covered over everything. And... You didn't know he was going to do it? Oh, no, sir. It come as an awful shock. I says to him, I says, Mr. Harrow, you take that paper off. I want my own decorations back. And he says, Mrs. Nelson, you got wallpaper free, gratis, and for nothing. And you just be grateful. He didn't paper any other room in the house? Oh, no, sir, no. About how big a room do you have? Oh, a midland-sized room, sir. So you're upset because you've lost your own decorations... And you want to know why a landlord should paper your wall without you even asking for it? Oh, it's worse than that, sir. Oh? I know why he won't take that paper off. There's code on it, that's what. And he's a spy, that's what he is, Mr. Carter. And that's why I've come to you. Ah, I see. Well, Mrs. Nelson, we can't let an old friend down. We'll go right out with you and investigate this coated wallpaper. Oh, thank you, sir. And even if there are no spies involved, we'll see if we can't get your old decorations back. Nothing's too good for the champion apple pie baker of the East. So this is the free, gratis, and for nothing wallpaper, huh? Oh, it's very nice, Mrs. Nelson. No, I'm not denying that, miss. All I'm saying is I don't want it here. Well, now, let's see that code you spoke about. Oh, right on the border, sir. You see, there's a squiggly line with dots and dashes around it, and I thought ah, that... Ah, yes, yes, I see. Why, well, that's see. just a conventional design, Nick. It's repeated over and over. It couldn't be code. Yes, I'm afraid Patsy's right. Spy angle is out, Mrs. Nelson. Oh. And the other question isn't answered. Why did the landlord suddenly give you a new wallpaper for no apparent reason? Well, I don't know, sir. Maybe there was something valuable on the wall that he wanted. Perhaps. Exactly what did you use to decorate your walls with, Mrs. Nelson? Well, like I said, sir, old calendars and labels and ribbons. Any old shares of stock? Oh, now, what would I be doing with stock shares, miss? Here, here, I've got some stuff saved up that I was going to use. I'll show it to you. Right in my closet, you can see for yourself. It wasn't anything. 
Unquestionably dead. Patsy? It's me, Nick. I've got Mrs. Nelson down in the sitting room. She's feeling a little better. Golly, what a mess. Yes. She begged me not to send for the police. She's afraid if she gets mixed up in a police case, she'll never get another job. But you've got to call the police in on a suicide, don't you? We're not going to call in the police. And this wasn't suicide. Me? Look here, Patsy. Harrow apparently hung himself from this hook high up at the closet wall, right? Yes. How did he get there? Well, uh, he stood on that clothes hamper under his feet, tied the knot around his neck into the hook, and then hung himself. Then how do you account for the fact that the clothes hamper is 15 inches under his dangling feet? Oh. What did he do? Jump up, pull himself up? Impossible. And it's murder. With a capital M. Oh, Nick, we'd better call in the police. And just about ruin everything for Mrs. Nelson? <laughs> what did an officer of Sergeant Matheson's caliber say when he found a man murdered in Mrs. Nelson's room after they'd had a fight about wallpaper? Oh, yes. And he'd have no choice but to lock her up and hold her on suspicion of murder. Exactly. I said I'd do Mrs. Nelson a favor, and I will. I'll crack this case with a minimum of trouble for her. I don't like it, Nick, but... Well, what do we do? Well, look here, Patsy. You can't miss the connection. The murder's tied up with the wallpaper. Well, that's right. The only trouble is, what's the wallpaper tied up with? Something on the wall. Okay. Run your fingers along the wall. Uh-huh. Feel the lumpy pattern of Mrs. Nelson's decorations under the paper. Mm. Mr. Harrow did not put up that paper to steal anything from underneath. Then why did he? The obvious answer, to conceal something. Conceal what? But I'd like to find out. Come on down to Harrow's rooms. Mrs. Nelson said it was in the back of the house. Probably find his paper hanging equipment there. And then what? Then we're going to rip this paper off the wall. The guy was Harrow anyway. Six bottles of perfume. All brand new. And expensive. You don't buy any one of them for less than $60. Hmm. For $300 worth of perfume in the room of a boarding house landlord. Yeah. This is beginning to get curiouser and curiouser as Allison was. Stop. Stop. Behind the bed. He shut out the light. Quiet, quiet. Do you hear that? Bottles. It was the killer, and he came after the perfume bottle. Come on. Where? Out the front door. Quick. Mm. Okay. okay. All right, wise guy. All right. You want to... Ah. Well, well. Mr. Nick Carter and company. Sergeant Matheson. Hiya, Matty. Just in time. Did you see a man come out before us? Quick. Just in Where time for a... what? The murder? Oh, you know about that. Know about it? What do you think I'm not doing out here? Listen, Matty, we've got to work fast. The killer is... Never mind one... the fast talk, Nick. I want a couple of quiet words with you. You know why I came out here? I'm listening impatiently. I get a call ten minutes ago. A guy by the name of Harrow just bumped off. That's right. And the call said he was bumped off by none other than Nick Carter himself. Oh, holy oh that's absurd, Sergeant. You can't think that Nick... Now, ever... listen, Patsy. I'm not saying I believe Nick killed anybody. But you better explain how he neglected to notify homicide as soon as he found the body. That's a criminal offense in this city. I'll explain in a few minutes, Matty. Come on in the sitting room. Oh, more tricks, huh? You pulled some fast ones on me in your time, Nick. Now, listen, this is gospel. There's a little old lady in there, a friend of mine, named Mrs. Nelson. Yeah? She'll explain how Patsy and I came into this case. Okay, okay. Mrs. Nelson, we're sorry to bother you, but... Nick. Well, the place is empty. Where's the old lady you're going to produce? Mrs. Nelson! Mrs. Nelson! Never mind Mrs. shouting, Patsy. I'm afraid Mrs. Nelson's gone. And from the look in Maddie's eyes, I'm afraid we're in a jam. <laughs> A 
murder committed because of wallpaper, a killer who steals perfume bottles, and a disappearing witness. How is Nick going to straighten this out with Sergeant Matheson barking over his shoulder? We'll see in just a moment. There's an old saying that if you want something done well, it's best to do it yourself. But nowadays, the truth is this. When you want your floors and linoleum to have perfect care, let Linex Self-Polishing Wax do the job. You see, Linex Self-Polishing Wax is completely new, developed by leading research chemists to give you the finest, as you'll prove for yourself in one quick home test. Apply Linex Self-Polishing Wax to any hardwood, linoleum, or rubber tile floor. It takes just a jiffy to wipe on and dries without tiresome rubbing to a handsome luster that lasts and lasts. First, you'll notice the satiny beauty that only real wax can give. Second, when you step on that floor, you'll learn why Linex self-polishing wax is called the anti-skid finish, or your floor is less slippery than it was to begin with. This fact has been proved by the underwriter's laboratories. And third, you'll be delighted with the way the finish lasts, for Linex self-polishing wax has the highest possible content of genuine carnauba wax. There's no doubt about it. Linex self-polishing wax is well worth trying. Once you've tried it, you'll follow the example of all the wise American homemakers who use it regularly. Ask your dealer now for Linex self-polishing wax for all three great Linex home brightness, the modern shortcuts to household care. Now, back to our story. Investigating the strange complaint of Mrs. Nelson that her landlord has papered the walls of her room against her wishes, Nick discovers the landlord murdered. In the dead man's bedroom, Nick finds six bottles of expensive perfume, which are stolen by the killer in a daring attack. Nick's pursuit of the killer is stopped by Sergeant Matheson, who arrives after an anonymous call told him of the murder and accused Nick. But when Nick tried to produce Mrs. Nelson to prove his story, she vanished. Now Nick, Patsy, and Matty meet in the front hall after searching the house. Ah, uh, it's no use, Nick. We've been through the house from top to bottom. It's empty. Which means I'm accused of the murder and kidnapping, huh? Now, I won't say that. I know you're no crook. But I wouldn't put it past you to hijack a witness if you thought it would help you to solve the case. Not this time, Matty. Well, where in places is she? Probably in the hands of the killer. Probably grabbed her after we ducked into Harrow's bedroom under our noses and grabbed the perfume. Hey, what's all this about perfume and wallpaper? What's the connection, Nick? You're the policeman, Matty. I'm just an ordinary citizen. Now, 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 don't take it that way, Nick. I never said you weren't useful. Now and then, I just All right, Matty, o- just my little joke. Now, here's the setup. The murderer killed Harrow and tried to frame the death as a suicide in Mrs. Nelson's room. Right. Evidently, the killer wanted to silence Harrow. About what? About why Harrow papered Mrs. Nelson's wall. So there is something hidden on the wall. There is. Something tied up with the bottles of perfume stolen from Harrow's room. The killer probably ducked out the back way with the bottles in Mrs. Nelson. We better get up to Mrs. Nelson's room and get that wallpaper down. Right. Get, yeah, hold it. Someone at the front door. Looks like a man. Stand by. Hiya, brother. Uh, hey, what are you... Mr. Spieler Wilson, isn't it? The best pitch man in the city. Sidewalk spiels and sales a specialty. What are you doing here, Spieler? Oh, gee, Sergeant, you give me a scare for a minute. I ain't doing nothing here I oughtn't. I live here. You live here? How interesting. Matty. Yeah? Suppose you have somebody get that wallpaper off Mrs. Nelson's walls. Right. Just put on so recently that you should get it off without disturbing what's underneath it. Okay, Nick. And Spieler, suppose we go up to your room. I want to talk to you about a murder. Sir, just what do you know about the lady who lives next door? Yeah, Mrs. Nelson? Ah, we've been pals over a year. I got her a job. Over at the Maxwell plant? Yeah. That doesn't make sense, Spieler. Mrs. Nelson said she moved in here to be near a job to save traveling time. I was sure it makes sense. I didn't say I didn't know her before she moved in. I got her the job and got her to live here. You know anything more about her? How she spent her time? Well, not much. She cleaned up in the plant from six to midnight, come home around one, didn't usually get up till ten. Used to hang around the house mostly. Hey, Dick. 
Come on in. We got most of the paper off. Coming, Matty. One last question, Spieler. What did you have in that satchel you were carrying when you came in? Mind if I have a look? Uh, no, Mr. Carney, but well, it wouldn't interest you. It, it's just the stuff I've been pitching on the streets these days. Ah, wouldn't interest me, would it? Look here, Patsy. Golly. Bottles and bottles of perfume. <laughs> I got most of the paper off, Nick. Oh, what a job that was. Uh, incidentally, uh, what did you get out of Spieler? A few interesting facts. Most interesting is the fact that he's pitching perfume these days. Well, for the lover... What, didn't the killer steal perfume from Harrah's room? Yes. Then what are we waiting for? Some real evidence. Not enough, Matty. Uh -huh. a coincidence. Have one of your men tail, Wilson. For yes, but Nick... Listen, you... Matty, you don't seem to understand. I want to break this case, and I want to do it before Mrs. Nelson's hurt. He's been taken by the killer. That means he isn't ready to kill her yet, but he may make up his mind soon. We've got to get her before that. Yeah, how? Well, let's look at these walls. It's obvious. Some clue here that points to the killer. We've got to find it. Okay. Plenty of calendar scenes. Lots of colored paper. <laughs> Mrs. Nelson had a rather gaudy taste. Oh, call it bright. Hello. Here are labels. These look like hat box designs. Some over here look like drug labels. Drugs? Narcotics? Maybe. Only here's something that's a lot more interesting. Patsy. Mm hmm. Remember the name of the perfume stolen from Harrow's room? Yes, it was Paris's Danger. And the name of the perfume Spieler is selling? Paris's Exotic. And here are labels, all from the Paris firm. Exotic, danger, nuance, and so on. So what? Why did Mrs. Nelson get hold of them? Well, she she bought them, or she picked them up somewhere, or... She, she didn't could... buy them. You can't buy exclusive firm labels. And she didn't pick this many up just somewhere. Where would you find 50 perfume labels all at once? Well, uh, maybe she got them off of old perfume bottles. Best suggestion so far. Only one hits, Patsy. And the material Mrs. Nelson had in her closet for decorating her walls are ten more perfume labels, and they're all brand new. The mucilage on the backs is fresh and untouched. Well, for the love of Pete, Nick, what's it mean? It means Patsy and I are going down to the Paris company and find out where their labels are made. There's got to be a tie-in between them and murder. <laughs> Announce you wish to speak with me on matter of business? Uh, yes, I am at your service. Very kind of you, Madame Paris. You are Madame Paris. Uh, oui? Let me introduce myself. I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Miss Patsy Bowen. Oh, it is great pleasure to meet you, Monsieur Carter. I... Uh, did you say Nick Carter? The Nick Carter? That's right. Careful, Madame Paris. Your accent showing. Oh, never mind the phony accent. That's for the customers. What's on your mind, Mr. Carter? It's a case of murder. And I think you may be able to tell me something that'll help. Anything. Anything you say. Paris Incorporated is a pretty big outfit. One of the biggest cosmetic manufacturers in the world. Do you manufacture all your products yourself? We do. How about the containers? Oh, we make those too. Who does the packing and handling? We do. Print your own labels? Design and print them ourselves. But I don't see what this has got to do with murder. A murder has been committed. And I think it centers around some of your products. Will you tell me where this particular perfume label is designed and printed? Let's see. Oh, exotic. Oh, that's a funny thing, Mr. Carter. What's funny? We gave up that line more than a year ago. I'd say we haven't manufactured any of these labels in over a year. Very interesting. Would there be any stock on hand? Any place in the city where they could be obtained? Oh, Mr. Carter, exclusive labels are like money. You keep them in a safe. There aren't any of these in stock. And if there were, they wouldn't be where anyone could get hold of them. For Pete's sake, Nick, will you explain where Quiet, Patsy. All right, thanks a lot, Madam Paris. We won't trouble you anymore. Oh, it's been a pleasure. 
Bonsoir, Monsieur Carter, Mademoiselle Bond. It has been a pleasure. Let me know if you apprehend this murderer. I will name a perfume after the case. Killer by Paris. <laughs> This is awful. Looks like we aren't going to get anywhere with this case. You're wrong, Patsy. Hmm? Get into the car. You mean you found something? Even though Madame Paris said... Madame Paris said plenty. Get in. Oh, we oh, For the love of Pete, again. That car that just drove off. I know. Get in quick. Mm-hmm. Keep your eye on him. He's the killer? After us? Yes. Can you still see the car? Yes, it's up ahead. Turning into that side street. What's the license number? Get it down. Oh, I can't see it. He spattered it with mud. Hold on. We're making the turn after him. Okay. See him? I think so. He's turning again up ahead. We'll get him. Nick. Oh, no correction. He oh. got us. Looks like we've blown a front tire. <sighs> Seems like we ran through a mess of broken glass. A little too coincidental to be real. Come on, Betsy. Right. Let's have a look at that glass. Seems to me Mr. Killer's a very smart person. A mass of broken glass thrown out behind his car would be just a thing to slow up any pursuers. And here we are. Nick, that's... They're perfume bottles. They must be the ones stolen from Harold's room. Thrown overboard to save the killer's skin. I'm afraid it didn't work this time. You want to know why, Betsy? Why? Because this is a side street, and all I can smell is uncollected garbage. Well, Nick, I... Are you crazy? Don't get it yet, huh? All right, wait till I call Maddie and get a police car. And we'll call on the killer and let him explain himself. This is close enough. We'll get out here. Come on, Patsy. Okay. Now move on, Maddie. Right with you, Nick. Quiet, please. Well, what in blazes is this place? We're coming in the back door of a war plant. This is the department that prints labels and things. What you hear, the press is working. Nick, do you mean Madame Paris was lying when she said that... Quiet, Betty, quiet. We're going into this office here. I want you all to follow my lead, right? Yeah, but Nick, I... Ah, here we go. Yes, what is it? Mr. Maxwell? Yes, who are you? I believe you've seen me before. I'm Nick Carter. What do you want, Mr. Carter? A confession. Confession? Of what? Of the murder of Mr. Harrow, the kidnapping of Mrs. Nelson, and of the smartest racket ever worked in this city. Counterfeiting valuable labels. You're out of your mind, Carter. Out of my mind, am I? Patsy, bring in Mrs. Nelson. Let's see what Mr. Maxwell says when she confronts him. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you've got Mrs. Nelson outside, huh? You fool, you think that bluff will work on me? You haven't got... We haven't what, Mr. Maxwell? Go ahead. Nothing. You're going to say we haven't got Mrs. Nelson, huh? Well, only one person could know that, Mr. Maxwell, and that's the killer. The only way you could know whether or not Mrs. Nelson has been rescued is because you yourself are the killer. <laughs> a moment, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and explain how he knew Maxwell murdered the hanging paper hanger. Fine furniture is a proud possession for any family, but furniture doesn't keep its good looks without help. Keep your household things beautiful with Linex Cream Polish, the modern shortcut to furniture care. Linex Cream Polish renews the original appearance of your furniture in one easy process. For it actually cleans as it polishes, removing dust, polish accumulation, and finger marks in one quick application. Yes, Linex Cream Polish cuts your job in two. Saves one whole step in your cleaning day routine. It even acts as insurance against future work. For Linex Cream Polish dries hard, leaving no oily film to attract more dust. So begin now. Get Linex Cream Polish, which cleans as it polishes. It's the up-to-date way to care for your fine furniture. 
you'll find all three great Linex home brighteners, Linex cream polish, Linex self-polishing wax, and Linex clear gloss, the longer-lasting brush-on finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that lightens and brightens your home at an average cost of just $2.98 a room. Chemtone covers in one coat, dries in one hour. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. You know, Nick, I was surprised when we found Mrs. Nelson hidden away in Maxwell's plant as we did. Well, as I deduced earlier, Patsy, Maxwell wasn't ready to kill her until he found out exactly how much she'd told us about his racket. He suspected her because she brought me into the case. But she really knew nothing. Well, that's the point, Patsy. On the side, Maxwell counterfeited rare and expensive labels. Mrs. Nelson used to pick some up while she was cleaning around the plant. She brought them home to decorate her walls. But she never realized anything shady was going on. No, of course not. Now, Spieler Wilson bought his phony labels from Maxwell for the phony perfume he sold. Uh-huh. And when he saw some of those labels on Mrs. Nelson's walls, he warned Maxwell that someone else might see them and get wise to their racket. Oh. So to cover up quietly, Maxwell had Harrow paper over the walls. Unfortunately, Harrow probably got wise when he found the fresh labels on Mrs. Nelson's closet, the one she was saving to put on the walls. He mm-hmm. took some down with him and prepared phony bottles of perfume, pasted the labels on, and had plenty of evidence to blackmail Maxwell. So Maxwell killed him, and then came back for the bottles, and we were there. Right. All of Maxwell's efforts centered around covering up a million-dollar racket. He killed Harrow for this. He trailed me, and when it seemed I was ferreting out his secret at Madame Paris, tried to kill me. Nick, that brings us to your crack about smelling garbage, after he stopped us by throwing those perfume bottles in front of our car. Well, that was obvious, Patsy. If there'd been real perfume in those bottles, we'd have smelled nothing but perfume. As we didn't, it showed the bottles contained doped-up water, proving definitely that bottles, perfume, and labels were all phony. Oh. Well, Nick, what story have you got for next week? Well, that's the next week. We have a very strange case. I received a letter from a housemaid in a wealthy home on Park Avenue. Oh, yeah. 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 Keep tuned to this station for the latest news. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Six Statue. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated a strange plague called bronze disease that murdered two people and almost killed a third. Who's the busiest homemaker you know? Like as not, it's you, yourself, and no wonder. For these are busy times. But fortunately, there are fine new shortcuts to the homemaking job. Shortcuts such as the three great Linux home brighteners, which save you so many hours of work. No wonder American homemakers everywhere have come to depend on the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, the modern brush-on finish. Linux cream polish for fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. Learn for yourself how simple a job home upkeep can be, how much lovelier your home will look with those three great Linux home brighteners. Get them at your hardware, paint, or department store and see what modern magic they work for you. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. 
The regular morning work in the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 5th and 4th begins with Nick's voluminous correspondence. Scores of letters arrive every day, official, semi-official, friendly, threatening. But every once in a while, a strange note arrives, like the one Patsy is reading to Nick now. Dear Mr. Nick Carter, you are a famous detective and would not know me as I am only a housemaid. Oh, this writing is terrible. But I have heard you will always help people if they are in trouble, so I am taking the liberty to ask you, would you help me? Mr. Carter, there is bad trouble in the house where I work, Mr. Horace Allen's house on Park Avenue. There is, is plague in the house, a bad sickness, and I think we will all die. The statues got sick first, and I know we will get it next. Please come and tell me what I should do. In clothes, please find muddy order to pay for your trouble. Yours truly, Maisie Leeds. For the love of Pete. Oh, I really think this is touching, Nick. Look, here's the money order. Five whole dollars. Generous fee, considering Miss Leeds probably earns only 20 a week. Wish you hadn't sent it. Let's see that letter, Betsy. Here. Horace Allen. What, that's the famous ex meat packer, isn't it? 1270 Park. <laughs> Very rich. Yes. Hmm. Letter mail last night. Written in a great deal of hurry. Notice the ink blots? Mm -hmm. Miss Leeds seems to be rather frightened. Well, what's all this about plague? Now, here's the key line. Statues got sick first, and I know we will get it next. Statues got sick? But what's that mean? I think we better drive to 1270 Park and find out. Right now? Oh, can't it wait a few minutes, Nick? We've got so much work to do here, and, well, Miss Maisie Leeds' trouble is probably a very vivid imagination. You've forgotten. I've been paid a retainer, Fessy. I'm now devoted to the interest of my client. Let's go see Maisie, even if we have to go in through the servant's entrance. <laughs> Pretty swank mansion for an ex meat packer, Nick. Yes. Heard Mr. Allen's turn to art in his retirement. He collects. Oh, I wish he'd go back to meat packing for the duration. You can't eat statues and packers. Very funny. No one home. Should be servants in the house. They don't seem to be. Oh, Nick, you're you're not going. Don't to... have to. The door's been left ajar. Come on. Oh, Nick, this isn't right. I've got a feeder on, Patsy. Come on in. Besides, it's rather unusual for a collector of art to leave the house door open when there's no one home. Oh, there's the library. Let's go in. Oh, golly. Plenty of stuff here. Paintings, statues. Nick, look at those statues. The bronze ones. Yes. They're, they're all greenish and crusted. Like they've got some kind of skin disease. And those bronze spears, too. And this bronze chest. I wonder how it looks inside. Maybe this... <gasps> Nick. Yes. Looks as if the plague has killed our client. As I'm very much mistaken, this body in the chest is that of Maisie Leeds. I've been through most of the house, Nick. There isn't a soul around... What's happened anyway? Don't know yet. Learn anything from the body? It's Maisie Leeds, all right. Dead about ten hours. She must have been strangled and placed in this chest just after she mailed that letter to me. Oh. Patsy, there's an odd thing about this murder. It looks as if the killer had silver polish in his hands. Silver polish? Yes, there's a kind of white powder on Maisie's neck around the strangulation prints. It smells like silver polish. And, Nicky, you'd better notify the police. No. Why not? Listen, Patsy. Maisie Leeds paid me five dollars to take on her case. I didn't get her soon enough to save her life, but I am going to get a killer. This is a point of honor. Something Sergeant Matheson wouldn't understand. Well, what are you two doing uh, in Nick. here? Don't move, either of you. I'd suggest you put that gun away. You might hurt someone. Answer my question. What are you doing in here? Who are you? I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Patsy Bowen. Nick Carter? Yes. Well, I'm Peter Craig, Horace Allen's nephew. I was up on the top floor, heard someone calling down here. That was me. So I came down. What's the matter, Mr. Carter? Look in the bronze chest. Good grief, Maisie. All right, Craig, I want some quick answers from you. Why was the house empty when we arrived? Where's your uncle? Where are the servants? Well, there aren't any servants. They all quit yesterday, except Maisie here. Uncle Horace rushed down to the employment agency this morning. That's, that's why I'm alone in the house. I see. 
But you didn't see Maisie Leeds this morning? No, I... Well, I generally stay in my rooms on the top floor. Uncle Horace just yelled up that he was going to the agency. What agency? The Sun Agency on Vanderbilt Street. One more question, Craig. You know anything about bronze statues? No. Who sold these to your uncle? St. Gennaro Field, English dealer at the plaza. All right. You stay here. Try and locate your uncle on the phone and get him home. We're hustling over to see Arrowfield. I want to find out what six statues have got to do with murder. Believe me, Mr. Carter, that man Allen is an idiot, a fool, an artistic criminal. I should never have sold rare pieces to an ex-meat packer. Go on. Antique bronzes are as delicate as tropical fruits. Unless they're cared for with delicacy and understanding, they sicken. You mean statues can really become sick? Yes, and die. Bronze disease is a corrosion that eats away the metal, rots it until it crumbles. No one knows how it starts. No one knows how to stop it. Once it attacks a collection, the infected pieces must be removed or the entire collection will die. Golly. And bronze disease has attacked Alan's collection? You saw it, didn't you? The green crumbling crust on the surface of the bronze. And unless he removes the infected pieces, his collection is doomed. But why did you call him an artistic criminal? He has a half a million dollars worth of items there. All the money in the world can't replace one of those pieces once it's lost. Don't you understand there's nothing more valuable than a work of art? Oh, yes, there is, Mr. Arrowfield. A human life. Ah, here we are, Betty. The Sun Employment Agency. Hmm. Doesn't look very busy. I'm sorry, nothing available. We're looking for Mr. Horace Allen. And not here. He was here this morning? Here and gone. Can't supply him with anything. Why not? Sleeping quarters are impossible. The nephew's a chemist or something. Did you say the nephew's a chemist? Yes, has a laboratory alongside the servants' quarters. Terrible smells all day and all night. Well, chemists ought to know more about bronze disease than Craig seemed to. Patsy, let's have a talk with that young man right now. <laughs> Craig was lying. Don't know, Patsy. It's perfectly possible. Uh, I hope Mr. Allen's back by this time. With somebody to answer the door. At least Craig ought to answer. Probably back upstairs in his laboratory. Well? Nick. Just my little pick lock, Patsy. Can't wait here all day. One second. There we are. Hello? Anybody home? Funny. You told Craig to stay here. Well, let's run up to the top floor. We'll find him there. Walk? Right. Haven't you noticed? Alan has a neat little private elevator installed. Oh. Step in. Call your floor, please. First floor, dining room, smoking room, lounge room. Second floor, bedrooms, bedrooms, and more bedrooms. Third floor, hot houses, bedrooms, and more bedrooms. Fourth and top floor, servants' quarters, and... <gasps> Nick, look, on the floor, it, it's Craig. Yes, fourth and top floor, murder. First, a murdered housemaid, then a murdered chemist. How will Nick explain them and solve the mystery of the six statues? We'll see in just a moment. One of the most important jobs in keeping your home spick and span is the care of your floors. And now you have an efficient new shortcut to that very job. Linux self-polishing wax made from a new formula developed by leading chemists to give you the finest. For Linux self-polishing wax, designed to save work for you, at the same time provides amazing new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance for all your floors and linoleum. Linux self-polishing wax imparts the satiny luster that only real wax can give. And because it contains the greatest possible amount of genuine Carnaba wax, the finish lasts longer. What's more, the underwriters' laboratories have proved by actual test that any hardwood, linoleum, or rubber tile floor is less slippery 
after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied. Best of all, Linex self-polishing wax takes only a jiffy to wipe on and dries without tiresome rubbing to a handsome finish to make any homemaker proud. So follow the example of women all over America. Enjoy greater leisure, greater convenience, greater beauty in your home with Linex self-polishing wax. Available at your hardware, paint, or department store. Ask your dealer now for all three great Linux home brighteners. The easy way to more attractive living. And now back to our story. Investigating a strange complaint about six statues, Nick and Patsy entered the empty home of Horace Allen to discover Allen's housemaid, Maisie Leeds, murdered. Nick finds that Allen's artworks are suffering from a rare disease known as bronze disease and also that Alan's nephew, Peter Craig, is an amateur chemist with a laboratory on the top floor of the house. When Nick and Patsy return to the house to question Craig, they find him murdered, too. Now they're in the murdered man's laboratory examining his body. But, well, Nick? Stabbed through the chest with a bronze spear, Patsy. Evidently, one of the spears from Alan's collection. Golly. It's a powerful thrust. You see the tip protruding from Craig's back. You can also see it's tainted with the same bronze disease that's hit some of the statues. Ah, uh-huh. hello. Well, what is it? Craig didn't die at once. What do you mean? Look, here on the floor. Oh, Craig must have tried to write something in blood as he was dying. Yes. It says N-H-L. N-H-L, what's that? Couldn't tell you yet. Nick, I've got it. Initials. He wrote the initials of the killer. Maybe. Uh, 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 couldn't be Alan or... Or Arrowfield, or the Sun Agency. Maybe it was one of the old servants. Hey, what's going on in this house? Where is everybody? What goes here? Nick, I think I hear... You uh... don't think you do hear our old friend, Sergeant Matheson. Hey, anybody home? Craig, Alan. Hey, Mr. Allen, I... Oh, glory be, I'm seeing things. Oh, we're real, Sergeant. Good afternoon, Matty. Nick Carter and company, I might have known. What are you two... Hey, who's that on the floor? Peter Craig. Murdered. Craig, too? He's the guy that called me. First the girl downstairs, now him upstairs. What is this, a massacre? I'll give you the facts, Matty. No, 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 no. Explanations first, if you please, Mr. Oh, Carter. Here we go. Now, look, I warned you a thousand times when you get mixed up in murder cases to notify homicide. There's a law in this city. Don't you ever do anything but break the law? Yes, I solve murders. You ought to know. Yeah, 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 I know, but Nick, please... We've got laws to enforce. Make it as easy as you can for us to enforce them. Matty, I'm going to help you enforce one law today. The law against first-degree murder. Come on down to Alan's laboratory. So that's exactly where we stand in the case, Matty. The murders are tied up some way with the bronze disease. Yeah. I have an idea how, but I'm not sure yet. Well, look, uh, what about the insurance angle? Maybe Alan's trying to ruin his own statues to collect the dough on them. Oh, no, Matt. He could get more by selling them. Well, maybe Craig ruined the statues and Alan killed him for revenge. Maybe, but I doubt it. Besides, that leaves out Maisie Lee. Oh, forget her. She's just an accident in this case. She's not an accident in this case, and she's not to be forgotten. Matter, you won't understand this, but in this case, I'm working for Maisie Leeds. I'm not working for you or the police. What's that? I'm working for justice. Justice for Maisie Leeds. I think you're crazy. Huh? See, Patsy, I told you. Well, 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 huh? well. I'm pleased to see you all here. And a fine lot of people you seem to be. I'm Mr. Allen. Oh, yeah? Yes, indeed. Very easy man to work for. Just myself, my nephew in the house. Big house, few people, not too difficult, eh? I suppose the agency explained. Mr. Allen. You're the housemaid, eh? Very pretty, my dear. Very Mr. Allen, your housemaid is Miss Patsy Bowen, my assistant. The what? I am Nick Carter. Nick Carter? But I, I'm but... going to be blunt, Mr. Allen. No sense beating around the bush. Your maid, Maisie Leeds, was strangled to death. Your nephew, Peter Craig, was stabbed to death. What? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, help me in the chair, Matty. Yeah, right, Nick. Easy, Easy now. Thank you. Uh, I'll be all right. I didn't spare you because we're pressed for time, Mr. Allen. The killer may strike again. We've got to work fast. Now, where were you all day? At the employment agencies, trying to hire servants. A likely story. It's true. I had to have them in the house today. I 
have a very important guest coming arriving on the 6.30 train from Washington. Says you. You can get the list of agencies of Mr. Allen to check the story later, Matty. Okay. Mr. Okay. Allen, I want to take one of your statues home with me. One of the diseased ones. I, uh... I'm sorry, I can't permit that, Mr. Carter. My guest coming tonight... But you ought to remove the six statues anyway, Mr. Allen. Mr. Arafield said so. Why, they'll infect everything. I know, I know, but I can't. My guest is a famous collector and wants to buy some of my pieces. I've got to show him all of them. I see. Well, in that case, we've got to work without your help. Come on, Patsy. You'll be in my lab if anything breaks, Matty. Right. Oh, by the way, Mr. Allen, what's the name of this famous collector who's visiting you tonight? Uh, Norman Lane. Uh, Norman Hadley Lane. Oh, Patsy, turn off the Bunsen burner, will you? Of course. Nick, I just realized what Alan said. What's that, Patsy? The man coming up on the 6.30 train from Washington. Norman Hadley Lane. N-H-L. Mm-hmm. Found at a couple of museums. Get a file on him. But, but, but the letters, N-H-L, that's his initials. Mm-hmm. Oh, Nick, you're not listening. Just finishing this analysis, Betsy. Here. See this precipitate? Yes. That's the silver polish from Maisie Lee's throat. Is it silver polish? No. Something that came from Peter Craig's lab. Now hand me that package I brought from Alan's house. Mm. Here. Thanks. I'll wrap this. Nick, you don't seem to care about the initials. I'll bet Lane's the killer. I bet he isn't even on the train. He's probably here already. Huh. Here we are. Nick, that's the spear that killed Craig. Right. But that's stealing police evidence. Oh, golly, Sergeant Matheson's going to be sore. Alan would let me have a sample of his diseased bronze. We had to steal it. Now let's cut a sliver of bronze off the tip of the spear, and we'll take a look at it under the microscope. Now you're destroying evidence. Oh, Nick, Nick, I don't like it. Not destroying. I'm just taking off a shaving. There. Now, now let's see. Well? Ah. Well, what do you see, germs? Yeah, I'll let you have a look. You see? This is a slice across the tip of the spear. Now, you see the outer portions? Uh, those crystals all around the edges? Yes. A malachite crystal shows the presence of the brown disease. Now, what do you see inside, toward the core of the section? Uh, just reddish metal. Exactly. Amorphous bronze metal, just pure, uncrystallized bronze. And that, Miss Bowen, breaks the case wide open. What, what do you mean, Nick? I mean that... Oh, I'll get it. Hello? Nick Carter. Speaking, who's this? Here's a tip for you, Mr. Nick Carter. If you want to find who killed Peter Craig... What's the clerk from the Sun Employment Agency? Quick, Patsy, get a line on this call. Trace it. Right. I'm afraid I don't follow you. The clerk from the Sun Employment Agency. You'll find him at the Hotel Brighton. Now, he'll tell you who killed Craig. Uh, just let me get that down, will you? Hotel Brighton. Uh, wh whereabouts is that? I've talked long enough. You know what to do. Goodbye. Oh, it's no use, Patsy. I couldn't hold him long enough. Did you get any kind of a trace? No. Sorry. Well, it doesn't matter. Get Matty on the phone. Tell him we're picking him up and take him for a ride. To the Hotel Brighton? Just tell him the killer will be at the other end of the ride. All right, Nick, never mind the Mysterioso stuff. Where are we going? Thought Patsy told you, Matty, to meet a murderer. Where? Didn't Patsy tell you that? The Hotel Brighton. Then we're going the wrong way. The Brighton's downtown in the village. You're driving uptown. That's right. But, Nick, the man on the phone said that... The man on the phone was wrong, Patsy. Here we are. This is where we're going. Huh? What time is it? 6.25. Oh, just in time. Come on. Oh, this is Pennsylvania Station. Right. And we're going to meet the Washington train. Do you mean to tell me the killer is this Lane guy? Norman Hadley Lane? That's who we're going to meet. We'll have to move quickly. We haven't much time. Oh, but Nick, we... talk later, Patsy. I'm afraid to cut it rather fine. We've got to get to the lower level and be on the platform when the train pulls in. This way. If this is a wild goose chase, Nick... When I need you wrong, you can say that, Matty. Not until then. Down this ramp. Right. Now, that's the Washington train. Quick. Oh, we'll never get through the crowds. We've got to. Here. Here are pictures of Lane. Yeah. Take him. You can't miss him. He's a big man. Quite stout. Eddie Gray's beard. Uh -huh. Looks like Edward VII. Look sharp. Now we mustn't miss him. Now listen, Nick. I... This is no time for arguments, Matty. We've got to locate Lane as soon as he gets off that train. Now stand by. Right. I'll take the center. You watch right. Matty, you take the left. Okay. Right. 
fat man, Edward VII. Beard. Oh, what a crowd. I think... Oh, oh we no. only knew which car he was. Hold it. There he is. Car in front of us. Quick, Maddie. Forward. Right. Mr. Lane. Mr. Norman Lane. Norman Hadley Lane. Get down. Get down. Nick, what are you doing? He's tackling him. <laughs> Maddie, you got him? Yes, I got him, Nick. All right, hold on to him. Right. Let's take him to the station master's office. You can call the wagon from there. Quieter, at least. Hey, Nick, why didn't you warn me it was going to be an assassination? Didn't know when it was going to happen. Oh, what about oh. Mr. Lane? Oh, I just put him in a cab. He's all right. Oh, He's pretty well shaken up when I knocked him out of the way of the bullets. Now, that's a lot better than a shot through the heart. Huh, Mr. Arrowfield? Why, oh, you dirty gumshoe snooper. I'd like to... Hold on, Matty. <laughs> He's a dangerous little man and a very clever actor. <clears throat> phony Englishman, phony dealer in art objects, including phony bronzes. Phony bronzes? Certainly, Patsy. That was the whole motivation. When Mr. Allen took up collecting objects of art, Arrowfield got hold of them and sold him a lot of supposedly antique bronze masterpieces. But in reality, they were completely phony, being merely modern copies of those masterpieces. And unless I'm wrong, Mr. Norman Lane owned many of the originals from which Allen's bronzes were copied. Well, Nick, uh, what about that bronze disease? When Arrowfield learned that Lane was coming to see Allen's collection, he knew Lane would recognize many of Allen's bronzes as copies of items in his own collection. Yeah. So Arrowfield, in order to force Allen to remove those phony pieces from his collection, deliberately infected them with a bronze disease. What do you know? Allen refused to remove them in spite of the disease, so Arrowfield had to do the next best thing, kill Lane. Otherwise, he faced exposure as a dealer in fakes and phony pieces. The murder of Lane, fortunately, didn't succeed. The others did. And I'm going to see that you pay for them, Arrowfield. I want to be sure that Maisie Leeds, wherever she is now, gets her full five dollars worth. In just a moment, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and tell you how he knew Arrowfield was the poisoner of the sick statue. The whole year round, it's a real job to keep your home bright and interesting. That's why the three great Linux home brighteners are so important to help in your homemaking schedule because they save so much time and work. Take Linux clear gloss, for instance, the modern brush-on finish for all wood and linoleum surfaces. Linex Clear Gloss is ideal for any surface you want to save, protecting for months against wear, against dirt, against spotting, warding off damage by hot grease, boiling water, fruit acids, even alcohol. And Linex Clear Gloss lends such sparkling beauty, beauty that's easy to maintain, for the whisk of a damp cloth removes smudges from any Linex Clear Gloss surface. Linex Clear Gloss flows on easily, too, drying to a smooth, lasting finish which protects for months. So give your linoleum, floors, and woodwork the gleaming luster, the sturdy protection of Linex Clear Gloss, the finest in household finishes. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners, Linex Clear Gloss, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, and Linex Cream Polish for fine furniture at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. Chemtone covers in one coat, dries in one hour, bringing bright new loveliness to your walls and ceilings in bedroom, living room, or hall. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, I don't see why Arrowfield killed Maisie Lee. Because when Maisie returned for mailing her letter to me, she saw Arrowfield in the collection room deliberately infecting the false antique bronze statues with the bronze disease. She was killed to silence her. But how could Arrowfield poison the statues? Well, Patsy, as Alan's guide and mentor in the new business of collecting, Arrowfield had easy access to the house. He was able to steal in and infect those statues with chemicals he took from Craig's laboratory. To be precise, with ammonium chloride. That's the corrosive agent that causes bronze disease. Oh, and... Was that the powder you found on Maisie's neck? Right. Some of it was on Arrowfield's hands when he strangled her. Evidently, Craig remembered seeing Arrowfield in his lab taking the chemical. So, Arrowfield killed him. But those initials Craig wrote. Oh, they weren't initials, Patsy. Craig tried to write the chemical symbol for ammonium chloride, NH4Cl. Mm -hmm. He wrote the N and the H and got as far as the first elbow stroke of four and then died. 
we thought he'd written NHL, which, purely by coincidence, happened to be Lane's initials. Oh, I see. Well, Nick, you said Arafield's bronzes were full. How could you tell that? Apache, remember this afternoon in my lab, you looked through the microscope at a piece of that spear that killed Craig? Yes. Well, really ancient bronzes become heavily crystallized through the years. But the piece we examined was crystallized only around the outer surface, showing that it was cast quite recently. So that's it. Well, was Arafield trying to sidetrack you with that phone call so he could get it lame when he arrived in town? Yes. Oh, lucky you weren't fooled. Only well, you know, it's a funny thing, Patsy. I've met thousands of crooks in my time, each one more clever than the next. And believe it or not, the only ones they fooled in the end were themselves. Well, Nick, what story are you going to tell next week? Remember the time we drove south to investigate the mystery of a legendary giant called Erdman, the Earthshaker, whose footsteps apparently frightened a man to death? Oh, yes. The clues to the case were green rice grains on the dead man's hand and a drop of blood on a bird feather. Right. What are you going to call the story? The Case of the Bleeding Bobolink. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson plays Patsy. Script is by Alfred Bester. And any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux self-polishing wax, Linux cream polish, and Linux clear gloss, created by Acme. America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Vanishing Postman. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated a baffling seven-year-old crime and solved a murder through the eyes of a blind man. There's no time of year when a busy homemaker needs cool, leisurely relaxation more than during the summer months. And you can have that kind of relaxation when you do your homemaking the easy Linux way. Just follow the example of wise American homemakers everywhere who have learned the magic shortcut to household care. Those three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, the modern brush-on finish. Linux cream polish for fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. Start now to enjoy extra relaxation every day. Enjoy that added leisure in a home that's sparkling with bright new beauty. Just ask your hardware, paint, or department store for the three great Linux home brighteners. And save time the easy Linux way. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. Rain has rolled in across the great city again today. The black skies thunder and crackle with lightning. 
The streets are glossy and slippery as glass. As Nick and Patsy drive homeward in the detective's powerful car, a torrent of rain beats against the windshield. When suddenly... Nick, look out! That car! Oh! Oh, Nick! Oh. You all right, Patsy? Uh, I... Oh. I guess so. Oh, golly, I was scared. Lucky we went into this alley when we skidded off the street. Yes, and lucky that pile of rubbish cushioned the crash. Might have had a bad crack up. Hey, wait a minute. What is it? When we smacked into that rubbish pile, we uncovered an old leather pouch lying underneath. See? Hey, you'll get soaked, Nick. It's an old postman's bag, Patsy. Falling to pieces. Must have been here for ages. Oh, Nick, come on back. Find there's mail in this bag. Letters. Hello. There's a name printed on the strap. R. Draper. Oh, it's probably the name of the postman. And look at these letters, Patsy. The postmark, August 1938. 1938? Then, then this bag's been lying here seven years. Hey, look here, Patsy. What, Nick? The buckle from the strap has fallen into the pouch. There's a bit of metal wedged in the buckle. Looks like a lump of lead. Well, it should. It happens to be a bullet. <gasps> well, let's get over to the post office at once. I'm afraid the explanation of this undelivered mail may be murder. <laughs> Patsy, mystery. I found that postman Robert Draper vanished seven years ago and that the police and postal authorities believe him to be guilty of theft because a registered parcel containing $10,000 in securities also vanished at the same time. Oh, Nick, he stole them? Theft can't account for that bullet we found wedged in the buckle in the pouch, Patsy. Oh, no, no, I suppose not. For seven years, Robert Draper stood convicted of theft. Well, I'm going to find out whether he's guilty. But... How are you going to dig up evidence in a case that happened seven years ago? Going to get special permission from the postmaster to deliver this mail that should have been delivered seven years ago. Well, we've learned nothing so far in the first 47 letters we've delivered. Perhaps we'll have better luck here with the 48th. Yes? Are you Betty Barnes? Yes. I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Patsy Bowen. Nick Carter? Oh, please, come in, Mr. Carter. Thank you. I have a letter here for you, Miss Barnes. Mrs. Barnes. Oh, sorry. I have a letter that should have been delivered seven years ago. Seven years ago? I'd better explain. You see, seven years ago, the postman who served this district disappeared. His name was Robert Draper. What's going on here, Betty? Dan, it's about Pop. What? Well, he... Great Scott. uh... Don't tell me that Draper was your father. Now, Now, look here. We fought that case seven years ago. There's no sense raking it up again and making out Betty's dad was a crook. Pop never stole. Why should he? He'd saved $12,000. He had plenty of insurance, $20,000 worth. Mrs. Barnes, please. I'm not trying to convict your father all over again. I'm trying to find out what really happened. But you'll have to help me. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter. Now tell me, what happened on that last day? Well, Pop left in the morning. You see, he lived with us and... He always used to drop in at home for lunch. The day he disappeared, he just never showed up for lunch. When Dan came home that night, I sent him out to... Yes, I I went out to check up Mr. Carter. They said he never returned to the post office, and that's all we know. We never saw Dad again. I see. Mrs. Barnes, you have a picture of your father I might have. Uh, I'll, I'll get him one, honey. You know, Mr. Carter... It was on my birthday that Pop disappeared. Oh, how awful, Mrs. Barnes. Well, here's one, Mr. Carter. He's not in uniform, but it's the best we've got. Taken a week before he disappeared. Thank you. I'll let you know how we make out. Oh, yes, here's your seven-year delayed letter, Mrs. Barnes. What? Oh. Oh, Dan, look. It, it's a birthday card from Pop. It says, Happy birthday, daughter dear. Best. Wishes on this day. My heart would always find you near. So I were miles away. Oh, Bob. Bob, darling. But, 
Nick. We've delivered 17 letters since we left Mrs. Barnes, and not one of them knew a thing. It's all right, Patsy. We're not doing badly at all. We've got a picture of Draper, and we know we had no motive for stealing those securities. Somebody else in this trail of letters will help us along further. Well, this one's for Ben Kramer, care of Kramer's Garage, 118 Land Street. Well, this is it. Let's go in. Mm-hmm. Mr. Kramer doesn't seem to be around. Now, wait a minute. Oh, I hear voices back there. Come on. You already got back double what you owe me. Yeah, now, about? just give me a break, Shelley, please. Oh, That's all I ask. Megan Kramer, will you? I collect what's coming to yeah, me. But, but I can't keep on paying. It's breaking my back. I'll break your back if you try to welch, Kramer. I give you the place before you took my dough. One for ten a week. I, I can't do it, Shelley. I don't like to just... true, gentlemen, but I'd like some information. What? Who are you, wise guy? Nick Carter's the name. Nick Carter. Hey, Kramer, did no, you... No, 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 honest. Honest, oh, Shelley. Shelley I... Nick, what's going on? Nothing, lady, nothing. I'll be going, Kramer. I'll see you later. Nick, what's going on here? It's obvious Mr. Kramer's been caught in a loan shark racket. Something pretty well known to the police. But something that can't be stopped until the victims are willing to give evidence. What was that one for ten they were talking about? Mr. Kramer pays a dollar a week for every ten he borrowed. Right, Mr. Kramer? I... I don't want to talk about it, Mr. Carter. It, it, it ain't safe. If, if I could only just lay my hands on $1,500 and, and, and get out from under... Mr. Kramer, yeah. we, we've got a letter for you. Huh? It's seven years old. Seven years? That, that don't make no sense. Well, this letter was mailed to you, but never delivered because something happened to the postman, Robert Draper. Remember him? Draper? Oh, yes, yes, of course. A, a friendly little fella. Blue eyes he had. Bald. He wore a handlebar mustache. A handlebar mustache? Yeah, yeah. I, I even remember the day he scrammed. Hacky, who used to keep his cab in my garage, he saw Draper. He drove him and another guy someplace. Yes, go on. Where was he driven? Who was the man? Now, 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 leave me think, Mr. Carter. It was such a long time ago. I, I can't even Kramer, think... Kramer, I want the name and address of that cab driver. Well, let me... I, I, I remember now. It was... Nick! Someone's fired from the garage door. Yes, Kramer's been hit. Oh, but Nick, the killer. You gotta get Kramer's evidence. The killer can wait. Patsy, get to a phone. Call an ambulance quick. Right. Got me bad. Kramer, listen. Can you hear me? Who drove with Draper in the cab? Oh, no. Where'd they drive? Shelley's bowling alley. The thug we just met, huh? Good. Do me a favor. Anything you say, Kramer. That... That seven-year-old letter. Read it to me. Certainly. Mr. Ben Kramer, dear sir, we are happy to inform you that your contribution has won second prize in our slogan contest. And close, please find money orders totaling $1,500. $1,500? With... Why, that's just what Mr. Kramer needs to pay off. Mr. Kramer doesn't need any money anymore, does he? Oh. He's dead. Birthday greetings, seven years old, and now murder from a delayed mail delivery. What new and strange developments will arise from Nick's odd mission? We'll see in just a moment. The wisest worker is the one who saves as much work as possible, yet gets the job done. That's efficiency. And the efficient way to take perfect care of your floors and linoleum is to depend upon Linux self-polishing wax. Try it just once and prove to your complete satisfaction that here is the ideal way to new beauty for your floors. It takes only a jiffy to wipe Linex self-polishing wax on any hardwood, linoleum, or rubber tile floor, and it dries without tiresome rubbing to a handsome luster. You'll notice that Linex self-polishing wax gives that satiny beauty only real wax can give. You'll find, when you step on that floor, that Linex self-polishing wax is the anti-skid finish, or your floor will be less slippery than it was to start with. This fact has been proved by the underwriter's laboratories. And you'll be delighted with the way the finish lasts, for Linex self-polishing wax has the highest possible content of genuine Carnauba wax. Yes, this new formula, developed by leading research chemists to give you the finest, is well worth trying. And once you've tried it, you'll follow the example of all those wise American women who use it regularly. So ask your dealer now for Linex self-polishing wax for all three great Linex home brighteners, the modern shortcuts to household beauty. <laughs> a 
And now back to our story. Investigating the strange disappearance of Robert Draper, postman, accused of absconding with registered securities he was carrying, Nick and Patsy pick up the trail of the old mystery by delivering mail found in the postman's abandoned pouch. Now we find them in the street after the sudden murder of one of their witnesses. What do we do now, Nick? Wait for the homicide squad to arrive? Oh, no. Sergeant Matheson will only hold us up, call us material witnesses and all that. Now, I want to get on with the case. At the Shelley Bowling Alley? No, not yet, Patsy. We Hmm? haven't enough evidence for a direct frontal attack on Mr. Shelley. Oh. Let's get on to the mail delivery. There are more clues waiting for us to pick them up. Who's next? A postcard addressed to Mr. Parker Flint's Homewood House. Homewood House, huh? Mm -hmm. That's the exclusive apartment house in the corner facing the river. Uh Uh-huh. Come on. Let's see what Mr. Flint can tell us. Good afternoon, Mr. Flint. Your butler said we'd find you here in your aviary. Oh, uh, uh, good afternoon. You've got a charming place here, Mr. Flint. Yes, I, I'd like it. I suppose I look silly pottered around in a glass house filled with a lot of birds, but, well, I, I like it. Uh, uh, let's step into my living room. We can talk better there. Eh? We won't keep you from your hobby long, Mr. Flint. Let me introduce myself. I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Patsy Bourne. Get out of here. Beg your pardon? Get out of my house. But, Mr. Flint, now, you... let's get this straight. I hate police. I'll have nothing to do with police anywhere, anytime. Now, get out. Nick, what, what on earth is... Wait, Patsy. Parker Flint. Thought that name sounded familiar. Eh? Yes, I remember. Parker Flint, third. Tried and convicted of second-degree murder seven years ago. Oh, you remember, eh? You also happen to remember that Parker Flint III, my grandson, is serving a life sentence in state prison right now? I do. And will your capable memory recollect that he was innocent? That he was convicted on clumsy circumstantial evidence that would have made an idiot laugh? Well, what do you mean? Young Flint claimed he was on a walking tour across the country. The murder of an enemy of Parker's was committed August 30th, 1938, in this city. And on that day, he was 50 miles outside town in a village named Samson. The defense couldn't prove it, Mr. Flint. So they convicted him. Not because he was guilty, but because they hadn't anyone else. Make an example, they screamed. Show there's some the same justice for rich and poor alike. Uh, they made an example, all right. And then you'll be interested in the case I'm working on, Mr. Flint. Eh? Another man runs the risk of unjust conviction. I'll have nothing to do with the police. Go on, get out. But Nick's not a police. Mr. Then. Flint, justice sometimes miscarries. Men are wrongfully convicted and sentenced. It's a human factor in law that can't be avoided. I made it my job to prevent that factor of human error as far as possible. Now, I'll help you with your case, Mr. Flint, but you've got to help me with mine. Eh? Well, what, what is your case? It's your old postman, Robert Draper. Draper, oh, I remember him well. Knew him well, in fact. Supposed to have disappeared about seven years ago. Supposed? Yes, he did disappear, though. I saw him around this neighborhood seven weeks afterwards. Uh, Actus is suspicious. Uh, though he was hiding, had his head wrapped up in a turban. A turban? Golly. Yeah, what's more, he seemed to be afraid of someone called Gray. Seemed to see this Gray everywhere. Gray, huh? That's interesting. Very interesting. Anything else that might help? No, 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 that's all. And now, Mr. Carter, about about my case. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I lost my temper, but you understand, don't you? D- do you think you could offer any, any hope or anything? Yes, Mr. Flynn. I can give you more than hope. I'll give you back your grandson. Oh. In the form of this postcard that should have been delivered seven years ago. A postcard? From your grandson. Sent from the village of Sampson, New York, postmarked August 30th, 1938. Oh, which proves he was where he claimed he was. Heaven. Congratulations, Mr. Flint. This is the one piece of evidence that'll free him. Yeah. Well, Nick, how do we stand? Any closer to the vanishing postman? Yes, indeed, Patsy. Mr. Flint brought us a good deal closer. How so? That turban, for one thing, is very significant. And Draper's fear of someone called Gray, even more so. But we haven't come across anyone named Gray so far. Now hold everything, Patsy. Here's our next stop. Residence of Miss Jennifer West. Miss West's got a seven-year-old package coming to her. Well, let's hope we can trade it for information. Information. 
information, Mr. Carter. About our missing postman? Yes, Miss West. Well, I really don't know any... Oh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, hello, darling. No, no, you're wrong. It's the orphan benefit. No, no, the 18th. I put you down for a box. No, certainly you can't get out of it, dear. It's a worthy cause. Yes, yes. All right, bye. Now, let's see, uh, where were we? You were going to tell us what you remember about Mr. Draper's disappearance. Oh, but I don't know anything. I don't even remember him. Well, here's a photograph of him. Hmm. No, oh, no, I'm sorry. It isn't a bit familiar. But I have such a miserable memory for faces. And in my work these days, I see so many. Day in and day out. Child Welfare Association, the canteen, the city hospital. City hospital. Oh, I met the most interesting man there yesterday. He was in the psychiatric wing, room 325. Um, but, Miss West, and we... with the strangest um... disease. Monochromatism, they call it. And he's so cheerful about it. Monochromatism? Oh, it's a technical name for blindness of some kind. Such a nice man. His name was... His name was... Uh, was Gray. Gray? Mm. Oh, Nick. I heard, Patsy. Thanks a million for your help, Miss West. Mm. And here's your reward. This long overdue package. Seven years overdue. Why? Why, that's Gary Horton's handwriting. Oh. Once upon a time, Miss Byrne, I I thought Gary and I might Oh well, you understand. Yes, Miss West. But he's so very shy, and I Oh. Oh, look, my dear. It it's flowers. Artificial flowers. No, they're not artificial. That's a bouquet of live forever flowers. And they're from Gary. Oh, here's a card. Dearest Jen, I've been wanting to ask you this for a long time. Never had the courage. Now I have. Will you... Oh, Miss West, it's a proposal. Seven years ago. And he never knew I hadn't received. He thought my silence meant... Oh, oh, uh, excuse me, please. Uh, let's get out of here, Betsy. I have an idea that for the first time today, Miss West's phone is going to hear her say yes. So now we're headed for Shelley's bowling alley. Huh, Nick? Right. But why now? Why don't we hustle up and see that man, Gray? The one Draper was afraid of. You'll see. Hmm? Here's where we stop. Let's go. Nick, what happened to the postman? Was he murdered by Shelley? Did Shelley murder Kramer, too? Come on, come on, come on. Oh, golly, what a busy place. And there's our old friend, Mr. Shelley. Mm-hmm. Hello, Shelley. Mind if we have a chat? Now, look, don't come pussyfooting around my place. You got nothing on me, Carter. Oh, that's what you think. Bluffin' ain't gonna do no good. Don't try and tell me Kramer talked. He knows better. Kramer can't talk. He was murdered. He... He was what? Murdered. Shot to death. You're lying. He was murdered in an attempt to keep me from uncovering the secret of Robert Draper's disappearance. Draper, the postman? This is a frame-up, Still Carter. Still innocent, huh, Shelley? Well, suppose you come over to the city hospital with us. Oh, city hospital, eh? Now, I know it's a frame. I heard one of your plain clothes men calling City Hospital this afternoon, finding out the visiting hours, getting a beautiful frame-up all worked out, and from my own joint, too. What's that? I ain't taking cards on this deal, Carter. I'm getting out of here. Nicky, he's running out. Aren't you going to go after him? That's it. What time is it? Uh, uh, five of eight. And we've got five minutes. Visiting hours starts at eight at the hospital. Nick, what are you talking about? I never thought he'd go that far, Patsy. Come on. We've got to stop a visitor at the hospital tonight. Who? His name is Death. Oh, not so fast, Nick. You can stop and rest. I've got to keep going. Well, I'll stick it out. Where are we headed? To the east wing of the hospital. Psychiatry. What time is it? Uh, two minutes after eight. We may have enough time then. Hey, we're going to see that man Gray, aren't we? Yes. Miss West said he was in room 325. Well, this is 315. 317. 319. Here we are, 325. Uh, yes, it says on the card, monochromatic blindness. You can read the card later, Patsy. Inside, mm -hmm. hurry. Hey, it's dark in here. Careful, Patsy. <gasps> Ouch! I, oh, I just bumped into one of those rolling tables. 
Where's the light, Nick? Get down, Nancy. It's a killer. Get out of the way. Where's that rolling table? Here goes, Nancy. You got him, Nick. I heard the gun drop. It's only the beginning, Patsy. But the beginning of the end for a... I found you, huh? Oh, Nick, oh, careful. Oh, no, you don't, Mr. Oh, no. At least not without a gun. Oh, Nick. Oh. There. Now, I thought, why still? Patsy. Yes, Nick? Try and find the light. Probably alongside the door. Well, yeah. I've got it. Nick. You're sitting on Dan Barnes. Right, Patsy. Dan Barnes. Robert Draper's son-in-law. Barnes is a thief who robbed Robert Draper's mailbag of $10,000 worth of security seven years ago. It was Barnes who took for himself the $12,000 which Draper had saved up before he disappeared. And it was Barnes who hoped to collect $20,000 more in life insurance if Draper stayed lost seven full years so he could be declared legally dead. But, but that man in the bed, that's not the same man as in our picture. Well, nevertheless, Patsy, that unconscious gentleman, a near victim of suffocation at the hands of Dan Barnes, is our long-lost postman. Mr. Robert Draper. In just a moment, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and tell you how he was able to locate the vanishing postman. You know, fine furniture doesn't keep its good looks without help. Not when dust and finger marks and polish accumulation combine to lessen its beauty. But Linex Cream Polish disposes of all those bugbears in short order. For Linex Cream Polish actually cleans as it polishes, renewing your furniture's original handsome appearance in one quick process. Yes, Linex Cream Polish cuts your job in two, saves one whole step in your cleaning day routine. It even acts as insurance against future work. For Linex Cream Polish dries hard, leaving no oily film to attract more dust. So begin now. Get Linex Cream Polish and learn for yourself the modern way to caring for fine furniture. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners, Linex Cream Polish, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, and Linex Clear Gloss, the longer-lasting brush-on finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that lightens and brightens your home at an average cost of just $2.98 a room. Chemtone covers in one coat, dries in one hour. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, I still don't understand. What happened to Draper seven years ago? As I see it, here's the story, Patsy. Seven years ago, Draper met his son-in-law, Barnes, as usual, to go home and have lunch with him. Uh-huh. He probably confided in Barnes that he was carrying valuable securities and a registered letter. Barnes is the only man Draper would have told, since a postman's job is highly confidential. Well, that's right. They don't go around telling strangers what they carry. All right. Well, on some pretext or other, Barnes lured Draper to the alley behind Shelley's place and shot him. And he took the securities from the bag and left. He thought he'd killed Draper. But the bullet only creased Draper's head, rendering him unconscious. Oh, then what happened? Draper recovered consciousness, but he was badly wounded. Mm. The shock of the wound produced amnesia, and the wound itself produced a brain condition called monochromatism. That's day blindness. The victim can only see at night. By day, he's practically blind and can only see vague shades of gray. So that's what Mr. Flint meant. That's it, and that's what the turban meant. Oh. It was Draper's bewildered attempt to bandage his head. For a few days, he wandered about days without memory, mumbling that he could only see gray. Finally, he was picked up and taken to the hospital. Barnes, who must have seen him wandering around in a dazed condition, realized he was safe so long as Draper's mind was gone and Draper was lost to the public. So he decided to let matters ride and wait. And then we came into the case. Only, I can't understand one thing. Why didn't anybody identify the picture of Draper when you showed it to them? Because it wasn't Draper's picture. What? I realized that when Kramer told me Draper had a mustache, remember? Mm Mm-hmm. Barnes was alarmed when he learned we were on the trail and cleverly handed us a photo of another person, hoping it would throw us off the scent. Oh. Then he followed us as we delivered the mail, waiting to see what would happen. And it was he who shot Kramer just as Kramer was about to give us the information we wanted. And when it became evident we were tracking Draper down, his hand was forced. And then he went to the hospital to try to murder him a second time. Right, Patsy. Unfortunately, Barnes didn't realize that murder is bad medicine. It never cures anything. Not when you're around, Nick. 
Well, Nick, what's the story for next week? You remember the case of the frightened social director, Patsy? The mm-hmm. man who scattered torn newspaper in preparation for a paper chase and found... Oh, a... yes, I remember. The next morning when the paper chase started, they found that one of the trails was made of torn $10 bills. What are you going to call the case, Nick? The Factory of Death. <laughs> Now, a final word from Nick Carter. And a very important word, too, Ken. Friends, right now, there is no better thing you can do for the protection of America's future and your own than to buy United States victory bonds. And by all means, hold your United States war bonds. Help to keep America secure. Help to prevent inflation. Help in the transition from wartime to peacetime by buying and keeping your war bonds until they mature and by buying those all-important victory bonds now. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson plays Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Alfred Bester... And any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linex Home Brightness. Linex Self-Polishing Wax, Linex Cream Polish, and Linex Clear Gloss, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paint. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linex dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux Home Brighteners. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case... The Talking Tree, another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated the murder of a beggar with a fortune in his pocket and found the solution to the strange case of a talking tree. To enjoy living fully, all of us need time to relax, leisure time to spend doing the things we want to do. And nowadays, busy homemakers can have that leisure time by depending on the three great Linux home brighteners, those magic new shortcuts to beauty for woodwork, furniture, and floors. Yes, you save drudgery each day with the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, the modern brush-on finish. Linux cream polish for fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. These are the modern preparations which help you to do your work in record time, help you to do it thoroughly, and still enjoy extra leisure. Ask your hardware, paint, or department store for the three great Linux home brighteners, the modern shortcuts to new home beauty. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. Today is file index day at the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 5th and 4th. The giant study is filled with piles of neatly typed cards, 
as Nick and Patsy keep regular tabs on the thousands of criminals the famous detective has encountered in his long career. Charlie Buzz Burns, tried and convicted for forgery July 1941, sentenced August 1941 to seven-year term at Eaton Penitentiary. Check. Well, that finishes the B's. Start the C's. Okay, Nick, but it feels like it's going to be a long, hard day. Um, Albert Cabal. Tried and convicted of first-degree assault, April 1931. Hold it. Hmm? Bell's out on parole. Put his card in the active file with a note. Last seen in St. Louis, July of this year. Right. Johnny Cabin. Tried and convicted... Oh, goody the door. That means a five-minute vacation. Well, whoever it is, send him away. We've got to finish this job. I will, but my heart won't be in it, Nick. Johnny Cabin. Tried and convicted of second-degree murder. Life term at Eastern States. Yes, I remember, Johnny. He was the one who swore no private detective would ever dare to take him. And he was wrong, like the rest of them. No out. more work for today, Nick. We've got a customer. Oh, Patsy, This I is an old friend of mine, Nick, Mr. Peter Simpson. He takes me riding twice a day. Takes you I riding know. twice... Oh, I see. Streetcar conductor. Yes, sir, Mr. Carter. Miss Bowen takes my car every morning and every night. It's across town. Passes right behind his house. Mr. Simpson's got a problem. One of his customers won't get off the trolley. How's that? Well, it's the end of my run behind your house, sir. I left the trolley there and ran up to see you. I remembered Miss Bowen talking about how you help folks out when they get in a jam. I'm in a bad one, sir. What's the trouble? Well, like Miss Bowen said, one of my customers won't get off a car. Why not? Because, Mr. Carter, he's been murdered. <laughs> My trolley car here, Mr. Carter. I closed the doors and left everything. Wait a minute, I'll open a door for you. Uh, come up, sir. Hey, uh, he's in the back of the car. You can see him. He was the last one. And I says to him, last stop, all out. He don't move. I thought he was asleep. All right, Simpson, I understand. Yeah, fine, I thought he would. Oh, Nick, he, he's been stabbed. There's a knife sticking in his side. Yes, wait. Well? Not dead yet, but he will be in a minute. Been bleeding for half an hour, mostly internal. Can't be moved or saved. No hope for him. Oh, oh. Nick. Oh. Hey, wait. He's trying to talk. <laughs> Listen. We're with you. Can you tell us who did this? Stone Valley. What? You said Stone Valley. What? Talking tree. What was that? Talking tree. Killed by talking tree. Million dollars. Million. <laughs> He's dead. Oh. Holy smokes, this is awful, Mr. Carter. I can't have no murdered guys on my car. You're all right, Simpson. Just go out and call Sergeant Matheson and his homicide department. All right. Now let's get to work, Patsy. Empty his pockets. Golly, Nick, what do you mean? Killed by a talking tree and been babbling about a million dollars. I don't know. Dying men usually speak the truth. I'd like to know what the truth is about that talking tree. Well, nothing worthwhile in any of his pockets, Patsy. They're torn and empty. No handkerchief, no wallet. 27 cents in change, total assets. Oh, so... Where do we stand? Nick? Exactly nowhere. What do you mean? No identification of any kind in this man, Betsy. Nothing to tell us who he is or why he was killed. Well, what about the murder weapon? That knife? Just an ordinary kitchen knife. No prints on the handle. Golly. Killer probably sat beside him, drove the knife into his side, got up and left the trolley. That's all. And look at him. Clothes, shabby and torn. Very obviously a tramp. But who'd want to kill a tramp? And for what? I don't know yet. Perhaps... Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? Ah, oh, here's something I overlooked. Seems to be a hard lump in the front corner of the jacket. Probably slipped down from the torn pocket. Here, wait a minute. What is it, Nick? The answer to your question. Look. It, it looks like a big lump of crystal. Happens to be an opal. Opal? You mean that rough piece of peculiar-looking stone is a jewel opal? Uncut and unpolished. Must weigh about 30 carats Ooh. with quite a bit of money. Let's see, this may be the answer to why our victim was killed. Still, it doesn't answer the question of how it came into his possession or explain his dying speech about talking trees. <laughs> <laughs>
What do we do now? Leave the body for Sergeant Matheson and our friends at the homicide department. We're hustling down to the jewel center with this opal. Tampering with evidence again, Nick? Well, maybe that's what the police would call it, but I call it solving a murder. Patsy, I'm going to give you a lesson in the art of jewels. Hmm? The average person doesn't realize that jewelers keep track of gems as closely as the police watch ex-convicts. Every stone of any real value, cut or uncut, can be checked and traced. Here's our place, the International Appraising Company. Well, there are dozens of appraising offices down here. Yes, anyone will do. Come on. Right. Who's that? Customers. I'm just going out to lunch. Better to go to World Appraising across the street. Well, I won't keep you a minute. Come on out. I'm Nick Carter. Listen, I got bad digestion. Not good for me to miss my lunch hour. What's on your mind, Mr. Carter? Trouble? Plenty. It's a case of murder. This happens to be one of the clues, Mr. Bowman. Let's see. Oh, a piece of opal, huh? Right. I'd like to trace it. Know which stock this comes from? General source and so on? Who sells this variety? I can do better than that. I put a price on this stone an hour ago. You what? You heard me, lady. This stone was brought in to me an hour ago for appraisal. I gave them the price and they left. They? How many? Two men. Little guy, looked like a tramp. And the other? Nice looking. Kind of professional looking. Doctor, maybe. Looked like the tramp was trying to sell the stone to the other. Called him Professor. Professor Stevens. Professor Stevens, huh? That's good enough for me. Thanks a lot, Bowman. What's your fee? I've been paid once for appraising this stone. That's enough. Now, go away. I got my digestion to worry about. Thanks. Come on, Patsy. Let's find a university catalog. Maybe we can locate this Professor Stevens and find out about the talking tree. Okay, Patsy, get going. Uptown. Right, Nick. Any luck? All the luck in the world. Professor W.A. Stevens, Chair of Mineralogy at the University. Office 227, Geology Hall. Mineralogy? Well, that could tie in with opals, huh, Nick? It also tie in with a million dollars and a murder. Wish our dead friend had been with a botanist that would have explained the talking tree. Well, maybe we'll find the Stevens doubles in botany or... Careful, Patsy, you're being cut off. Oh. Watch out. Nick, he cut me right over to the curb. Steady. Let me handle this. That wasn't an accident. Stay right where you are, Carter. You too, lady. I got a rod and a license to carry it. Well, hello, Coffin. Patsy, meet Dubsy Coffin. When we get back to our file cards, you'll meet him in the seas. Can the double talk routine, Carter? Now, look, I don't want no trouble from you. Keep the opal if you want. Just give me the map. What map? This is a friendly talk, see? I ain't getting rough because I always like to speak my piece first. We're listening very carefully, Dubsy. Sammy the bum was my pal. So he gets knocked off and a trolley car, so okay. You want to catch the killer? Good luck. But being Sammy was my pal, I'm his inheritor. Get it? I want the map, Carter. The map you took off Sammy. We didn't... Hold it, Patsy. How much is the map worth to you, Dubsy? You ought to know. If you don't, it won't do you no good. We don't know. The dollars? Not that much. But it's worth a big piece of change. To me, not to you. So, all right. Do I get it? Not even if we had it. So, okay. You speak your piece, I speak mine. I'll be seeing you again, Carter. And I'll let something else talk you into handing over the map. Start the car, Patsy. So long, Dubsy. Remember what I told you. To the university, Patsy. Maybe Professor Stevens can tell us what's going on. awfully mixed up in this case, Nick. Well, it isn't simple. The man we found in the trolley was Sammy the Bum? That's what Dubsy Coffin indicated. Right in here. Mm-hmm. Well, from the way Coffin talked, it didn't sound as though he killed him. Could simply be talk. Well, I suppose it could. But he mentioned the map. Do you think Sammy was killed for that? Very possible. Up these stairs. Uh-huh. Well, evidently, there's a map tied up with the opal Sammy was carrying. Yes, but it's my belief the opal's just a side issue. 
Kaufman didn't seem to care about that. And Sammy tried to sell it to Professor Stevens. Then what? Here we what? Are. Hmm? Professor Stevens' office. Oh. Hmm. Maybe he's got a class. Could be. Let's go in and wait. <gasps> Nick! Yes. You'll have to wait a long time to speak to Professor Stevens, Patsy. He's been murdered. <laughs> Two murders for an opal, a missing map, and a mysterious talking tree. How can Nick tie these strange events together? We'll see in just a moment. Everywhere we turn nowadays, modern science has achieved something new, a more efficient means of doing things that need to be done. And science has done a real service for homemakers everywhere in the developing of Linac self-polishing wax, created by leading research chemists to give you the finest way to perfect floor care. Made from a new formula, Linac self-polishing wax offers new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance for every floor surface in your home. And Linac self-polishing wax contains the greatest possible amount of real carnauba wax for that handsome, satiny finish only real wax can give. What's more, the underwriter's laboratories have proved by test that any linoleum, hardwood, or rubber tile floor is actually less slippery after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied. And, of course, Linex self-polishing wax is a double time saver, for it takes only a jiffy to apply and dries quickly to a beautiful surface which is easy to keep clean. So choose genuine Linex self-polishing wax, the finest product of its kind. Ask your dealer now for all three great Linex home brighteners. Give your home new beauty the easy Linex way. And now back to our story. The dying words of a murdered tramp mentioned a talking tree to Nick Cotter. Investigation of the murder and the odd statement led the master detective to the office of Professor Stevens at the university. When Nick and Patsy entered the office, they discovered Stevens murdered. Stevens was shot at close range with a sawed-off shotgun, Patsy, typical gangster's weapon. Head practically torn to pieces. Oh, it's awful, Nick. Nothing in his pockets to help us either. Nothing. So where does that leave us? About one jump ahead of the homicide squad. They won't be pleased with the way I've handled this case. Sergeant Matheson would call it mishandling. And he won't be far from wrong. I'm not happy myself. Well, let's get on the ball, Patsy. Let's do some thinking. Oh, that's your department, Nick. I'm just the audience. Sammy got hold of an opal and a map. We know he showed the opal to Stevens. Mm -hmm. We don't know about the map. Hmm. Stevens and Sammy were killed. The map disappeared. Now, what's so valuable about that map? It showed the mine where the opal came from. But Patsy opals don't come from mines. They Aha! What is it, Nick? Suddenly, my brain started to work. Suddenly, I'm getting a glimmer. Patsy, I think I know what this talking tree business is. What, Nick? Look here. On Stephen's desk. There's an atlas open to this state. Mm -hmm. Now, look across the page where the light hits it. Yeah. You can only see what I want to show you by reflected light. Are you seeing anything unusual? Wait a minute. My eyes aren't as sharp as yours. Yes. I, 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 I see a faint pencil mark. As though a pencil point had tapped the map lightly. In a small town. The town of Dead Tree. Remember that, Betsy. Dead Tree. But that isn't Talking Tree. True enough. And I think that at Dead Tree, we might find a Talking Tree. Hmm? And, Patsy, it's going to speak a language that'll astonish you. Oh, don't be so mysterious, Nick. All right, here's another clue. Opals don't grow in mines. They grow on trees. Tree oh, you're crazy. Oh, you think so, huh? Come on. <laughs> Golly, I'm getting inferiority complex. Going through life three laps behind you the way I do. The only trouble in this case is that I happen to be three steps behind a killer. Well, that puts me out of the running altogether. Back to the round rock this corner. Oh, Nick. Just my luck. Haven't got a gun on me. Down the hall, run. It's a killer. It isn't a well-wisher. Oh, this hole is a dead end. We're trapped. Here. Oh. Through this door, Patsy. Quick. Oh. oh, that was close. That's yeah, too close. Not that the rest of that door wasn't locked. Did, did, did you see who was doing the shooting? No, and the trouble is he saw where we went. What are we going to do? See what we can find to repel the attack. Now, it's a small lab of some sort. If I can only find... Hurry up, Nick. I can hear steps. Oh, got it, Patsy. 
Get out some matches, quick. Matches? You heard me. Well, what are you going to do with matches in that bottle? You're going to light a whole pack of matches and throw it out into the hall. This bottle is ether. I'll break it near the burning matches. All right, light the matches, quick. They're burning, Nick. All right, now throw them out as soon as I open the door. Uh -huh. And I'll throw out the bottle. All right, now. Right, right, quick, Patsy. Uh -huh. Patsy, all clear now. You can come out. Is he still here? Yes, knocked out and burned by the explosion. He'll live and regret it. Well, who is it, Nick? One of Dubsy Coffin's gunmen. Hophead kid named Byrne. Well, I guess Coffin wasn't kidding about letting something else talk for him. But he forgot that some people talk back. Now listen, Patsy. In about 20 seconds, this place is going to be like a beehive. I can hear people coming now. If it wasn't Saturday afternoon, the place would be crowded already. Now we've got to get out of here. Well, then let's go. Not together. We'll hmm? get picked up if they see us running. We'll separate and meet at the car. Okay. Try to stop at a drugstore and pick up some sandwiches. We've got a long drive ahead of us. Where to? Dead tree? Right. We're going to Dead Tree to find the talking tree. <laughs> Too many already. And I'm supposed to be on a diet. Well, they weren't the best sandwiches I ever had either. I feel as if I were getting Bowman's indigestion. <laughs> oh. How much further is it, Nick? It's getting dark. We should be in Dead Tree any minute. We've passed six signs in the last six miles. Each one said Dead Tree half a mile. Well, at least we're holding our own. They should have added a prox. I think we're a prox there now. <laughs> this looks like a town. What there is of it. Well, give me a second to get used to it. Yes, it's a town, all right. And a three-point landing in front of our objective. The sheriff's office? Right. Come on. Oh, we're not going to get into trouble again, are we? I've got visions of Sergeant Matheson waiting for us back in town. He'll greet us with comparatively open arms if we bring him home a solution. All right, let's go in. Okay. Yeah? Is this the sheriff, uh... Denson. Yeah? Well, my name's Nick Carter. Yeah? Sheriff Denson, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Yeah? I assume that means go ahead and ask. Yeah. Well, do you keep any kind of a check on vagrants passing through Dead Tree? Yeah. Well, do you recall whether a tramp answering to the name of Sammy the Bum passed through here last week? Yeah. How long was he in this section? Don't know. Maybe a couple of days. Golly! He can say something else, can't he? Please, Patsy. Mm -hmm. I can talk, young lady, when there's something worth wasting breath over. Well, why is this town called Dead Tree? On account of a section of sandy waste up in the hills. You mean desert? Yep, yeah, kind of like the desert up in Maine. Windswept section, about ten miles square. Nothing but sand and rocks, all eroded. I thought so. Probably petrified trees up there, too, huh? Well, that's what gives the town its name. How'd you know, Nick? Couldn't be any other answer, Betsy. Two more questions, Sheriff. That desert area is constantly enlarging and changing as the wind sweeps it, huh? Yep. Yeah. Will you show us how to drive there, close as possible? Yeah. Sheriff, are you 170 years old? No. Nope. Patsy, for the love of Pete. I'm sorry. I just wanted to hear him say no. And I did. Afraid we can't drive any further, Patsy. We'll have to hoof it through the desert. Golly. It looks just like the real thing, doesn't it? Sand and rocks. And petrified trees. Come on. Mm-hmm. We'll have to keep pretty quiet now. The sand will deaden our footsteps, fortunately. Because there's a strong chance the killer may be up here ahead of us. Oh. Do you know where to look for him, Nick? I do. We'll find him under the talking tree. Oh, Nick. I'm not fooling. Well, all right, if you say so. But where we find the talking tree? I'm not sure. We'll have to listen for it. Listen through ten square miles? We won't have to cover that much. See if Sammy located it. It couldn't be very far off the road. Probably he turned off the road we drove down to sleep in the warm sand at night. So the tree can't be far from here. Golly, I'm listening for it like mad. I don't hear anything yet. Keep trying. It's awfully dark, Nick. Can't we use a light? Safer not to. Keep your ears open. 
Okay. Golly, those twisty black tree stumps, they look so spooky. It's as petrified trees, Betsy. Dead thousands of years, they can't hurt you. Well, I wish they'd talk to me and get this over. Maybe they will. Keep listening. Nick? Yes? I, I think I hear a funny noise. Like water running. Not here in this desert. No, not water. It sounds like... Like music. Hmm? Listen. Yes. I hear it, Patsy. That's what we've been searching for. The talking tree? That's the way those trees talk. Oh. It's coming from around that small hummock. Oh, come on, let's go interview it. Mm. Careful now. Very careful now. I think I hear someone digging or something. The killer. Here? Told you we'd find him under the talking tree. Quiet. And watch. What's he digging up petrified tree for? Let's go down and ask him. Oh, Nick, be careful. You haven't got a gun. I've got something that will take its place. Good evening. Can we help you? Carter. What? It's the man from the appraises. Bowman. Don't me, Carter. Don't move. You're covered. Why am I? Such rough talk must be difficult for a man of your culture, Mr. Bowman. Or should I call you by your real name, Professor Stevens? Me? All right, Carter, you're asking for this. Oh, look out, Nick. Here you are, Bowman. Oh. 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 Professor is a rank amateur when it comes to handling a gun. Oh, nice going, Nick. How'd you do it? Merely threw a handful of sand in his eyes. And when he was blinded, hit him. That's all. That's all? Well, that's enough. Now you have his gun and he's out cold. And he's also on his way to the electric chair. Nick, do you mean to tell me Professor Stevens murdered Sammy the Bum? Yes, Patsy. And then pretended he was killed himself. Uh, and he did all that for the sake of a dead tree? Well, take my flashlight, Patsy, and look at that dead tree. <gasps> Golly! It's all crystal and glittery and... Oh, it's like a tree of jewels. Pure opal, Patsy. An opal tree worth a fortune. Too bad we don't hang killers in this state. It'd be an excellent place to hang Professor Stevens. <laughs> return to Nick Carter in just a moment to hear the final details of The Talking Tree. Regardless of your furniture's original gleaming beauty, probably you've noticed how finger marks, dust smudges, and deposits of inferior polish can combine to give it a dull, cloudy look. But with Linex Cream Polish, you can restore your furniture's good looks in no time. For Linex Cream Polish cleans as it polishes, cutting the job in half. Yes, it's true. One quick application of Linex Cream Polish does the job, saving you half the time, half the work. No wonder so many thousands of modern American women are coming to depend upon Linex Cream Polish, the up-to-date beauty treatment for fine furniture. It's the streamlined way to furniture care, for it cuts down future work as well. You see, Linex Cream Polish dries hard, leaving no oil on the surface to attract more dust. So get Linex Cream Polish now. You will find all three great Linex Home Brighteners, Linex Cream Polish, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, and Linex Clear Gloss, the longer-lasting brush-on finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that brings quick new sparkle to walls and ceilings. Chemtone covers in one coat dries in one hour. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, you'd better start at the beginning and explain everything. I'm entirely at sea now. All right, Patsy. The story started millions of years ago when the trees of Dead Tree Valley died and started petrifying. Uh huh. After untold centuries, deep under the ground... They turned to stone and then began to crystallize into opal. Oh. Today, as the wind slowly ate away the sand and earth covering them, they were brought to the surface. And when Sammy went out to sleep in the desert, he slept under this opal tree that had been uncovered by the wind? Right. The talking oh. part was the tinkle of the crystalline branches swaying in the wind. Oh. Sammy broke off a piece of the tree and took it into town, went to Stevens for advice, since he didn't know the value of that opal. Well, then what? Stevens saw the maps Sammy had made and, of course, the jewel. He went with Sammy to have it appraised, just to make sure it was valuable enough to pay him to commit murder. 
When he found it was, he killed Sammy for the map. But he staged his own murder, too. Why? Sammy talked too much. Stevens didn't know Sammy had told his old pal, Dubsy Coffin. But he did know Sammy told the real Bowman, the appraiser. So to protect the secret, he killed Bowman, probably only a few minutes before we entered the store. You remember he stalled before coming out to talk to us? Oh, that's right. I remember he talked about his indigestion. He pretended to be Bowman. Then rushed the body to his own office at the university, perhaps in a laundry basket or a bag. And there, staged his own death. Uh, he didn't know it, Nick, but that was just a preview of what's really going to happen to him. It doesn't pay to play act with Nick Carter. Well, that was an unusual tale, Nick. Now, how about a preview of next week's story? What's it going to be? Well, next week, Ken, I'm going to tell you about the case of an 80-year-old man. Feeble, sick, harmless, who suddenly began driving down the highways like a savage, injuring people, wrecking cars, and generally behaving like a maniac. Oh, I remember. It was all because of a beautiful Egyptian queen who died 3,000 years ago. Breaking traffic laws because of a dead queen. Sounds good. What do you call the case? The case of the queen's eyebrows. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson plays Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Alfred Bester, and any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linex Self-Polishing Wax, Linex Cream Polish, and Linex Clear Gloss. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linex dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux Home Brighteners. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Howling Horse, in which Nick Carter goes hunting in a forest of death and tracks down a fabulous four-legged killer. enjoyable living, for real contentment, it is necessary that we have time to relax. Time to do the things we like, as well as to do the necessary things. And these days, American homemakers everywhere are learning that one important way to enjoy leisure time is to depend on the three great Linux home brighteners, those magic new shortcuts to beauty for woodwork, furniture, and floors. You, too, can save drudgery each day with those three great Linux home brighteners. Linex Clear Gloss, the modern brush-on finish. Linex Cream Polish for fine furniture. And Linex Self-Polishing Wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. Try these fine modern products designed to help you do your work in record time. You'll find that they're a really efficient way to leisure time for you. Ask your hardware, paint, or department store for the three great Linex Home Brighteners, the modern shortcuts to new home beauty. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. The lights are out in the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 5th and 4th. In the darkened laboratory, the strange whine of electricity sounds. And under the pale purple aura of ultraviolet light, Nick Carter and Patsy play a strange jigsaw puzzle game with crime. 
Wait a minute, Patsy. Mm-hmm. This letter A matches the A and bequeath. Just a moment. Yes, an exact duplicate. Make a note of that. Right. Well, making progress. A word here on this slip. Mm-hmm. Exactly duplicates the here and hereby bequeath. You got that? I've got it. Better and better. Ah. See that word will in last will and testament? Uh Uh-huh. A precise duplicate of the written will from this thank you note. Who's that? Hiya, folks. It's the demon reporter himself in person. Why, it's Scubby. Oh, hello, Scubby. Pardon the interruption, masterminds. The housekeeper let me in. Well, what's cooking, good looking? Nick's testing the validity of a will, Scubby. We're matching samples of the dead man's writing with the writing in the will. Oh, very interesting. Do they match? Precisely. Well, then the will is genuine, eh? On the contrary, the will's a forgery. Huh? Now turn off the ultraviolet, Patsy. Put on the lights. Hey, I don't get it, Nick. If the writing in the will dovetails with other letters, doesn't that prove the same guy wrote both? No, Scubby. The fact that words and individual letters from old correspondence match words and letters in the will proves someone forged the will by tracing the dead man's handwriting. Very clever. Very clever indeed. It'll make a nice feature article when I finish with my story on the howling horse. It... Did you say howling horse, Scubby? Yes, beautiful. I'm on my way upstate to cover one of the craziest stories that ever hit the desk. I thought Nick might be interested. What is it, Scubby? Well, it seems there's a guy upstate named Lucas who has... A.B. Lucas? Three degrees in medicine, archaeology, and natural philosophy? Explored the Gobi Desert in 36? Yeah, the very same. Mm. Well, this Lucas must be pretty wealthy. He's got a big estate, about 700 acres of forest and lake. But what about that howling horse you mentioned? Well, there's a story that Lucas brought back a couple of horses with him from one of his explorations, and they howl. Nonsense. (laughs) They also kill cattle. Ridiculous. These horses of Dr. Lucas also have murdered a man. Oh, no. Well, that's the story I'm going to check. Are you interested, Nick? In horses that murder men? Certainly am. I'll use my car. We should reach the Lucas estate by nightfall. Let's go. Sit down, Mr. Carter. Ma'am. Thank you. The other gent, too. Thanks. I'm mighty happy to have you with us in the burning. Well, thank you very much, Sheriff Crane. Yes, well, the case too tough for you to handle, eh, Sheriff? Well, uh, you betcha. It'd be too tough for anybody except Mr. Carter here. Working out of court in anyway. You better explain, Sheriff. Well, it's like this. Lucas ain't an amiable man. Not by a long shot. Keeps himself locked up in that estate. Nobody can get him. Nobody sees him. He kind of acts like he's scared of something. Hiding. But he's a mighty powerful man in this county. Got influential friends. My hands are tied. I can't buck it. But you can, Mr. Carter. I hear you're a fighter that don't care a hoot where the punches land. Well, I try to live up to that reputation, Sheriff Crane. Now, tell me about Lucas's horses. Don't know a thing. He brought them back with him about six months ago. Moved them in in horse vans. Nobody's seen them. Well, pretty soon people start talking about them horses howling. They're sure about them howling? Yep. Then... One or two folks seen one of them running around Lucas's estate. A big black critter. Seen him at night. Mean and ornery. Mm. But pretty soon they started killing cattle. Rip them apart with their teeth. Folks sued Lucas. He just laughed. Told them they was crazy. Swore he didn't own no horses. I see. Last week, Jed Storm was killed. On the road that passes Lucas's estate. Head was near torn off. Body all ripped to pieces. I figured maybe the law better step in. I had to pull every string I could to even get into Lucas's estate. Search the place from top to bottom, house, barns, everything. Well, sir, Lucas was telling the truth. There ain't no horses there. You're sure, Sheriff? Ma'am, I'm a farmer before I'm a sheriff. You can't fool a farmer on things like that. All right, Sheriff. We'll start tonight and see what we can find. Uh, just one warning, Mr. Carter. Maybe I sound kind of fantastic-like, but... Believe me, I ain't been stretching the truth. You go slow, and you go careful. That Lucas is me. Them horses is deadly. Thanks for the warning, Sheriff, but I've met deadly killers before. And Nick is still here, which is more than you can say for most of the killers he's met.
directions are right, this must be the road that skirts Lucas's estate. Keep your eyes on the left. We ought to sight the house any minute now. It's pitch dark, Nick. Watch for lights. Oh, well, what's the program, Nick? You going to bust right in? Going to try. I don't know how tough Lucas really is. Maybe he's just bluffing Sheriff Crane. Nick, I can see lights off to the left. Yeah? Where away, Skipper? Deep in the woods there. See? Yeah. The lady's right, Nick. I see them. That must be Lucas's house, all right. Yes. There's a gravel drive turning off the road. Here goes. I'll be more than interested to meet Lucas again. Oh, you know him, Nick? Casually. I had a rather distasteful job of checking his credentials for the government some years ago. Intelligence work. Believe me, it was a nasty interview. Nick! Hey, oh, 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 Pete, Nick. Someone's bombarding us. Oh, stop the car, Nick. We'll be blown out. Stop anyway. There's a roadblock ahead. Oh. Hey, this doesn't look like a block to me. Lucas is playing for keeps. This is private property. You are trespassing on private property. I shall give you five minutes to get out of here. Where's that voice coming from? He's using a public dress speaker out on the grounds. He's probably got the microphone this in the house. This is your last warning, whoever you are. You have five minutes to get out my ground. Apparently, we haven't much choice. Was that Chinese? It was, and raises a very curious question in a fantastic case. Let's back out to the road and start finding the answer to it. All right. This is far enough. Let's get out. Okay. Well, where are we now, Nick? About half a mile past Lucas's house. We're going to cut into the woods from here, then circle around to the house. Well, I got my flashlight. Lead on, Nick. No, no, Scotty. No flashlight. We do this in the dark. Oh, well, Patsy, you can wait in the car if you want to. Oh, who, me? Why, you talk as though you think I'm scared. Well, aren't you? Well, yes, but I won't admit it. All right. I'll hold your hand, beautiful. Uh, I'm not that scared. Now, listen, we've got to be as quiet as possible. Hey, do you think that we're going to meet any wild horses, Nick? I don't know, Scotty. Nick. You haven't explained yet about Lucas talking in Chinese. Not sure I understand yet myself. Oh, I sure wish I'd covered the beauty contest instead of this guy. Hold everything. What is it? Quiet. Listen. Hear that? Jeepers, did I? It sounds like howling. There it is again. Howling horses, I said. <laughs> nonsense, Nick Carter said. Well, is it nonsense now, Nick? A howling horse. Hey, it's coming closer. Are we just going to stand here and wait, Nick? We are not. Gunshot, come on, hurry. What's happening, Nick? Someone's being chased by Scubby's howling horse. Someone is using a gun to protect himself with a lover. Careful now, whatever you do. Hold your head. I know where you are. Get your flashlight out, Scubby, and flash it straight ahead, quick. I want to get a look at that horse if he's still there. Right. Here you are. There. There is nothing. There's nothing at all. Nothing but a body of a man sprawled there in the grass. <gasps> a body without a head. <laughs> Nick paces the last few steps forward to examine the victim of a murder he could not prevent. Who is the dead man? How did Lucas' fantastic creatures track and kill him? Why did Lucas cry a warning in Chinese? Can Nick answer these questions in time? We'll see in just a moment. Modern science is constantly achieving miracles, constantly finding new ways, better ways to do the things which must be done. And science has done its share of service for our American homemakers. Take, for example, the three great Linux home brighteners, which are proving such an aid to women everywhere. There's Linux self-polishing wax, for example, created by leading research chemists to give you the finest. Made from a brand new formula, Linux self-polishing wax offers new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance for every floor surface in your home. And Linux self-polishing wax contains the greatest possible amount of real carnauba wax, for that handsome, satiny finish only real wax can give. What's more, the underwriter's laboratories have proved by test that any linoleum, hardwood, or rubber tile floor is actually less slippery after Linux self-polishing wax has been applied. 
And, of course, Linex self-polishing wax saves time two ways, for it takes only a jiffy to apply and dries quickly. And then its beautiful protective surface saves you future work because it's so easy to keep clean. Choose genuine Linex self-polishing wax and know what it is to use the finest. Ask your dealer now for all three great Linex home brighteners. Give your home new beauty the easy Linex way. And now back to our story. The strange story of savage howling horses that hunt and kill men brought Nick, Patsy, and Scubby to the small upstate town of Avernum. When Nick drives out to the estate of C.B. Lucas, famous explorer who has brought the animals to America, he is warned off by Lucas, who shouts at the master detective in Chinese. When Nick, Patsy, and Scubby attempt to steal into the estate on foot, they witness the tracking down and killing of a man by one of Lucas' savage creatures. Now, in the blackness of a forest clearing, they examine the dead body. Oh, what a mess this fellow is. Yes, head torn off completely. Apparently, Dr. Lucas's man-eating horse took it away with him. And did you hear the way it howled? It was like a lion or, or something. Oh, that wasn't any lion or anything else that I ever heard of. You're right, Scully. Wait a minute. Well, this is odd. What, Nick? Look at the gun this fellow was carrying. Huh? Lying beside his right hand. For the love of Pete, what is it? Happens to be a Patterson Colt. Model of 1848. 1848? You mean a hundred years old? It's about. This is one of the original Colt models. Fired with percussion caps. Oh, but that doesn't make sense, Nick. Why would a man defend himself with an antique like that? Well, if you remember, Scabby, that when Lucas warned us off, he talked in Chinese, it does make sense. Well, not to me, it doesn't. We will in a very few minutes. Come on. Get up to Lucas's house. Well, aren't you going to search that body for identification or something? No, we won't find any. How do you know? Let's concentrate on being quiet, shall we? Okay. Put that flash out, Scubby. Sure. Now stay on your toes. Dr. Lucas' charming pets may be closer than you think. Nick? Yes? I, I can see the house lights from here straight ahead. Yes. All right, quick now. Oh. Oh, I sure wish there was a moon. It's... You're not getting romantic, are you, Scubby? Heck no. I'm just scared of the dark. Wait a minute. Listen. It's a funny sound. Like machinery or something. It's not machinery. Hurry, let's get to the house. Take this path here. Nick, that sound is awfully familiar. I just can't place it. Familiar to you, Scubby? Well, yeah. Coming over the PA, Lucas has on the ground. Over the PA? Right. Our quick into the house. Those French windows at the side look open. Open? They're smashed. Like a truck went through them. So they are. Careful of broken glass. Oh, Nick, look at this room. Yeah, looks as if the truck drove through here, too. Yeah. Where is Dr. Lucas? I have a hunch that something's happened to Dr. Lucas, Patsy. Something that accounts for the funny noise you hear over the PA. Come on. Uh, I don't like this. Crane's advice Oh, for the love of... Yes, I rather expected this. It's a body. Scrolled alongside that phonograph. And it's a needle running in the last groove in the record that's making that strange sound, Patsy. I'm afraid Dr. Lucas has played this phonograph for the last time. Better take the playing arm off the record, Scotty. Yeah, right, Nick. Now, let's have a look at this body. Oh, lots of blood. Body quite warm till very recently. Mm-hmm. The same way our friend back in the woods was killed. Head torn off. Only this time the head was left with the body. But this isn't Dr. Lucas. Nick, look at the head. He's Chinese. Glory be, you're right, Patsy. Then this explains why we heard a warning in Chinese over the PA when we first drove up to the house. Right, Nick? Scubby, start that record again. This man couldn't talk English, so he had an English-speaking record made to, to warn people off the ground. Play it, right? Scubby, play it quick. Okay. Turn off the PA first. We'll hear it direct. Right, Nick. This is private property. You are trespassing on private property. I will give you five minutes to get out of here. What'd I tell you, Nick? That's the voice we heard. This is your last warning, whoever you are. Five minutes to get off my ground. Please, turn off my chin. Please, turn off my chin. Oh, the love a couple of hatchet men. Please, so now move. A target and self-highly expert in use of lethal firearms. Kindly, raise arms to extreme vertical position. Remain with back against wall. Thank you. Oh, now listen, wise guy. Please, to remain silent. So, 
We have made long journey for most prosperous meeting, Mr. Lucas. Lucas? Well, this Quiet, is... Patsy. Was extremely injudicious to take away Gucci Chang, Mr. Lucas. Rash action put miserable selves to extreme expense of body and purse for long journey. Yes? Now necessary to locate Gucci Chang at once. It's ever that number two associate as yet unsuccessful in task. Remains for self and miserable number one associate. Hey, what in blazes is it? Mr. Lucas, you will please inform this person of locality of Goshi Chang. May miserable Fang Pai remind honorable Mr. Lucas, this person highly barbaric species. Lack refining benefits of civilized education. Much prepared to obtain required information with cruel methods of contemptible savage. Golly, Nick. Oh, who is this Goshi Jung character you birds are after? He's the guy I think you mean. He's dead. Be like... quiet, Scubby. Ah, this news highly interesting. It's true, Mr. Lucas, that Goshi Jung departed to join all of our ancestors. Whatever it is. Then the uh, task of this person reaches to minimum. Only necessary to ensure demise of you and friends and then return to home. Our demise? But we... Can... This is why I'm in King Fu and I'm in This is the payoff. Look out, Scubby. You're going to throw the grab. This way, Patsy. Scubby, get moving. All right. Through this door. Move fast. Oh, you blocked them off. That photo grab wasn't a bullet. You can't block bullets as easily. They'll be recovering up any minute now to start shooting. This must be the kitchen. Straight ahead and out the back door. Do you think we can shake them, Nick? We move fast enough we can. All right, I'll get the door. Drew, Patsy, quick. Come on, Scubby. Go right with you. Oh. oh. Now what? Quiet and keep running. Come on. We'll stand a 50-50 chance of shaking them in the dark out here. Why didn't you tell them you weren't looking? You think they'd believe me? Hey, this looks like a garage ahead. In them, hurry. Careful. There's a car here. Don't bang into it. All right, now what, Nick? Oh, we can just hold out long enough. Sheriff Crane will rescue us. Huh? What do you mean, Patsy? Well, when you were examining the body, I called the sheriff and notified him about the two deaths. What? He said he was coming right up as soon as he could get his posse together. Oh, good work, Patsy. That's for a little darling every time. That's about the worst news I've ever had. But, Nick, I... I understand, Patsy. It's too late to explain now. All right, here's what we do. Yeah, we're listening, Nick. Get into this car. Drive out of the garage like 60 and get past those two killers. Uh Okay. Okay. I'll take the wheel. You two hold on now. All right. Here goes. I'm cutting straight across the lawns and fields. Let's hope the tires hold. Holy God! They don't get us now. We're safe. I think we, I think we made it. You all right back there? I guess so. Watch yeah. out. We're going straight through the fields to that patch of woods where we found the first victim of Goshi Jung. Oh, for Pete's sake, why? I'm going to perform the nastiest piece of business I've ever been forced to do. I'm going to run a human drag line. <laughs> Scotty, this is what we do. We're going to take the body of this unfortunate fellow and drag it. Oh, holy smokes, where? Get across Lucas's land, away from the house. Quick, give me a hand with the body. Okay, Nick. But why, Nick? We're going to set a drag line for Do- Goshi Jock. All right, let's start moving, shall we? Okay, Nick. Yeah. Nick, what's a drag line? Folks use it down south for fox hunting, Patsy. Especially when there aren't any foxes in the neighborhood. It's an artificial trail. Well, I understand, but why do why we have... For the sake of Sheriff Crane and any men he may bring with him. Don't forget, Dosi Jung is around the house and grounds. And the killer. We better turn ourselves into bait to save their lives. Good old howling horse. Why didn't Lucas leave him where he found him? Nick, did Lucas discover Dosi Jung? No, Ben. A gentleman by the name of Marco Polo discovered him. Marco Polo? Yes. On just the other side of that tree, Scubby. All right, Nick. Dosi Jung was discovered many centuries ago. But he's unknown in the Western world. He was, that is, until Lucas brought him here. I warn you. Sooner or later, he'll pick up the scent of this trail we're making and come after us. And believe me, it'll be a tremendous shock. Oh, nothing could shock me anymore. Well, you've never seen anything like go see junk, Scully. Golly. Got the clean. Fortunately, there's a brisk wind blowing. If he doesn't pick up this blood trail, maybe he'll pick up ours. And he... Wait, wait. Hear that? Yeah, I hear it. We're in luck. We must send it. Keep moving, Shelby. Oh. Here at the top of that little hill. All right. He got closer. He's as fast as a racehorse. Yeah, and he howls like a pack of... Nick, I just got it. Good. No time to talk about it. All right. Oh. 
This is far enough. Put the body down, Scubby. Okay. Get your flashlight ready. Patrick. Yes, Nick. I want you to stand to my left. Here's an extra magazine for my automatic. Hold it. When I yell for it, slap it into my left hand. Okay. Oh, what a monster. Stand by. Oh, it sounds awful close. He should be in sight any second now. Right, Scubby, straight ahead. Right. Oh. Nick, for the love of me. Nick, you mean to say that the class thing was the dog? I do. That was Goshi Jung. The fabulous, almost mythical Tibetan master. This is the first and probably the last time we'll ever see this breed. And in killing it, we've destroyed the monster that murdered Dr. C.B. Lucas. In just a few minutes, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and describe the strange creature thought to be the howling horse. When your furniture was new, of course you were proud of its handsome, gleaming appearance. Since then, it may be that finger marks, dust smudges, the cloudy look of inferior polish have made your furniture look dull and unattractive. But with Linex Cream Polish to help you out, you can restore its appearance in double quick time. For Linex Cream Polish cleans as it polishes cutting the job in half. Yes, one quick application of Linex Cream Polish removes all the cloudy dullness from your furniture, leaves it gleaming and beautiful. And because it dries hard, leaving no oily film on the surface to attract more dust, it saves you future work as well. No wonder so many thousands of modern American women are coming to depend on Linex Cream Polish, the up-to-date beauty treatment for fine furniture. Get Linex Cream Polish now. You'll find all three great Linex Home Brighteners, Linex Cream Polish, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, and Linex Clear Gloss, the longer-lasting brush-on finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that brings quick new sparkle to walls and ceilings. Chemtone covers in one coat, dries in one hour. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. I had heard of the Tibetan masters before, Patsy. Hmm? You'll find an interesting chapter on that strange animal in a pamphlet on Chinese dogs published by the Quan Quan Company in Los Angeles in 1944. It's one of the oldest defense breeds in the world, and is so revered in Tibet that none has ever been allowed out of that country. Goshi Jung means dog of Tibet. Oh. Well, aren't there any pictures, Nick? No, the Tibetans do not permit pictures to be taken, Patrick. Oh. All we have are the descriptions of various explorers from Marco Polo down. All describe the giant dog as being the size of a horse. Well, it sure was, Nick. There have been attempts to steal one of the mastiffs and bring them out of the country, but in each case, the dog has either been stolen back or killed. So Dr. Lucas managed to steal Goshi Chung. Right. He brought it to his estate and then lived in constant fear, knowing the Tibetans would never let him keep the dog. He knew that sooner or later they'd send men to kill it. And they did. And that's why he kept himself locked up? Precisely. Lucas made that recorded warning to play over his PA system whenever strangers drove up. He was undoubtedly warned by some sort of mechanical device that was set off by our entrance to the ground. He also repeated it in Chinese to warn off any Chinese gunmen who might have trailed him here. Mm, Then it really was Lucas we heard. Yes. You see, Patsy, the dog apparently turned savage and broke loose from the chains with which it was confined. Lucas could not recapture it. So it roamed the estate, killing everything it met. Oh. In fact, right before our eyes, we saw it kill a man. And that was Mr. Fang's number two assistant, prowling around the grounds. The mastiff ran off with a dead man's head in his jaws, crashed into Lucas's house, and attacked Lucas himself. Then it dropped the head of the Chinese and tore off Lucas's head and rushed off with it. Exactly. Oh. That's why you and Scubby leaped to the conclusion that the head we found alongside Lucas's body actually belonged to that body. Well... When did you first begin to understand what was happening, Nick? When I saw that the first victim had been carrying an old Patterson coat. Hmm? There's only one section of the world that continues to use antique firearms, Patsy. And that's the mountain regions of China. 
In Tibet, you'll still find soldiers equipped with flintlock rifles and old Civil War weapons. Golly. Well, what about those killers from Tibet that came after the dog net? The men that thought you were Lucas. Probably slipped off and started back for home. We'll never see them again, and there's no need to, really. They haven't been guilty of any crime. All the guilty parties in question have already paid in full. Well, Nick, that was certainly an unusual tale. What's next week's story going to be about? Next week, Ken, we're going to meet a strange young man who, as far as anyone knew, never touched alcohol at all, yet apparently came home intoxicated night after night. Then one evening, he was murdered. And that was the evening he carried home with him a can opener seven feet long. And his murder was revealed by a silkworm. A giant can opener and telltale silkworms. Sounds like a swell story. What's its title, Nick? The Case of the Worried Worm. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Long Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson plays Betsy. Original music is played by George Wright. The script is by Alfred Bester. The programs are fictional, and any resemblance therein to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Master Detective is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, Shakespeare's Ghost in which Nick Carter tracks a disappearing corpse and a ghost is accused of murder. Nick Carter is brought to you each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux cream polish, Linux clear gloss, and Linux self-polishing wax. You know there's no time like New Year's for making good resolutions. And ladies, one of the best resolutions you can make for 1946 is that you'll keep your floors sparkling bright and beautiful with Linux self-polishing wax, the anti-skid wax finish that beautifies your floors without making them slippery. Your folks are sure to appreciate the added skid resistance Linux self-polishing wax gives and how proud you'll be of the satiny, lustrous appearance it lends all your floors and linoleum. Depend on Linux self-polishing wax, the modern way to new floor beauty. Ask your dealer for it by name. Linux self-polishing wax, the anti-skid floor finish that wipes on in a jiffy, dries without tiresome rubbing. You'll find Linux self-polishing wax at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. As we look in on the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 4th and 5th, Nick is clearing up the files on his desk as Patsy answers the door. Let's see. Lex Clanton, convicted of arson, 15 years. Harry hey. Norris. Hmm? I'm to see you. Uh, Mr. Carter, my name is J.T. Reed. 
But I don't suppose that means anything to you. Not unless you're the J.T. Reed who bought the original letters of John Keats, the poet, at the Gibson Auction Galleries on March 15th, 1920. Why, that's amazing. Absolutely right, even to the day of the month. How in the world did you know that, Mr. Carter? Oh, I've always been interested in literary memorabilia. And an important sale like that stuck in my mind, that's all. I see. Well, as you may surmise, I have quite a collection of rare books and manuscripts. Now, last week, a Mr. Rodney Stone called at my country home. He was a fully accredited representative of Latchford and Blake. The English firm of rare book dealers? Uh, correct. And as their American representative, he offered to sell me a copy of the Gutenberg Bible. Mm -hmm. But as all my capital is invested in books, I told Mr. Stone that at present I was more interested in selling some books than in buying. And he offered to sell some for you? Yes. His credentials were so good, I gave him my first folio Shakespeare and a few other items. Mm. He signed a receipt for them and took them to his hotel here in town. Well, Mr. Reed, you wouldn't be here unless something had gone wrong. What is it? Well, uh, uh, just to make sure, I checked Stone's hotel and he was registered there. But then I sent a cable to his London office to confirm the details. And this, Mr. Carter, is the answer I just received. We have no American representative named Rodney Stone. His credentials obviously forged. I suggest you contact Nick Carter immediately to investigate this fraud. Ask for them, Blake, London. I took their advice, Mr. Carter, and came here at once. Yes, I've handled two or three cases for them. Have you been to Stone's Hotel? Well, I thought I'd better see you first. I phoned, however. He's still registered there. Well, it's probably a fairly amateurish swindle case, but I don't like to disappoint people who cable a recommendation 3,000 miles. Uh, then you'll go with me to see Stone? Yes, and there's another reason, too, Mr. Reed. I've always had a soft spot for Shakespeare. Come on, let's go rescue old Master Will from the clutches of a rather clumsy con man. You say it was the first complete edition of Shakespeare's plays, Mr. Reed? Why, it must be 300 years old. 322, to be exact, Patsy. Wow. The folios were printed in 1623. And my copy is of special interest. The flyleaf is signed by Ben Johnson, Shakespeare's friend and fellow poet. A Johnson copy? Wow. Yes. Oh, there's a legend about that copy. <laughs> Very foolish, I suppose, but... Yes, uh... I know the legend. Well, what is it, Nick? Three times in three centuries, that copy has been stolen. And each time, the thief has been found later with his head cut off. Oh, slightly grisly, what? The legend is that Shakespeare's ghost comes back and slays the thief for meddling with his friend Johnson's copy. And that's the copy that this man Stone has stolen? Uh, yes, Miss Bowen. And if this legend is true, then he... his head... Oh, nonsense. Just a silly story, Betsy. Yes? Well, if you think it's a silly story, why have you stepped on the gas? Still no answer. Uh, I'll try it. Never mind. I'll open the door. Uh, but how? I always carry skeleton keys. There. Let's go in. Nick. Great heavens. Inside, quickly. Both of you. Shut the door. It's that man on the floor. His head. Just like the legend. I suppose that's Rodney Stone, Mr. Reed. It was. Oh, poor chap. Oh, just look at this room. There must have been a terrific struggle. Yes. Furniture overturned, blood all over, clothes almost ripped from the body. Oh, what a battle he must have put up to save himself. Well, one thing's certain. Our simple case of fraud has certainly become a lot more serious. Uh, the bedroom door's open. I'll go in and see whether there's anything in there. Are you going to examine the body, Nick? In a moment, Betsy. First, I want to get an old, an old over picture of the room from here. Uh-huh. I often tell a lot just from standing in one spot, getting kind of a perspective on the crime. For instance, the position of the body... Location of the bloodstains. The way the clothes are ripped. It looks as if the ghost of Shakespeare is struck again. Mr. Carter, Mr. Carter, come in here, quick. Right with you. Uh, look what I found on the windowsill here, Mr. Carter. Don't touch it. Let me see. A sword. A bloodstained sword. Yes. 16th century Claymore. A 16th century sword? The thief's head cut off? Why, it all fits. Well, Mr. Carter... What do you think of the legend of Shakespeare's ghost now? If 
find any clues, Nick? No. Bring me a pillowcase from that bed, will you, Bessie? I want to wrap up this sword. Yes, Nick. Uh, how do you explain it, Mr. Carter? I don't yet. This is the 23rd floor. That door was locked from the inside. There's no fire escape or balcony outside these windows. Here's a pillowcase, Nick. Thanks. Now, gently. That's it. Well, it's, it's a good thing we're all intelligent adults because it certainly looks like the work of a ghost. That's one of the things that bothers me, Mr. Reed. It looks too much like ghosts. I think I'll go back and give the body a closer examination for it. What? What is it, Nick? What's wrong? Look, Patsy. <gasps> Where the body? It's disappeared. Vanished. <laughs> Hand me that microscope slide, Bessie. Here you are. Nick, why didn't you investigate the other rooms on the 23rd floor of that hotel when we found no one had been seen leaving the floor since we came up? You can't search people's rooms without their permission or a warrant. Besides, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And catch a murderer? Right. Now, I just want to check the blood cell structure from the stains on the sword. Well, how can you tell whether it was Stone's blood? I can't, but I can be sure it's human blood. Evidence can be framed, you know. Uh-huh. Well, how about it? Yeah, human blood, all right. Hmm. Been on that sword about seven hours, which means about six hours before we found it. What does that prove? Could prove or disprove a great deal. That's going to steal punch, will you? Sure. I just want to take a small chip off this sword. There. Ah, obviously, hand forged. Now I'll smelt down this little piece over a high heat flame. Here's a crucible. Thanks. Now, Patsy, while you're waiting for that steel chip to melt, we should look up J.T. Reed in our file. All right, Nick. Are you sure we've got him listed? You ought to be there. Uh huh. Here's his card. Joseph T. Reed, chief interest books, manuscripts, and curios. And... Mm-hmm. Oh, quite a patriotic citizen too. Did a lot of volunteer war work. He did, huh? Uh huh. Very interesting. Let me see that. Oh, there's a signal on the heat gauge, Nick. The steel's melted. Better tend to that first. Mm-hmm. Now, I'll just add this catalyst. Aha. Uh -huh. Just as I thought. What's the matter, Nick? Was the sword a modern fake? On the contrary, Patsy. The chemicals used in its manufacture prove almost conclusively that it's authentic Elizabethan. Now, let me see Reed's file card. Here you are. Nick, why were you so anxious to prove the sword is genuine? Because it shows someone is trying to throw suspicion. Great Scott. What is it, Nick? What do you see on the card? Patsy, send a wire to J.T. Reed. Tell him we're coming out to report to him tonight. Well, that's more like it. A little action. If Reed can tell us what we need to know, we may crack this case tonight. Oh, tell me what's on your mind, Nick, please. I can tell you two things, Patsy. First, there was more than one criminal involved. There was? And second, they're among the most cunning and cold-blooded men I've ever met. You haven't met them yet. Well, we may tonight. Hand me my cold automatic. And then we're on our way. <laughs> Well, a swindler murdered like other men before him who stole the same rare book. The legend of Shakespeare's ghost brought to life as a genuine Elizabethan sword is found in the room. Then the body disappears. Where will this mysterious trail of bloodshed and theft lead, Nick? We'll see in just a moment. What happened last time you waxed your floor? Did hubby grumble because the floors were slippery? Did the youngsters use that fresh new wax job for a skating rink? Not if you used Linex Self-Polishing Wax. For Linex Self-Polishing Wax cuts down the slipperiness of your floors and at the same time gives that satiny beauty only real wax can give. Yes, it's true. The underwriters' laboratories have proved by test that hardwood, linoleum, and rubber tile all are less slippery after Linex Self-Polishing Wax has been applied. Yet your floors and linoleum will look more beautiful than ever before when you use Linex self-polishing wax. And you'll find it easier to keep them clean, too, for Linex self-polishing wax gives a finish that lasts longer so that you just whisk a damp cloth over the surface to keep them spick and span. What's more, Linex self-polishing wax wipes on in a jiffy and dries quickly without tiresome rubbing. So in every way, it's the wise choice for wise homemakers. Get Linex self-polishing wax now. It's the modern anti-skid floor finish. 
Get all the great Linux home brighteners for new home beauty the whole year round. And now back to our story. Nick and Patsy are investigating a strange murder, a vanishing corpse, and the disappearance of a copy of a first folio Shakespeare. The entire crime seems to be linked to a legend about Shakespeare's ghost. They are now in a small suburban railway station waiting for their client, J.T. Reed. Nick, what do you suppose is keeping Mr. Reed? Oh, station master. Yes? Are you sure Mr. Reed got the wire we sent this afternoon? Of course I'm sure. It's the depot the telegraph office, too. Got the wire saying you was arriving on the 712 and send it right up to Mr. Reed. Can't imagine why he isn't here. It's almost 7.30. Well, anyway, Nick, we had a cozy place to wait during the shower. It was short, but awfully wet. I'm not interested in waiting anywhere cozily. I'm going to get going. Well, if he's supposed to be here, he will be. Real fine man, Mr. Reed. Public spirited. Works on bond drive. He even served as a volunteer up to the county hospital. Well, here's a car now. It's Mr. Reed, Nick. Let's go, then. Thanks for your hospitality, Station Master. You're welcome. Oh, Miss Flora, Mr. Carter. I'm dreadfully sorry I'm late. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Reed. Those are why I surprised you. No, no, it wasn't that. I had trouble starting my car. Couldn't even get it out of the garage till ten minutes ago. Oh, no? Uh, right this way. No. Uh, my butler Evans insisted on helping me. Every time I thought the motor was ready to run, he'd reach in under the hood to adjust something and bang, it would stall again. Well, let's hope it won't stall on the way back. I'm rather anxious to see your place and your butler. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Carter, I do hope you can get my beautiful books back for me. I'll do my best, Mr. Reed. Oh, by the way, were they insured? Oh, yes, yes, thank heaven. But I want my books back. Uh, Mr. Carter, shouldn't we notify the police? No, Mr. Reed. You can't make a murder charge stick without a corpse. But I saw it. I could testify that I... No corpse, no case. Oh, well. Uh, Just around the next turn and we're home. Ah, there it is. Oh, what a lovely place. Isn't it, Nick? Yes, indeed. Charming place. The whole scene is so nice. Smoke curling from the chimney. Well, that's funny. Uh, What is, Miss Bowen? Smoke curling from the chimney on a warm summer night. Oh, that. That's the hot water heater. Really? An awful lot of smoke for one of those things, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes. It's a nuisance. We have to burn soft coal all we can get right now. Who tends the boiler, Mr. Reed? Why, Evans the butler even though he considers it a little beneath his dignity. Uh, why do you ask? Oh, no particular reason. Just curious. Can I leave the car here in case we want it later? Now, let me help you, Patsy. Thanks. Good evening. Oh, uh, good evening, Evans. Uh, come on in, both of you. Uh-huh. Thank you. Evans, uh, this is Miss Bowen and Mr. Carter. They'll be staying the night. Very good, sir. Uh, Mr. Carter, the detective, may I ask? Yes, fine. Uh, nothing, sir. Nothing at all. Uh, would you care to wash up, either of you? Oh, no, thanks. I freshened up on the train. I'd like to wash, please. Oh, but Nick, you... I know, Patsy. Uh, I'll take you upstairs. Thank you. Uh, meanwhile, Evans, will you show Miss Bowen into the library? The, the library, sir? Yes, the library. Uh, perhaps Miss Bowen would like to see the garden. The hollyhocks are quite lovely now, and there's still enough light... I'll look at the garden in the morning, if I may. Oh, certainly. Show Miss Bowen to the library, Evans. Yes, sir. Very well, sir. Library. This way, please. Oh. Oh, gee, well, again, what a collection of books. First edition, Paradise Lost. David Copperfield in the original part. Big pardon, <gasps> Miss. Oh. Oh, Evans, you surprised me. I didn't hear you come in. Sorry to startle you, miss. Hope you might like some tea. Thank you. And, Evans, could we have a little more light in here? Uh, Why? You've only this one lamp on. The whole other half of the room is dark. (laughs) Makes it gloomy. Oh, I don't think it's gloomy, miss. I do. May we have a little more light, please? Very good, miss. Look at that other wall. Yes, miss. Well, it's covered with armor. 
swords and things. Yes. Uh, ah, very interesting. If you need anything, you will please ring it. Thank you. Hmm. Let's see. I think I'll take a look. Suit of armor, time of Henry the Second. Well, in target, 14th century. Crossbows. Hip. Quiet, Patsy. Oh, Nick, it's you. I thought. Well, never mind. Come along. We've got work to do. Oh, but Nick, look, look, look here at the collection of armor and swords. Oh, I see. Quite a good collection of British battle swords, too. Mm-mm, look here, Nick. See this? Oh, yes. One sword missing. And the label says it was a 16th century claymore. True enough, Patsy. Good for you. Nick, that butler... Save it for now, Patsy. Come on. We've got work to do. Where are we going? Out through the French windows into the garden. Whatever for? To see the hollyhocks and other things. Come on. The hollyhocks are beautiful, Nick, but what do we want with flowers at a time like this? You'll see in a minute. You know, Nick, I just realized why you were so excited when you saw Mr. Reed's file card. You knew that curios meant swords and armor, didn't you? Oh, did I? Oh, I knew there was some reason why that butler was so anxious to keep me out of the library. He didn't want us to notice that that sword was missing. Maybe so. We ought to nab him quickly. He'll make a getaway. Not just yet, he won't. Ah, over here, Patsy. Hmm? I found what I came out for. But... A door. A door to the house. But why come out here to find a door going back into the house? Unless I'm much mistaken, this is a door to the cellar. Oh, the cellar. Locked, of course. Well, a curious keyhole. Now, my pick lock was made for just such unusual locks. So let's see. Well, what do we want in the cellar, Nick? Patsy, when we arrived, you noticed smoke pouring from the chimney. Uh-huh. Reed said it was the hot water heater. Yes. Well, I made a point of going up to wash my hands. The water in the hot faucet was only lukewarm. With all the smoke we saw, that water should have been boiling hot. I see. That means... That it's not the hot water boiler that's burning. Something else is burning in the cellar. Oh. Or being burned. There. Thought that would do it. Now. Wait till I turn on my flashlight. Uh-huh. All right. Down those steps. It's hot down here. Yes. And a big fire going in that furnace. You can see it's still glowing over there. Nick, that that smell. It's like You're right, Patsy. Afraid that's just what it is. Wait. Take this slice bar and open the furnace door. Oh, Nick. Just as I thought. Look. It's the toe of a shoelace. Yes. Unquestionably, one of the shoes we saw on the body of Rodney Stone. Oh, Nick, shut the door, please. Right. It it all fits together, Nick. That butler, he probably overheard everything about Stone in the first folio of Shakespeare, then stole the sword, then followed Stone to the hotel and killed him. Mm. And Nick, remember? When Reed came to the station, he said he was delayed because Evans kept stalling the car. And Evans has charge of this cellar. And he thought he'd have time to burn the body. But our wire surprised him. He kept delaying Reed so we wouldn't get here too soon. Certainly hmm. hangs together, Patsy, but you... Oh, someone's coming. Wait, Patsy, can I just be in a hurry? Take it, Evans. Quiet. Well, Evans? Look. Just keeping the home fires burning? Mr. Culler. Drop that poker, Evans. But, Mr. Culler... Drop I... it, I said. All right. Have all that cold... Blooded, fiendish but killers. Miss, I, I, you got I, I, your no, dead to yes. right, Sevens. Now you're going to tell us where you've hidden those books. Uh, no, no, I Stay have... Stay where you are. I've got a gun. So have I. Mr. Reed. I've got the drop on you, Carter. Let go of your pistol. Very well. Now, uh, kick it over here. Uh, good. I congratulate you, Carter. You're cleverer than I thought. But from now on, things will go my way. And what way is that? I'll turn Miss Bowen over to my associates, whom you haven't met. They'll take excellent care of her. And then tomorrow, you and I will visit the police and the insurance company. And if you don't testify as I wish, Miss Bowen will... Oh, Nick. You see, 
I don't want the books back. I want the insurance. It's a great deal more than the present market value of those books. And you're too clever. You really might find those books. You're darn right he would. Nick Carter Mr. can Regan, find... Look, on the wall behind you, the shadow of a bearded man. Shakespeare's ghost. Yeah, what? Why, why, why? Black Patrick. Right. Oh. Oh. Now, Mr. Reed, I have the drop on you. Well, uh, you smart uh, boys are always uh, fooled by the simplest uh, tricks. The furnace door was open. And by manipulating my fingers behind my back, I cast a shadow of a bearded man on that wall behind you. Oh, thank you, Nick. I wouldn't have liked to meet Shakespeare's ghost. I... I think I'm much more attractive with my head on. Now, Reed, I'm sure you won't be too reluctant about naming your accomplice because you won't want to go to jail for both of you. Then we'll turn over to the police two of the most cold-blooded thieves I've ever met. Thieves? You mean murderers. No, Patsy, they aren't guilty of that. They couldn't have murdered Rodney Stone because Rodney Stone never lived. In just a moment, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's adventure and tell you how he followed the mysterious trail of Shakespeare's ghost. Fingerprints and dust smudges can spoil the appearance of the finest furniture, as every housewife knows. Help your fine furniture to look its best always with Linex Cream Polish, the polish which dries hard with no oily surface film to attract those ugly smudges and finger marks. You'll find Linex Cream Polish, all the great Linex home brighteners, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that has brought sparkling new beauty to 20 million rooms in American homes. Chemtone covers in one coat, dries in one hour. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. You see, Patsy, there never was such a man as Rodney Stone. It was on a scheme that Reed and his accomplice cooked up to collect the insurance on those books. You see, Reed's file card told me he'd been a volunteer worker at the county hospital. That's what excited me. Because that meant he had access to the hospital morgue and the blood bank. You mean they... they stole a corpse? Right. Some poor, nameless pauper, probably. Oh. And they also took a couple of pints of blood from the blood bank. <laughs> His accomplice took the body and the blood to the hotel in a trunk, hired two suites, and set the scene we saw in one of them. Meanwhile, Reed had sent his cable to London, knowing full answer, full well the answer he'd get. But why did he want you in on it? He needed a reputable witness to the murder and the theft. And then as soon as I had seen it, they had to get rid of the body at once to avoid a checkup. Oh, but how did the body disappear? Well, the accomplice was hiding in a closet. When Reed called us into the bedroom to see the sword he'd planted there, his pal slipped out and took the body into the suite next door. Oh. He put it in a trunk, and as soon as we left, brought it back to Reed's house so Reed could burn it up. I thought Evans was the guilty one. No, Patsy, I was convinced Reed was lying when he met us at the station. He said he'd started only ten minutes before, yet his car was wet. Oh, I remember the sudden summer shower. Right, the rain had stopped fifteen minutes before, which meant that Reed himself had delayed along the road in the shower so that cremation would be over before we got back to the house. Yeah, but, but Nick, when we were in the cellar, it was Evans who came down to see if the body were consumed. Patsy Evans told me that he knew nothing of the swindled Reed had planned until he accidentally found him putting the body in the furnace. And then, having been with Reed's family for years, he loyally did what he could to help him out. Oh. Nick, why didn't you try to trace the body when it disappeared? Because I had a strong hunch that there was something phony about the murder. And I felt sure I could catch the crooks another way. <laughs> Looked awfully real to me with all that blood around. That was one reason why I suspected his genuineness. If the man had been killed as we were led to believe he had, he would have dropped on the spot. There would have been no blood in the far corners of the room. Oh, Patsy, there was too much blood in too many places. Why, of course. What's more, the body was too dramatically arranged. Murdered people usually sprawl in almost ludicrous and unbelievable positions. But the clincher, Patsy, was the corpse's elbow. Uh, oh, oh, Nick. What could you tell from an elbow? Patsy, you recall that the blood analysis showed the blood was at least six hours old? Uh-huh. Well, when a body lies as long as six hours in one position, immediately after death, gravity causes the blood to settle into the parts of the body touching what it, whatever it's resting upon. As a result, the skin becomes purplish at that point. While well, the corpse's bare elbow was touching the floor, yet there was no sign of any purple color, which meant something was not as it should be. Well, well. Work for Nick Carter and learn while you earn, I always say. And so do I. What's next week's adventure going to be, Nick? 
Well, Ken, next week I have a rather unusual story for you. A man came to my office and told me he had just killed a man. Well, that's all right. I suppose he came to give himself up. Oh, no. He came to ask Nick to find the body of the man he just killed. Well, we found it all right. But it took a black mirror and a pinched bar to find the killer. Well, I thought you said he confessed. He did. And that's what makes the story. I give up. What do you call the story? I call it The Case of the Wandering Corpse. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Charlotte Manson as Patsy. Script is by Stanley Kaufman. Original music is played by George Wright. The programs are fictional, and any resemblance therein to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax. Now the makers of the great Linux home brighteners take this opportunity to send you their most cordial good wishes for a bright new year filled with contentment, prosperity, and the realization of every personal ambition. May 1946 be the best year you've ever known. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, Nick's search for the murderer who placed Adolf Hitler's brand on the jaw of a dead man. The body in the ice. There are many strange customs throughout the world, but perhaps the strangest is that of the Arctic Club. You've seen the Arctic Club in action in movies, newspapers, and magazines. In the dead of winter, the members don bathing suits and go for a swim. This morning, with the mercury hovering around 10 above zero... A shivering group of newspaper men gathers on the snow-crusted beach to report the strange activities of the Arctic Club. Okay, okay, just a few more minutes, folks. I want to land up some more pictures. Hold right? oh, on here. Hey, will a couple of you club members grab up some of that snow and they'd like to have a snowball high? Hey, Joe, get a shot of that. You want to get a big snowball? Yes, yeah, just throw the snow, Mr. Uh, uh, McGlynn. Round over, McGlynn. Who is who in? Yeah, just throw the snow, Mr. McGlynn. Don't be smiling like they're enjoying it. We are enjoying it. It is the healthiest sport in the world. If more people... Oh, right. Okay, Clark. Uh, are you want the guys for your set? Have the one in the red suit to face the camera. Uh, Mr. Uh, 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 face the camera, Mr. Uh, okay. Are you okay? Uh, tell him to say something about the club. Hold the mic close up to him, Summer, will you? Yeah, yeah. give it all the show. You've got fur clothes on, let's give it close up. Okay. Uh, just talk into this microphone, Mr. Uh, 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 Lee. Well, no, Big Lee. We're two in there. Uh, Hi, everybody. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Lee. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, my friends and me started the Arctic Club in 1910. Now, the 50th of every month, rain or shine, we meet and take a dip in the health-given waters of the ocean. Uh, it's easy in the summertime, but in the winter, like now, when it's below freezing, we can take plenty of intentional fortitude. A daily swim in the winter is the best way to fight off cold, flu, grip, pneumonia, and... <laughs> All right, all right, I've got some... Let's get the swimming shot started. Mr. Uh, Big Lee. Yes, I know. We're through and... Yes. Well, our club is not even for the dip. We can get started now. Okay. Come on, boys. Last one in the running. All right, Minnie. Will you look at them idiots? That's for the water. Oh, come on, Minnie. 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 Come on,
The camera wasn't ready. Okay, okay. Hey, don't call him back yet. They got to break through that ice first anyway. When they get it cleared, we'll get it. Oh, oh, holy shit. Oh, what happened? No. I don't know. In the back of the seat. Come on. You don't think one of them's strong. Trap them around in the ice? How? Oh, I don't know. I was just hoping for a story. Hey, hey, you're in water. You better put it in the car with the car. And hurry it up. Hey, what's the matter? We just found something in the ice. We found something in the ice. Yeah, look. Holy jumping. Would you look at that? It's your story, Joe. Frozen solid in that big hunk of ice. It's a dead body. <laughs> Carter's office has to go in speaking. Uh, Where are you, Waldo? You were supposed to report early this morning. Let me talk to you, Nick. Well, just a minute. It's Waldo, Miss. He wants to talk to you. All right. Yes, Waldo? Nick, boy, you got to get out here right away. Come out where? To the Turkside Beach. Why? To clear my character. Not that I'm here to declare that after 30 years of honorable <laughs> Now, let's get this straight, Waldo. What's going on in your character? Quite a fight. I don't really like that. Ah, what's this? Wait a minute. 
bruise in the side of his chin. Oh, naturally, he must have been slugged there if his jaw was broken. and could take a close look at that bruise. Hmm? It is a swastika. That's what it is. Why? Evidently, the impression of a ring. Matty, will you tell me who wears a Nazi ring in this country? Um, well, well, may, uh, may, may be like soldier, uh, uh, civilian. Yeah, possibly. Now, just touching it. Doesn't seem to be any identification, honey. Now, what? Here's something caught in his coat sleeve. Huh? The piece of rotten wood with a nail in it. Probably came off the ocean bottom with him. Looks like the slant of a lobster pot to me. Ah, this is luck. Hey, there's letters on it. Yeah, it's burned on pretty crudely. I think the fisherman is marking his lobster pot. Let's see. That's an E. E. That's an L. L, J. Last two letters of a name. Then, G, E, L. Oh, gee, what's that? G? Yeah, G. R. I can't make out the rest. No. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Belgrade, small town about 30 miles up the coast. You mean this coast stretches 30 miles? I do. All right, Matty. There are your facts. Unidentified man was killed in the fight by someone wearing a Nazi ring. He was weighted down and dumped into the sea near Belgrade. Brown dice floated him up and down here. There's your case. Come on, Patsy. Yeah. Oh, now, look, Nick, you're, you're not walking out on me. Leaving me with this mess? I certainly am. But, but it's murder, Nick. You can't just go home with the case. Who said anything about going home? Patsy and I are going up to Belgrade to find out who wears Nazi rings. <laughs> In the flesh, mister. I'm Nick Carter. This is Miss Patsy Bowen, my secretary. Carter? I don't know as how I recollect the name. We've never met. I'm a detective. I'd like to ask you some questions. About what? I think someone may be missing from Belgrade, and I think I've found him. I'm listening. Short man, blonde. Weighed about 130. Blue eyes. Thankful of nose. Large ears. Heavy lips. You found him? That's Charlie Howell. Already. And the police more dead. Dead, eh? Murdered. Murdered, eh? <laughs> Too bad. I wondered what had happened to him. Who was he, Mr. Bannon? The assistant in my store, the Bannon's grocery store. You can't support yourself on a sheriff's pay in Belgrade. How long has Howell been missing, Mr. Bannon? About two weeks. I thought he was out on a binge. I sent him out Friday night to make deliveries in the truck. He never showed up Saturday. Did the shop? Yeah. I guess he brought it back to the garage before he went, well, wherever he went. Did it ever occur to you that the killer might have brought it back? No. Never occurred to me Charlie was killed. He's been on fast before. Anyone complain about non delivery of groceries that day? No. Hmm. Well, there's a chance Howell was killed after he finished work. There's an equal chance he was killed on the shop. I have a list of Howell's delivery schedule for that Friday. Don't see why you should. But, Mr. Gannon, this is a murder case. Surely you want to now have... Look here, ma'am, and you too, Mr. Parker. My I... name is Carter. Nick Carter. Carter. Right. Well, as far as I'm concerned... Say... Would you be any relation to old Sim Carter who broke the New England bank? He was my father. Your father, eh? Well, well, why didn't you say so before? I'm glad to meet you, Carter. Shake. Well, uh, your father was a great detective. You want Charlie's delivery schedule? Well, you get it. You get anything we got in this town. Oh, well, thanks. For a while, I thought all I was going to get was a cold shoulder. <laughs> Dark, Nick. Yeah. I think it's time to snow. Maybe. How many more stops do we have to make? Howell was scheduled for 11 deliveries last Friday. We've covered nine. Well, what's left? I went by the name of Kane and that shooting club. Well, you think Belgrade would have a shooting club? But the tiny little town doesn't look like a resort. I should have said X shooting club. Our business is X. Just hanging out. Oh. Brennan said he very rarely sent anything out there. You think Howell might have been killed at one of these last two places? I don't know. We found out he made the other two... The other nine deliveries in prison. We made these last two. Someone might be lying. Yeah, but the question is who? Mm. We don't know what route Howell took. The killer was mine. Might have the last. That name Kane sounds suspicious. Wasn't Kane the original murderer? Mm, pretty far that reason, Captain. We're going into a crash! <laughs> Oh. Uh, 
I had hoped you would be killed in the crash when I shut out your tires. It's unfortunate you are not. I don't think so. But I do, Miss Bowen. You see, I'm afraid I shall have to kill both of you all over again. <laughs> Right out, Nick. What time is it? Six o'clock. We've been locked up here all night. What's the idea? Adam said they were going to kill us, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. So why wait? What is this? For fine Nazi torture? I don't know. Oh, Nick. Isn't there some way out of this mess? Probably. I just can't find it. Close the door. I think there's a dead Please remain seated. Many years' experience has taught me how to carry a loaded tray in one hand. So convenient when one would carry a loaded gun in the other. There we are. Breakfast. Thanks. We're not hungry. I assure you, the food is not poisoned. Look here, Adam. What's the game you're playing? You must threatening murder. Why delay? We're in an extraordinary position, Mr. Carter. As you've already guessed, this is a depot for escape prisoners of war. Go on. An intense debate is in progress downstairs. The city is divided. One school of thought advocates your death immediately. Yes. A spirited opposition wishes to use you as hostages to ensure safe transport back to the mother country. You haven't made up your minds yet? Not yet. I'm going down now. I shall presently return with a final verdict. In the meantime, I would suggest you have breakfast. Thanks. There's only one thing wrong with this meal, Adam. No cigarettes. Very well. You may have my thanks. Yes. Thank you. Uh, be sure to save the last two for the execution. Why do you answer? You don't smoke. I got them for you. I don't smoke either. You're going to now. I have a fetch. Start smoking. Start smoking? But why? I'll show you why later. Just smoke as fast as you can and make sure you save all the ashes. That's all I'm going to Right, if you say so, I'll try. <laughs> Down. Now, that's those telephone wires. See them? They're strung to the house just alongside our window. Uh-huh. I think I can just about take them. Will they follow us? They'll follow, all right. 
Why I didn't take Adams with us. I want him to lead the chase. Which way are you going to let them chase us? Heading back to our car. Well, what good will that do? Worst comes to worst. And help them get her in time. We'll try to make it run on two flat tires. Start back to town. What, what's that? Hunter. They're following us all right. Keep moving. Oh, Nick, I can see them behind us. Way back at the house. They're walking along the line like Indians. Yeah. They're clever, all right. Dressed up in hunting clothes, carrying rifles. <laughs> they look like a shooting line up to fed into rabbit. Very clever. Clever, Nick? Yes. In case anyone happens to pass on the road, they won't take anything to miss. They won't realize human beings are being hunted. Just think a party of hunters are out after game. Oh, Dolly, but it's in a mess. Come on. Through this clump of woods. Right. Don't think they spotted us yet. They're just shooting to set the scene. They won't miss our trail. No. How come before they catch sight of us? I don't know, Patsy. Sheriff Bannon, where are you? Sheriff Bannon, this is Patsy calling. Please, hurry up. All right, Patsy, save your breath. Come on, come on. I see our car. So do I. I might also think Adam's gang has seen us. Yes, yes, they spotted us. Those bullets are headed our way. Now what? Keep running. You've got to reach the car. Oh, I'll never make it, Nick. You can try it, Patsy. Oh, I want those folks. We're killed, I'll never forgive him. We're killed, you want a chance? No, wait, wait, wait. What's that? Who is that? That's Lennon coming. Nick, we're saved by the Marines. Not yet, Patsy. We're going to pass right by on the road unless we signal to it. I won't realize we're being hunted. How do we signal? Hey, wait, wait. I'll have to sacrifice the car. It's a long pistol shot, but I think I can take it. What are you going to do? Put a bullet into the gas tank of our car. That'll start a blaze. Lennon won't be able to destroy Stand by, Patsy. There she goes! Oh, good. And look, Lennon's stopping to investigate. We've got the reinforcements we need, Patsy. Adam's club members are really going to be at it, so from now on, back in a prisoner of war camp. Sorry you won't borrow a car to get home, Mr. Carter. It don't seem right letting old Sim Carter's son take the train. Well, that's quite all right, Lennon. Thanks anyway for the offer. Mighty nice of you giving me all the credit for grabbing that gang of PWs. Oh, you deserve it. And you've got your whole case closed. Charlie Howell evidently heard some of the Nazi gab when he was making his last delivery to the club. Got suspicious and smooth before he drove away. Then was discovered, put up a fight, and was killed. Adams dumped his body in Belgrade Bay when he drove the truck back to the garage. But what about Adams shooting at our car, Nick? How do you know we were coming? Well, Patsy Adams must have been in Mr. Glennon's grocery store when we were going over Howell's delivery schedule. Uh-huh. He realized we were on the trail and tried to stop us. Well, he sure didn't, Mr. Carter. And you sure put the sheriff of Belgrade on the map. Well, as far as that goes, Patsy and I might have been off the map permanently. You hadn't answered my SOS the instant the phone company reported it. Well, what happened back at the country club? How did you always let him? Oh, that. Why, Patsy was the one who put Adams out of the way. By smoking 11 cigarettes in half an hour. <laughs> oh, that don't make sense, Nick. Well, it was an old trick my father taught me. I took the ashes from the cigarettes that he smoked and packed them into an empty paper cigarette tube. And then when I pretended to start smoking my last execution cigarette, I simply blew the ashes directly into Adam's eyes. That blinded him so I could take his gun away and knock him out. So that was it. What a boss to work for, Sheriff Brennan. A trick in every pocket and a hundred up his sleeve. Mr. Carter, I got an apology to make to you. I once said you were the son of the famous Sim Carter. Well, I take it back. Jim Carter's the father of the famous Nick Carter. Well, Nick, how about a little preview of next week's story? Well, Nick, how about a little preview of next week's story? Well, Nick, how about a little preview of next week's story? Well, Nick, how about a little preview?